The Primarchs of his Imperium would embody the greatest virtues and glories of the Emperor. Forged from aspects of his divine image, all would be alike to gods among men in their actions as artificers, statesmen, and warriors. Yet despite their progeny, many would fall to the corruptions of chaos, and with such an act, divide the Imperium in twain, and hearken a dismal future in their wake. Today, we shall elucidate every one of the Primarchs of the Imperium, should they be loyalist or traitor. For only in observing their moments of greatest virtue and most treacherous atrocities may the Imperium learn from their downfall. In warfare, preparation is the key. Determine that which your foe prizes the most, then sight your heavy weapons so that they overlook it. In this way, you may be quite sure that you shall never want for targets. The Primarchs of the Emperor's Great Imperium were created to exemplify his indomitable will and peerless resolve. Each one of the sons of the Emperor bears a gift, and each one is seen as demigods to both their respective legions and the Imperium itself. Created to bring the disparate worlds of humanity's lost brethren to the fore, reconstituting his Imperium into a united species, capable of conquering the entirety of the galaxy. Though Horus Lupercal would be chosen as War Master amongst his brothers, the title was considered for the only other son of the Emperor worthy of the title. Lion L. Johnson, Primarch of the First Legion, son of Caliban, and arguably the greatest general of the Imperium. During the scattering of the Primarchs, Lion L. Johnson would be cast to the surface of a death world. Ridden with enormous, terrifying, chaos-forged beasts, L. Johnson would survive alone for ten years within the vast forests of Caliban. The feral child would be discovered by the Knights of the Order, a band of humans whom inhabited the small outposts of Caliban. Already a towering figure, L. Johnson would be seen as a threat by the Knights and be injured. The knight known as Luther would prevent his execution and bring the child to the Order's fortress monastery. Luther would name the child Lion L. Johnson, translated from Caliban meaning Lion, Son of the Forest. His forename given to represent the fierce Calibanite lion, the deadliest beast that resided within the forest. As a son of the Emperor, L. Johnson would learn with incredible speed, mastering the Calibanite language within weeks of Luther's care. Forging a familial bond with Luther, the lion would demonstrate his incredible intelligence for strategy, and with only a few short years, the lion and Luther would rise through the ranks of the Order. With their exploits known throughout Caliban, the lion would propose a crusade to be waged against the beasts within the forest. With the goal of eradicating them once and for all, and for Caliban to be free of the danger they posed. Though hesitant to accept his proposal, Luther's oratory prowess would convince the Grand Masters of the Order to relent, and with the lion at the fore of the crusade, within ten years the beasts of the forests would be exterminated. L. Johnson fulfilling his promise would be renamed Supreme Grand Master of the Order, igniting the first flickering flames of jealousy within Luther's heart. The Lion would then demand the Knightly Orders outside of the influence of the Order to join him, with only the Knights of Lupus rejecting his command. The Knights of Lupus would be put to the sword, and the Lion would command the entirety of the Knights of Caliban. During a ceremonial last hunt of the Beasts of Caliban, Scout forces of the Emperor would discover the Primarch and aid in the hunt with the Terran-born Astartes of the First Legion. The Lion would be given command of his gene sons of the First Legion. The Knights of the Order who were too old to undergo the transformation to Astartes would also be genetically modified. With Luther being the first to undergo the procedure, then joining his Primarch as his most trusted ally and second in command of the Legion. A final gift from the Emperor the Lion would be given the Invincible Reason, the Imperium's first Gloriana class flagship. The Lion would discover his new legion had been fractured over their years of conquest before being reunited with their Primarch. The legion had adopted a vainglorious and prideful attitude, leading to many losses within its ranks due to reckless campaigns and strategies. 
the lion would test the captains of each of his legion's companies by dueling them in single combat. His enemies clad in Terminator power armor, himself without, the lion would best his sons each time and bolster respect between the legion's Terran and Caliban warriors, even merging the legion's hexagrammaton and Caliban teachings to allow for cohesion within its ranks. A lion would also lead a new crusade consisting of 20,000 of his legion to scour the galaxy for the lost companies who had been abandoned in years past. Within a few years, the lion's crusade had caused the number of his legion to swell, ending his crusade with 100,000 Astartes rescued from the various corners of the galaxy. At the stronghold of Gramea, the lion would duel the Council of Masters champion, Pyrrhus Caligat, the host of fire. After an hour-long duel, the lion would succeed and be proclaimed the Grand Master of the assembled First Legion Masters. Here the lion would formalize the legion under a new name, the Dark Angels, the title based after an old Caliban myth, and the Angels of Darkness descended on pinions of fire and light, the great and terrible Dark Angels. The lion would also be deemed worthy of command of the six wings of the Hexagrammaton, the Deathwing, Ravenwing, Dreadwing, Firewing, Ironwing, and Stormwing. During the Great Crusade, the Lion would be dispatched with the 4th Expeditionary Fleet to campaign on the world of Sarosh. Unknown to the Imperium, the Saroshi people, though wishing to become members of the Imperium, were worshippers of the forces of chaos. Aboard the ship of the Invincible Reason, the Saroshi leader would confront the Lion, leading to the Dark Angels and Saroshi to engage in battle. The Saroshi would smuggle a nuclear explosive aboard the ship, which would be found by Junior Dark Angel's librarian, Zahariel, and Lufa. Lufa would hesitate but eject the device from the ship, reducing the damage caused by its explosion. However, for allowing such a weapon to be allowed under their watch, the Lion would send Lufa, Zahariel, and 200 Dark Angels in disgrace back to Caliban, fanning the flames of resentment in Lufa and his men. As the lion's exploits throughout the crusade would be relayed to Caliban, Lufa would continue to stew in his exile. With the discovery of a mysterious tome on Caliban, Lufa would further degenerate from the loyal friend and warrior the lion had known into a bitter shell of his former self. During the opening events of the Horus Heresy, the War Master would grow anxious with the knowledge that the lion would remain loyal to the Emperor. The honor of War Master was a title contested, but all sons of the Emperor knew that the most likely candidates would be Horus or the Lion. As such, Horus needed to keep his brother from engaging him in the most crucial battles of his betrayal. Therefore, Horus would dispatch Conrad Kurz and his Legion of Night Lords to distract the Dark Angels. Kurz would invite El Johnson to battle on the planet of Sagualza, and once engaged in battle, he would share his preternatural gift of foresight revealing the fate of the Dark Angels and their betrayal from within. The Lion and Night Haunter would engage, both crippled from the battle with the Lion's throat cut and Kurz's torso impaled by the Lion's sword. As the injured Primarch retreated, the Lion would demand his legion to pursue, eventually warp traveling through space in pursuit of the Night Haunter. The Lion would reinstate the chapter's Librarius to aid in combating the foul demonic forces within the warp. Standing in defiance of the Emperor's will, he would be confronted by Chaplain Nemiel, whom the Lion would kill for his defiance. During the height of the battle within the warp, Emissary of Sinch, Kairos Fateweaver, would tempt the Lion to join the forces of Chaos. Unflinching in his purpose, the Lion would reward the Chaos Demon's bargain by plunging his sword through the Demon's heart. As the Invincible Reason escaped the warp, the Dark Angels would ambush the forces of Kurz and his Night Lords, resulting in the Angels taking the remaining fledgling Night Lords prisoner, including their first captain, Sevatar. However, Conrad Kurz would sneak into the Invincible Reason and for months elude the patrols sent to find him within the ship. Even the Lion would attempt to catch the Night Haunter, but to no avail, with the Night Lords prisoners eventually escaping and retreating into the void. With the arrival of the Ruin Storm and the blotting out of the Astronomicon in the later stages of the Heresy, the Lion realized that travel to aid in the defense of Terra would become impossible. Instead, the First Legion would pursue the light of the alien device known as the Pharos, 
and travel to the Ultramar capital of McCrag. Regrouping with Primarch Robute Gilliman of the Ultramarines 13th Legion and Primarch Sanguinius of the 9th Legion's Blood Angels, with the galaxy torn in two, the three Primarchs would establish the Imperium Secundus, with the Lion serving as its Lord Protector, and moniker alike to Horace Lupercal's title of War Master. This meeting would be marred by the escape of Conrad Kurz onto McCrack, wreaking havoc throughout the Ultramarine homeworld. The Lion and Gilliman would be led into a trap by Kurz as he detonated the chapel harboring his salvation on top of the Primarchs. Their deaths were prevented by the intervention of Iron Warrior Barabas Dantioch and Imperial Fist Alexis Pollux using the Pharos device, teleporting the Primarchs to Sofa. Feeling responsible for the mayhem caused by Kurz, the Lion would relentlessly hunt down the Night Haunter with the aid of his Dreadwing of the Hexagrammaton. Eventually finding Kurz, they would battle again, resulting in the Lion ripping Kurz's power pack from his armor and breaking his spine. Conrad Kurz would be brought to Sanguinius and Gilliman and stand trial. A rift had been created between the Lion and Rebute, their relationship strained with the Lion's use of his legion commanding martial law during the pursuit of Kurz. Kurz would further add salt to the wound by claiming that the Lion had orbitally bombarded McCrag in direct violation of Rebute's orders. The Lion would attempt to kill Kurz there and then until Rebute would break the Lion's sword. Sanguinius would end the triumvirate with the Lion being banished from Imperium Secundus. Sanguinius would resolve to kill the Night Haunter until the Lion would intervene, seeking to keep Gers as his jailer and use the Night Haunter's visions of the future to his advantage. The Primarchs would brave the Ruin Storm in order to reach Holy Terror. Gilliman and the Lion would fight side by side in their efforts to distract the garrison of Horus Lupercal's forces so that Sanguinius might breach their blockade and reach Holy Terror. They would succeed, with the Great Angel taking Kurz as his prisoner before the assault on the blockade. As the Primarchs parted ways and with the Astronomicon becoming dark, travel to Terror would become impossible. The Lion would instead purge the traitor homeworlds of Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's Children, and Mortarion, Primarch of the Death Guard. The worlds of Chemos and Barbarus would be left as no more than rubble. With time, the Lion would learn of the Emperor's fate, Sanguinius' death, and the near destruction of the Imperium's forces during the Siege of Terror. Stricken with grief and nihilistic guilt, the Lion returned to Caliban. Unaware that the men he had left to garrison the planet from threats would soon turn against him, Luther would command his men to fire upon the returning fleet. The Lion would learn of Luther's betrayal and the poisoning of his legionnaires' minds stationed on Caliban. To rid his homeworld of chaos corruption, the Lion would orbitally bombard Caliban. With the planet burned and its defenses crippled, the Lion would lead a force to the planet's surface. The fallen Dark Angels would be cornered inside the Fortress Monastery, where the Lion would confront the now chaos corrupted Luther. They would duel, with Luther now empowered by the forces of chaos, he was a match even for the Lion. With a psychic attack, Luther would wound the Lion and with his primal desire to best his former friend, sated, the corruption that had consumed him would subside. Stricken with guilt, Luther would relent and allow the secretive Watchers in the Dark to retrieve their Primarch's body. Shortly thereafter, the forces of Chaos would summon a warp storm to destroy Caliban. The Dark Angels would imprison Luther and vow to destroy the traitor fallen angels whom had betrayed their kin. With the destruction of Caliban, the First Legion would salvage the debris of the planet and transform it into a vast spacefaring vessel. Both homeworld and flagship, they would name it the Rock. Housing deep within its core their prisoner of the Fallen, Luther, and deeper still, the body of Lionel Johnson, held in stasis until his body would recover enough for him to lead his Legion once again and bring the vengeance of his angels back to the galaxy. The measure of true glory is not to give battle in the bright noon of war, surrounded by brave comrades upon the field of victory, but to valiantly fight on alone in the darkness, with no hope of aid or even remembrance, and to spit defiant in midnight's eye. A warrior is measured by the quality of the foes he defeats. For years we have blunted our blades against lesser species and backwards primitives. 
But now this war, this glorious cataclysm, it presents us a chance to display for all eternity our perfection in the arena of war against the most formidable foe we shall ever face, our brother legionaries. And for this, we humbly thank him, our dear father, whose name we carry. The Primarchs of his Imperium were each crafted to exemplify the Emperor's, and by extension, humanity's greatest virtues and traits. Statesmen, generals and orators, these individuals would unite the disparate fragments of humanity by using their unique godlike power. Yet many of the Primarchs would fall from grace, with few more unfortunate than that of one of the most promising of his children, the Primarch of the Third Legion. Fulgrim. With the scattering of the Primarchs prior to the dawn of the Great Crusade, the gestation pod of the Primarch of the Third Legion would land on the mining world of Chemos. A bleak and pitiless world surrounded by a nebula of thick dust and soot, Chemos would be a harsh taskmaster of its people. Settled during the Dark Age of Technology, the planet would be isolated by warp storms from the wider civilizations across the stars. Illuminated in perpetual twilight, Chemos's citizenry would labor day and night without pause to create enough resources for their survival. Thick with harmful vapors, the fortress factories of the world would demand ceaseless toil from its people, should they all wish to prevent a global starvation. With trade almost impossible between neighboring planets, the Chemosians would accept their dour fate of doomed rationing and endless hard labor. Yet with the arrival of the Primarch to the planet, a renewal of its fortunes would commence. Discovering the beautiful child, the policing force known as the Caretakers would beg Chemos's leaders of Kalex, the executives, to spare the child's life. Orphans of Chemos were routinely culled to prevent further strain on the planet's dwindling resources. Yet fortunately for the young Primarch, the executives would allow a member of the Caretakers to raise the child. Naming the boy Fulgrim out of the Chemosian legend it would not be long before the young Primarch would be tasked to labor within the mines of his new homeworld. Maturing quickly, Fulgrim would be sent to work within the labor mines of the planet. Quickly understanding the faltering and obsolete equipment of the factory, Fulgrim would modify and improve upon their designs. Dramatically increasing the machine's yield, it would not take long for the executives of the factory to take notice of the genius child diligently improving the lot of his people. For 15 years, Fulgrim would tinker with the machinery and be promoted to the rank of an executive of the fortress factory of Kallax. Observing the plight of the factory workers in a new light, Fulgrim would train and organize engineers to travel with him to each neighboring factory. Under his guidance, the engineers would repair and improve the factory's machinery. Salvaging long dormant artifacts from the Age of Strife, the mining production of the planet would exponentially improve. Allowing for free time to construct new machines to further improve efficiency to the factories, Fulgrim would overhaul the entire planet's infrastructure and living standards. Creating surpluses and reducing pollution, Chemos's trade routes would begin to burgeon, and within a few years, Fulgrim had ascended to become the ruler of the planet. The only Primarch to rule his homeworld with peaceful means, Fulgrim would prove to be a compassionate, kind, and dependable boon to the people of Chemos. Yet with the arrival of the Emperor of Mankind to the planet, Fulgrim would resign his mantle of rulership. Falling to his knees once an audience of the Master of Mankind, Fulgrim would pledge himself and his homeworld in service to the Imperium. Swearing to serve the needs of his Imperium with all his heart, Fulgrim would accompany his father to Holy Terror. Learning of the slow decline of the Third Legion in his absence, Fulgrim would address his remaining 200 Asartes. So inspiring was his speech, the Emperor would give the title of Emperor's Children to the Third Legion and gift them the right to bear his own Imperial Aquila on their armor. Wearing the double-headed eagle with pride, the Emperor's Children under the command of Fulgrim would venture forth to prove their worth in the eyes of the Imperium. Burdened with the responsibility to prove themselves worthy of the Emperor's favor, 
Fulgrim and his legion would strive to become paragons of humanity. Seeking perfection in not only battle, but also culture, the Emperor's children would champion artistry and aesthetic splendor in their dealings as a legion. Embodying the traits of beauty, poise, and elegance, Fulgrim would demand a high standard of regal bearing within his legion. Strengthening their resolve and bolstering their dwindling numbers, the Emperor's children would serve as aristocratic negotiators and public embodiments of the Imperium's will. Mentored closely by the Primarch of the Lunar Wolves, Horus Lupercal, the Emperor's foremost senior general would teach Fulgrim and his slowly rebuilding legion on the art of war. With his teachings complete, and the Third Legion now at fighting strength, Fulgrim would anxiously embark to bring glory to his Emperor's children. Forming an unlikely, yet cherished friendship with the Primarch of the Tenth Legion, Ferus Manus, during the Great Crusade, the Emperor's most starkly contrasting brothers would work together on many campaigns to bring compliance to the galaxy. Both masters of craftsmanship, alchemy, and scientific genius, the Primarchs would further strengthen their bond with a contest of skill. Crafting weapons fit for a god of war, the Venetian and his affectionately named Gorgon would create weapons of legendary splendor. Ferus Manus would craft the sword known as Fireblade, wreathed in flame alike to the Emperor's own personal weapon, whilst Fulgrim would construct Forgebreaker, a warhammer capable of sundering mountains in hands strong enough to wield it. Deferring each other as the winner of the contest, as a sign of respect, the two Primarchs would gift one another their mastercrafted weapons. Carrying them into battle, legends would be sung of the two like-minded brothers charging into battle with their weapons aloft and legions at their vanguard. Yet unfortunately, such a bond would be tested and fractured with the betrayal of the Imperium by the Primarch of the 16th Legion, Horus Lupercal. As the War Master of the Imperium began his slow descent into the thrall of chaos, Fulgrim would begin his own corrupting pilgrimage. Leading the 28th Expeditionary Fleet during the conquest of the Laren species, Fulgrim would begin to be enticed by the influence of the ruinous powers. Known to the Imperium as the planet 28-Free, the Lair Xenos would guard the resource-rich planet from Imperial advances. Dispatching his Astartes, Fulgrim would descend upon the planet and begin the slow, month-long extermination of the serpentine lair in Xenos. Discovering a strange temple within the coral nexus of the ocean planet, Fulgrim would investigate the structure. Unknowingly, stepping into a temple devoted to the chaos entity known as Slanesh, Fulgrim would find within the heart of the temple a peculiar artifact. The demon blade, known as the Blade of the Lair, would call to Fulgrim. Whispering subtle treacheries into Fulgrim's very soul, the Primarch of the Emperor's children would claim the blade as his own. Relegating Fireblade, his most prized symbol of his most cherished brother, and favoring the Lair Blade in battle, the influence of the greater demon within the sword would grow exponentially. Wrongly interpreting the intrusive thoughts of the demon as his own subconscious, Fulgrim's descent into madness would be assured. With Horus Lupercal's corruption by the ruinous powers complete, the War Master of Chaos would call to his likewise damned brother to join his betrayal of the Imperium. Heeding the call of his brother and once mentor, Fulgrim would begin his ever-worsening descent into madness with the persecution of the Diasporex. The Iron Hands, led by their Primarch Ferus Manus, would be tasked with achieving compliance with the human elements of the Xenos Human Coalition known as the Diasporex. With the Diasporex declining the invitation to join the Imperium, the Iron Tenth would begin their purge of the civilization. Competent in naval warfare, the Diasporex would prove a difficult foe to destroy. Calling to his most stalwart allies, Ferris would petition aid from Fulgrim and the Third Legion to add their blades to the fight. Together, the Iron Hands and Emperor's children would crush the Diasporex, but not without Fulgrim's ego being damaged due to his own reckless actions. The malevolent influence of the Lair Blade would feed Fulgrim's resentment of his brother's selfless and heroic actions to aid his forces. With the Diasporex slain, Fulgrim would travel to the ancient Eldar craftworld of Ufwe and be confronted by the Asavani Farseer, Eldrad Ufrain. Warning Fulgrim of the Warmaster's impending betrayal, 
Fulgrim would, with the influence of the Lairblade, unleash his outrage at the Eldar's accusations of his cherished brother. With the aid of his Phoenix Guard, Fulgrim would slaughter Eldrad's Eldar retinue and cause the Farseer to retreat. Ordering his fleet to virus bomb several Eldari worlds, Fulgrim's rage would not be sated. Seeking answers from Horus in person, Fulgrim would, despite his objections to Eldrad's assertions, succumb to the charisma and charm of the Warmaster and join in his plot for rebellion. His respect for his second closest brother, enough to turn his back on the Emperor. Promised true perfection should he submit to the powers of chaos, Fulgrim would meet once more with his most adored brother, Ferris Manus, in an attempt to sway the Iron Tenth to join the traitor cause. Upon the world of Kalanides IV, the Iron Hands wrested control of the planet from the Orc Menace. Meeting with Ferris Manus, Fulgrim would naively declare his allegiance to the plot to destroy the Imperium. Enraged, the stalwart hero of humanity, Ferris Manus, would attack Fulgrim. His duty to the Imperium and loyalty to the Emperor as unshakable as iron, Ferris would destroy his once bond of kinship, Fireblade, from Fulgrim's grasp with his own hands. With the sword's destruction, Ferris would be incapacitated with Fulgrim taking his own craft, Forgebreaker, in his hands. Unable to slay his brother, Fulgrim would settle for slaughtering the Gorgon's Morlock Honor Guard. The Emperor's children would submit to the thrall of the being known as Slanesh, and with their mutated bodies and souls, reinforce the Warmaster's staging ground of the Istvan system. With Horus's betrayal laid bare for all to see, the Emperor would dispatch his remaining loyal sons to bring the traitors to justice. Spoiling for revenge, Ferris Manus would lead the charge to Istvan V. Alongside the Salamanders and Raven Guard legions, the Loyalists would face the traitors in battle. Against the World Eaters, Death Guard, Sons of Horus, and their own most hated foe, the Emperor's children, the Iron Hands would seek to destroy the Phoenician and his ilk. Yet as the second wave of reinforcements to the battle arrived, the Legion sent to purge the traitors to the throne would instead join them. The Iron Warriors, Night Lords, Word Bearers, and Alpha Legion would turn on the Loyalists and outnumber their forces with overwhelming firepower. Ferris Manus betrayed once more would face his beloved brother, Fulgrim, in battle. Armed with the reforged Fireblade, Ferris Manus would make a desperate final act to avenge his honor guard, lost friendship, and the memory of his once virtuous brother. Upon the Urgal Depression, Fulgrim and Ferris would clash, yet armed with the demonically imbued Demon Blade, Fulgrim would cleave Ferris's head from his body with a slice of the Lair Blade. As if awakening from a deep slumber, Fulgrim would look upon his slain brother and grieve at his heinous actions. Stricken with grief, Fulgrim would submit to the whispers of the Lair Blade, which promised to absolve him from his sorrows. Freed from its prison, the greater demon would possess Fulgrim's body and imprison the Phoenician soul. Now replaced by the demon of the Lair Blade, Fulgrim would exponentially hasten the corruption of the Emperor's children. Revealing itself to the Warmaster, Horus and the demon would reach an understanding that it shall remain in control of the Phoenician's body should it continue to aid the traitor war effort. Gifting the severed head of the first Primarch to fall during the heresy, Ferris Manus, the demonically possessed Fulgrim would join the remaining seven Primarchs of the traitor cause at the Conclave above Horus's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. Lorgar Aurelian, Primarch of the Wordbearers Legion, would observe the presence within Fulgrim and attempt to exorcise it from the Phoenician's body. Failing to dominate the being, Lorgar would weaken the demon's hold on its prey, yet withdraw from the Conclave, unsuccessful in his attempt to free his brother. Upon the Emperor's children flagship, Pride of the Emperor, the senior members of the Third Legion would continue efforts to exercise their Primarch. Under the supervision of the Chief Apothecary, Fabius Bile, Captains Lucius, Julius Caesaron, and Marius Virosian would begin their ministrations. Freeing their gene father from the demon's clutches, Fulgrim would reveal himself to be biding his time and understanding the creature from within. Spurred to take the demon unawares, Fulgrim would dominate the entity and resume control of his body. 
now armed with an intimate understanding of the foul inner workings of demonology, Fulgrim would petition aid from the 4th Legion Primarch, Perturabo, to accompany him on a journey to explore his newfound understanding. A journey to the crone world of Idris. Alongside the Iron Warriors, the Emperor's children would venture into the heart of the Eye of Terror. Promising the Lord of Iron a wondrous power of immense value within the Ocularis Terribus, Fulgrim would not divulge the true intention behind their voyage. Despite enduring an ambush perpetrated by the Shattered Legion Astartes of the vessel, Sisyphium, the Primarchs would continue their traversal to the Crone World. Upon the world of Idris, Fulgrim would discover the tomb of the so-called Angel Exterminatus within the sepulcher of Isha's doom. The distilled essence of the countless perished souls rent from the birth of she who firsts, the orb of jade light which shine ablaze alike to a miniature sun. Draining strength from his brother, Perturabo, Fulgrim would harvest the power of the hollow world and the Lord of Iron to achieve his apotheosis. Reborn as a demon prince of Slanesh, Fulgrim's skin would mutate into a four-armed serpentine creature. Departing from the planet with his emperor's children, Fulgrim's ascension would be bought at the cost of the ever-dwindling loyalty of his brothers, further influencing his legion to become ever more debased and mutated. Fulgrim would wage war for the remainder of the Horus Heresy as a distracted, stimuli-obsessed monster. For even during the final battle of the war, the Siege of Terror, Fulgrim and his legion would busy themselves not with direction, discipline or focus, but with the torture and mutilation of the civilian populace. The traitor war effort would fail, in part due to the Third Legion's wanton indulgencies and force Fulgrim and the Emperor's children to retreat into the Eye of Terror. Abusing and depleting their captured slaves, the Emperor's children would seek new prey to enact their perversions. Fulgrim would lead his fragmented and wayward sons to ever more heretical pursuits of indulgences. The traitors would turn on one another, as all duplicitous betrayers unbound from honor and discipline are wont to do. With the Legion Wars incurring a heavy toll on every traitor legion, the Emperor's children would not be spared such losses. Devolving into small war bands, Fulgrim's lack of leadership or grand objective would divide his once proud legion. Though whilst the Third Legion may be divided and without direction, the Demon Primarch's influence still brings ruination to the galaxy. Confronted by the Primarch of the Ultramarines, Rebute Gilliman, during the scouring of the traitors, following their failed coup, Fulgrim would prove to be a dangerous foe. During 121.M31, the 13th Legion would seek retribution from the Emperor's children at the Battle of Fasala. Dueling the Ultramarines Primarch in single combat, Fulgrim would prove to be a deadly opponent and with his chaos-infused form, slice the throat of Rebute Gilliman with a poison-infused blade. Damning Gilliman to a 10,000-year stasis-fueled slumber within Macrag's Temple of Correction, the Phoenicians' actions would deal the Imperium a fatal blow which would be felt for millennia. Yet with the return of the Avenging Sun during 999.M41, Rebute Gilliman's resurgent wrath demands vengeance against the Phoenician. And despite his long seclusion within the Eye of Terror, rumor persists that the chosen demon Primarch of Slanesh once more unites his legion for war. His never-ending quest for his debased pleasures once more unleashed upon the galaxy. That which causes us trials shall yield us triumph. That which makes our hearts ache shall fill us with gladness. For the only true happiness is to learn, to advance and improve. None of this could happen without rejecting error, ignorance and imperfection. We must pass out of the darkness to reach the light. Tell them ruin has come to their world. Death, despair and red war. Tell them their hopes and pride have come to nothing. Tell them their empty whispers fall upon deaf ears. Their gods are dead. Human reason has killed them. Tell them the angels of death have come. Tell them nothing can save them now. A 
among the Primarchs of his Imperium, pride would be the downfall of many of their legacies. Imbued with power alike to gods, each Primarch would be capable of conquering, sundering, and building empires with their innate talents. Yet with such power, it is easy to fall to the temptations of ego, bitterness, and self-aggrandizement. For today, we shall elucidate a Primarch, cursed with great knowledge and an endless hunger to prove his intelligence, capabilities, and superiority. The Lord of Iron of the Fourth Legion, Perturabo. With the scattering of the Primarchs across the disparate stars of the galaxy, the young Primarch of the Fourth Legion would be spirited to the world of Olympia. A civilized world abounding with culture, art and technologies, the planet would despite its trappings be laced with political deception and duplicity. The young Primarch had been sighted wandering the outskirts of the settlements and outcast clusters of the planet. Gifted with inhuman strength and an artisan's craftsmanship, the Primarch had offered his skills to the people of Olympia as a means of trade. Nomadic in his dealings, the Primarch would evade the notice of the courts of Olympia, yet eventually be discovered by the servants of the tyrant of Lokos. Found climbing the walls of the city of Lokos, the guards would bring the boy before their ruler, Damekos. Referring to himself as Perturabo, the child had an innate understanding of his own being and the mechanisms of technology. Ordered by Damakos to prove his martial and artisanal aptitude, would best any warrior brought to fight him and solve any puzzle or intellectual quandary devised by Lokos's most capable scholars. Intrigued with the boy's unparalleled skills, Damakos would offer Perturabo a bargain. Serve him as a member of his court as a loyal adopted son and he would be given protection, patronage, and free access to Lokos's scholarships and military training. Accepting the tyrant's offer, Perturabo would prove to be a diligent prodigy of many talents. The Primarch would consume information, lore, and study with a ravenous hunger, and swiftly become the foremost accomplished and intelligent being of Olympia. Slow to trust anyone, Perturabo would deny the affections of his adoptive father. Plagued with ennui and the ever-disturbing leer of the maelstrom within view of the planet's surface, Perturabo would be the only soul of Olympia capable of seeing the looming threat from the planet's surface. Unable to shrug the sensation of ceaseless judgment born from the maelstrom's gaze, the scrutiny of the stars would further mold the young Primarch into a cold, brooding figure. Naming the great tear in real space as the Eye of Terror, the aloof Primarch would be unaware of the future portents of the malevolent forces deep within its mercurial heart. Mastering the arts of siege warfare, influenced in part by his homeworld's mountainous landscapes, the warring city-states of Olympia would give ample opportunity for Perturabo to test his stratagems of war. Beset on all sides by treachery and vendettas, Lokos would be locked in an endless game of power and deception. Quickly rising through the ranks of Lokos's military, Perturabo would draft mercenaries and war artisans into his army's ranks. His victories unchallenged, it would not be long before Perturabo's reputation would cause soldiers of fortune to flock to his banner. Inventing deadly contraptions of war and outfitting his armies with the finest weapons and armor, Perturabo's innovations would be revolutionary to his people. Mastering astronomy, medicinal breakthroughs, automation, production, and architecture, it would not be long before Perturabo would become infamous in the eyes of his enemies. Dubbed the Hammer of Olympia due to his force's overwhelming firepower and destructive strength, the Warlord of Lokos would soon dominate the planet. Culling the duplicitous betrayer within the court of Lokos, the now Lord of Iron would, if not for his aloof nature, be poised to rule Olympia. Hardened by the planet's insidious and treacherous nature, Perturabo would grow to become a merciless, indomitable force, his iron will encompassing the Kavephos heraldry of his banner. A steel executioner's mask would prove to be an omen for any whom would choose to stand in defiance of its promise of bloodshed and punishment. Though capable of usurping his adoptive father, Perturabo would honor the tyrant Alokos's bargain. With no cause to slay Damikos, 
the tyrant of Locos would seemingly come to rule Olympia as its unopposed ruler. Yet with the arrival of the Master of Mankind to the planet, such ambitions would be dashed. Meeting with Perturabo, the Emperor would observe his gene son to be a capable and loyal subject of his own world. Acknowledging Perturabo's disposition to reject the mantle of rulership, the Emperor would be quick to install the Lord of Iron as a general of the Great Crusade. Brought to Holy Terror to sate his need for knowledge, Perturabo would study the history of humanity. Alongside his scholarly brother, Magnus the Red, the Crimson King and Lord of Iron would spend months together reading of the past glories, secrets and hard-won mysteries of the Age of Strife. The philosophies of humanity's ancient history would be rich insight for the two Primarchs, and together they would form a bond of respect for their shared love of learning and discovery. Though difficult to trust, once the Lord of Iron's friendship was achieved, it would become unbreakable. Or at least such would seem to be the case for the promising upstart Primarch. Yet with time, Perturabo's heart would continue to harden with his involvement in the Great Crusade to restore humanity. Devoting himself to the burgeoning Imperium, Perturabo would be given command of his legion, newly named in his image as the Iron Warriors. Given rulership of Olympia and drafting recruits from its populace to bolster his legion, Perturabo would in all but title depose the tyrant of Locos. The seed of anti-imperial unrest would be planted, to which Damakos would tend to its slow yet ceaseless momentum. Accompanying the Emperor to observe the standard to which wars must be waged, Perturabo would mould his legion with an iron fist. Finding his legion's deeds to be lacking in comparison to their brother legions, Perturabo would enact a harsh reprisal. Ordering his legion into squads of ten, each member of the Iron Warriors would draw lots. One member of each squad would draw a mark of death, their execution to be conducted by the remaining nine members of the squad with their bare hands. Despite the protestation of the Imperial Court and Ultramarine's Primarch Rebute Gilliman, the Emperor would not reprimand Perturabo for his actions. Allowing for the Lord of Iron to dictate his legion's future by methods he deemed fit, the Emperor's sanctions of such drastic measures would be final. Perturabo would demand total obedience from his men and give no mercy for failure. A living machine of war, the Iron Warriors would become a mirthless, brutal, and yet efficient army. Bringing scores of worlds into compliance, their trials and punishments would be relentless. Experimenting methods to harness brutal efficiency from his legion, Perturabo would not allow for any weakness in his ranks. Gaining a reputation as a legion capable of breaching any fortress, no matter its scale or splendor, the Iron Warriors under the command of their reunited Primarch would prove to be among the most deadly of the Legiones Astartes. A reputation which would prove crucial to the ambitions of the soon-to-be corrupted Warmaster of the Imperium, Horus Lupercal. With the fall of the Primarch of the 16th Legion, Horus Lupercal, to the thrall of Chaos, his opening gambit of the Civil War for humanity would require reinforcements. Slaughtering the Loyalist forces within the legions of the Emperor's children, World Eaters, Death Guard and his own legion, the Sons of Horus, the War Master would require allies in order to survive the reprisal of the Emperor. Observing the resentment in his brother caused by the Master of Mankind's continual mistreatment of the Lord of Iron and his men, the War Master would concoct an additional barb to sweeten his offer of betrayal. The Tyrant of Locos, Damakos, had died and left a power vacuum on the world of Olympia. Political uprising and violence would erupt across the Lord of Iron's homeworld and require his intervention to stem the tide of bloodshed. Yet with the hammer of Olympia's arrival to his home system, the spectre of his namesake's legacy would loom large. Already harried by their recent conflict with the Harad Xenos, the Iron Warriors would return to a world of spite and ungrateful resentment of their masters. Purging the cities of Olympia, Perturabo and the Iron Warriors would massacre five million souls in the attempt to restore order. Only once the skies darkened with the smoke wrought by the piles of charred bodies and burning cityscapes did the Lord of Iron achieve a moment of clarity. The Iron Warriors were not saviors, nor paragons of the Imperium's virtue, 
but cold-hearted, genocidal killers. Slaying his own stepsister, Caliphany, Perturabo would resign his fate to never be redeemed by the light of the Emperor. Joining the traitors to the throne in their quest to destroy the Imperium, the Iron Warriors would make their first open display of intent upon the world of Istvan V. Informed of the betrayal of the War Master, the Master of Mankind would dispatch seven legions to bring the traitors to justice. Led by the first wave of the Salamanders, Raven Guard and Iron Hands, commanded by the Primarch of the Iron Tenth, Ferris Manus, the remaining four legions would join the second assault wave to crush the traitors. Yet unknown to the Loyalists, the reinforcements of the Night Lords, Word Bearers, Alpha Legion and Iron Warriors had pledged their service to the War Master. Upon the scarred vistas of Eastvan V, the Iron Warriors would bear their bolters, armaments and siegecraft to bear. Forever known thereafter as the betrayers of Istvan, the Iron Warriors would gun down their loyalist kin during the now infamous Dropside Massacre. Their deeds enabling the deaths of Primarchs Ferris Manus, Vulcan, and the retreat of Corvus Corax, the free loyalist legions would be shattered, their surviving fragments scattered to the corners of the galaxy. Gifted the Warhammer, Forgebreaker by the Warmaster, the once personal weapon carried into battle by the Iron Hands Primarch Ferris Manus would be a worthy prize for the Hammer of Olympia's involvement in the massacre. Yet such a crippling blow would not be enough for the Lord of Iron. Seeking to once more humble the loyalists of the Imperium, Perturabo would seek to destroy his most hated rivals, the Imperial Fists. Experts alike to the Iron Warriors in fortification and siegecraft, Perturabo would harbor a deep resentment for the favor the Emperor would show to the Seventh Legion and their Primarch, Rogal Dawn. Cleansing the planet of Hydra Cordatus, garrisoned by the Imperial Fists, Perturabo's hunger for vengeance would not be satisfied. Tasked by the War Master to ambush the Seventh Legion's retribution fleet, Perturabo would personally engage the Imperial Fists within the Fal system. Crippling the Retribution fleet, but repelled by the fleet commander, Captain Alexis Pollux, the Lord of Iron would deal a devastating blow to a third of the Seventh Legion's combined might. His first for battle temporarily quenched, Perturabo would be petitioned by the Emperor's children Primarch, Fulgrim, to accompany him to acquire an artifact of great power hidden deep within the Eye of Terror. Perturabo's life had been influenced greatly by the malevolent glare of the Eye of Terror from the days he first walked upon Olympia. Despite his reservations at his brother's flagrant, two-faced and insidious nature, the Lord of Iron would not deny the chance to discover the secrets hidden deep within his primordial tormentor. Joining with the Emperor's children, the Primarch would venture to the crone world of Idris. Despite their disgust at the disorganized and gaudy rabble of the Third Legion, the Iron Warriors would regardless join their gene father in their venture into the Maelstrom. Harried by the Shattered Legion warband, the Orphans of War, aboard the warship, the Sisyphean, the Iron Warriors would prove capable in staving off the Loyalist attacks. For the Emperor's children's continued disregard for authority and discipline, Perturabo would humble Fulgrim and assume total command of both legions during their months of voyage. Upon their arrival to the planet of Idris, Perturabo would accompany Fulgrim to the heart of the long-dead planet. Once the seat of power of the Eldari, the Primarchs now stood upon the epicenter of the birth of the being known as She Who Firsts, Slanesh. The birth scream of the foul being would rend the fabric of the galaxy, birthing the Eye of Terror and leaving a portion of its power within the sepulchre of Isha's doom. Seizing the power for himself, Fulgrim would turn on the Lord of Iron and draw strength from his body. Defiant in the face of his own betrayal, Perturabo would strike Fulgrim with the weapon of his own devising, Forgebreaker. Destroying his mortal form, Perturabo strike from the now chaos-tainted weapon in combination to the power Fulgrim had drawn would allow for the Phoenician's ascension. Reborn as a demon prince of Slanesh, Fulgrim would transform and with his newfound power withdraw himself and his legion from the now crumbling planet. Enraged at his manipulation by the Phoenician, 
Pertorabo would seek to vindicate his legion for such a foolhardy blunder. Recommitting his legion's might to the traitor war effort, it would not be long until the durability of the 4th legion would be tested one final time. The War Master's slow yet inexorable march to Holy Terror would be close to its fruition. The Iron Warrior's efforts for the remainder of the years leading to the final assault of the Throne World would remain a thankless task. Embittered once more at their mistreatment, Pertorabo would demand satisfaction for his warrior's peerless capabilities to be put to the test. The Lord of Iron would prove that he was the greatest strategist humanity had ever seen and set his eyes on the bastion of the Imperial Palace as the canvas of his greatest victory. Joining the Traitor Legions en masse, the Iron Warriors would be the backbone of the Siege of Terror. Their mastery of siegecraft would be tested, and after many grueling months of toil, the 4th Legion would begin to break the defences of the Loyalist Legions. Despite the Lord of Iron's best laid plans, his brother Primarchs and their Legion would prove unreliable in following his orders. Whilst he would derive immense pleasure in tearing down the bastions crafted by Primarch Rogel Dawn, Pertorabo would lose faith in the traitor assault. Withdrawing his legion from the conflict, Pertorabo would not be present to witness the death of the War Master at the hands of the Emperor. Yet such matters were now no longer of import to the Hammer of Olympia, for he would set a final trap to end his rival, Rogel Dawn. Constructing an immense fortress upon the world of Sebastus IV, known as the Iron Cage, Pertorabo would ensnare the Praetorians of Terror into his trap. The Imperial Fists, led by their Primarch, Rogel Dawn, now incensed with the crippling of the Emperor and devastation of the Throne World, would charge into the clutches of the Lord of Iron. If it was the intent of Rogel Dawn to battle with honor, such an expectation would be misplaced. Using every act of cunning, division, and entrapment, the Lord of Iron would attempt to destroy the Imperial Fists piecemeal with overwhelming firepower. For three weeks, the ever-eroding 7th Legion would fight a desperate battle to achieve their vengeance against their hated foe. Yet with the intervention of the Ultramarines and their Primarch, Rebute Gilliman, the annihilation of the Imperial Fists would be prevented. Denied his final great victory against the 7th Legion, Pertorabo would withdraw from the battle with the salvaged gene seed of 400 Imperial Fist Astartes. Offering his spoils of war to the ruinous powers within the Immaterium, Pertorabo would be elevated and transformed into a demon prince of chaos undivided. Not seen for ten millennia, the Lord of Iron would scheme upon the demon world of Medrangard within his labyrinthine citadel of stone and iron. His reluctance to delve into Imperial space, now wavering with rumour that the Hammer of Olympia shall once again strike a catastrophic blow to humanity. For though iron can be broken, its sharp edges can still be used to cause untold harm, and with time and diligence such fragments can be reforged into something far stronger than once imagined. I have bitten my tongue and allowed you to bring my legion into this place, said Pertorabo. I have followed your lead in all things. I have listened to your tall tales and allowed you to set the pace of this expedition. Pertorabo leaned forward and said, That ends now. He released Fulgrim, who held himself erect in the face of Pertorabo's cold anger. Your warriors have no discipline. Monsters fight your battles, and you have allowed an entire vessel to be sacrificed in the name of vanity. But no more. From here onwards, I am in charge, and for the duration of this mission, your legion is mine to command. Your warriors will obey my orders, they will follow my lead, and they will do nothing except by command. If you agree to that, then we will continue on into the Eye of Terror and finish this together. If you don't, then I will take my legion and leave you here. Do you understand? Fulgrim nodded and swallowed a mouthful of blood. I understand, brother, he said, his voice a gargled, mangled mockery of its once perfect cadence. 
I understand that you humble me and expect me to swallow my pride to be your lapdog. I don't need a damn lapdog, snarled Paterabo. I need an equal. But I am not your equal, brother, said Fulgrim, grinning through his bloodified features, as though this outburst of violence was somehow amusing. I surpass you in every way. And yet, I'm the one holding the hammer. Warriors of Chogoris, brothers of the great tribe, the star hunt calls you. Do you not hear it? The battle's red edge is your home, the respect of your kinsmen your half. Plunge into the enemy's breast like a blade, cut out his heart, and you will know fulfillment. The Emperor has given us strength. In return, we give him victory. Of all the sons of the Emperor, a select few have always been viewed with disdain by their brothers. For the Primarchs are the greatest living beings of the Imperium, with exception to the Emperor himself, and their influence across the galaxy molds the Imperium's children to follow. While some are hewn into statues proclaiming their virtues on Imperial worlds, and the fallen Primarchs are worshipped by fell demons, there is one who has always been regarded with suspicion and never truly understood by either loyalist or traitor. Seen by most as a barbarian, this Primarch would in his solitude prove to be well cultured and intelligent, but keep his intentions and traits closely guarded to prevent them from being exploited. Jagatai Khan, Primarch of the Fifth Legion and Great Khan of Chagoris. During the scattering of the Primarchs, Jagatai would land on the planet of Chagoris, a fertile world filled with vast plains of grass, snow-topped mountains and vast oceans. The planet was ruled by the Palatine, a feudal aristocrat whom led his vast armies to dominate the planet. However, there was a land to the west of the Palatine that he would leave wild, the Empty Quarter, a barren grassland with little in resources or value, inhabited by nomadic tribes whom fought amongst themselves for their ancestral lands. This is where Jagatai would be found by a man by the name of Ong Khan, chieftain of the small tribe of the Talaskas. Seeing the child as a gift from the gods, Ong would see the fire in Jagatai's eyes, the mark of a great warrior. Ong was hated by the other tribes of the Empty Quarter, for his visions of a united tribe of the downtrodden people of the Empty Quarter. One day, the tribes would kill Jagatai's adoptive father for his ideals. Even as a boy, Jagatai was without match as a warrior amongst the men of the Talaska tribe, and he would gather his fellow tribesmen to seek vengeance against his father's killers. The Kurayed tribe would be slaughtered, not only the men, but the women and children as well. Jagatai would cleave the head from the tribe's chieftain and mount it to his sleeping tent. The slaughter would forge Jagatai into a fiercely ruthless yet loyal warrior. With his father's death avenged, Jagatai would swear to unite the people of the Empty Quarter as one tribe and bring an end to its constant infighting. Fighting hundreds of battles for years, Jagatai would assimilate the warring tribes into the fold, making military service mandatory for all who joined while splitting the tribe's people amongst themselves to weed out blood feuds and differences within its people. Ten years later, the Khan would travel to his winter settlement and be set upon by the Palatine's hunting bands led by its emperor's son. Jagatai would kill the men, leaving one mutilated rider to bring the Palatine Emperor the severed head of his son. Enraged, the Palatine would gather a gigantic army to destroy the tribes of the Empty Quarter, but ultimately underestimate Jagatai. His heavily armored soldiers bested by the Khan's more mobile warriors and archers, the Palatine would retreat, leading to the tribe elders to confer the title of the first Kagan, or Khan of Khans, to Jagatai. As Jagatai would continue his conquest, he would recruit soon-to-be legendary members of his future legion, including Kinja, Hasik, and Targetai Yesuge. Besieging the cities of the Palatine, the Kagan would give its inhabitants two choices, surrender or die. Jagatai would eventually reach the palace of the Palatine, he would demand its emperor's head on a pike from the city, which its inhabitants would willingly oblige. Jagatai would adorn it on his tent, exactly as he had done to his father's killer, 
two decades before. Within two years, Jagatai had conquered Jagoris' largest empire in its history and ended all wars upon the planet's surface. Six months later, the Emperor would arrive on Jagoris, along with the 16th Legion of Astartes, the Lunar Wolves, and their Primarch, Horus Lupercal. Jagatai would instantly perceive the Emperor's might and conclude that his dream of a united species amongst the stars would be possible, even if the Emperor would be at its helm and not himself. Jagatai would resign his position of master and become a servant of the Emperor's will, dropping to one knee and swearing fealty to the Emperor and his Imperium. Considering that rejection of the Emperor's will would lead to his people's annihilation and seeing the Lunar Wolves present, reason that these indomitable warriors would soon mirror his own should he swear loyalty to the Imperium. Jagatai would also hand over the shackles of mundanity that statesmanship required and would revel in his duty to the Imperium of waging war and hunting the enemies of humanity. Soon he would be given command of his legion, then known as the Star Hunters. Jagatai would overhaul his Terran-born son's tactics, implementing his Chagoran learned strategies of speed and maneuverability to best his foes. As the Imperium was desperate for the fighting prowess of all Primarchs, Jagatai would be sent straight into the Moor of Conflict. With the war against the Nephilim resulting in Jagatai renaming his sons of the Fifth Legion, the Legion would conduct a ritual at the empty quarter of Chagoras, known as the Blooding. 50,000 sons of the Khan would take up blades and cut a mark on the flesh of their faces, inflicting scars that would also herald their individual renaming as Sons of the White Scars. With further battles waged during the Ulanor Crusade against the Orc Hordes, Jagatai would earn a reputation within the Imperium as a truly deadly warrior. Rogal Dorn and Rebute Gilliman would object to the Khan's swift induction into the theatre of war, believing the Primarch to lack true understanding of the Imperium's values and culture, leaving him ill-prepared to integrate into the wider Imperium. Though the Khan did have strong bonds with some of his brothers, notably Horus Lupercal and Magnus the Red of the Thousand Sons. As the first Primarch to meet the Khan, Horus would revel in their shared exploits and respect for one another as warriors. Whilst Magnus was an outsider to his brothers just like the Khan and shared a kinship for the pursuit of knowledge. It was therefore tragic that his most erstwhile brothers would one day be his enemies. With the beginning stages of the Horus heresy, Horus would turn to Jagatai for his allegiance. However, his loyalty to the Emperor was unbreakable, and the Khan would stay his hand. Jagatai would not dive into the conflict, instead waiting patiently for information to be relayed to him. Even when being petitioned for aid by Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves to combat the traitor forces of the Alpha Legion, the Khan would receive conflicting reports from several legions, but wisely not involve himself until he knew the truth of the events that had unfolded. Seeking answers, the Khan would receive urgent orders from Rogal Dorn himself, requesting for the White Scars to immediately travel to Holy Terror to aid in its defense. The Alpha Legion would blockade his passage, presenting themselves neither as friend or foe. The Khan would assess their ruse, realizing their actions sought to sow doubt in his mind, keeping the White Scars immobile and neutered in the wider war that was waging. The Khan's fleet would confront the Alpha Legion blockade, which would result in the Alpha Legion firing on their vessels. The 20th Legion, renowned for their secrecy, would be bested by the Khan's cunning, and the White Scars would push past the blockade and travel into warp space, their destination unknown. The 5th Legion would find themselves at Prospero, its surface scorched to the consistency of burnt charcoal. On the surface, the Khan would speak with an apparition of his beloved brother, Magnus the Red. He explained that he had tried to warn the Emperor of Horus's betrayal, but was punished for his intervention. When pressed for his allegiance, Magnus would reveal his opposition to the Emperor, and the Khan would stand with the Imperium. Feeling a presence that had haunted him since Ulanor, the Khan would witness a spear of light pierce the sky of Prospero, summoning the Primarch of the Death Guard, Mortarion. The Primarch of the 14th Legion would implore the Khan to join Horus' traitor legions. Noticing the physical changes to his brother, the Khan would warn Mortarion of further changes that might befall his legion should he continue to pursue his corrupted path. Mortarion would brush aside his warnings, and with the Khan's refusal to join the traitors, the two Primarchs would duel. 
Their battle would end in stalemate, with the cowardly Mortarion retreating before the battle could be finished. With his interactions between Magnus and Mortarion concluded, Jagatai had finally deduced the extent of the traitorous intent of Horus Lupercal's rebellion. Resolving to aid his brother Primarch Rogel Dawn in the defense of Terra, the Khan would utilize the Dark Glass, a relic from the Dark Age of Technology recently discovered by rogue traders. White Scar veteran Targutai Yusuge would sacrifice his life to power the relic and allow the Khan to travel to Terra. Meeting with Rogel Dawn, Sanguinius, and Malkador the Sigilite, the assembled protectors of Terra would devise their strategy to combat the incoming traitor forces. With the full force of chaos assaulting the Imperial Palace, Jagatai Khan would aid the beleaguered defenders of the throne by recovering the vital Lionsgate spaceport from traitor forces, using his strategies of lightning-fast raid tactics, reclaiming the spaceport in a tremendous single strike. Jagatai would also lead his 300-strong Jetbike Battalion to assault the Colossi Gate with support from Blood Angel Captain Rauderon and Adeptus Custodes Commander, Constantin Valdor. This retaliation would be halted by the arrival of the Death Guard, with the now fully chaos-corrupted Primarch Mortarion dueling Jagatai once again. Their rematch would prove that Jagatai was no match in strength for the now empowered Primarch of the 14th Legion. However, the Khan understood the psychology of his brother and baited him with barbed words and insults that played to his neuroticism. Overextending Mortarion, he would reveal a weakness for the Khan to exploit. As Jagatai was impaled by Mortarion's scythe, the Khan would behead his former brother, casting his soul into the warp. After recovering from his wounds and with the Horus heresy quashed under the heel of his Imperium, Jagatai Khan would return to Chagoris. Finding that the Dark Eldar had made several raids on his homeworld, the Khan would hunt down the Drukhari, even pursuing his charge into the webway to bring an end to their foul deeds. To which he has since not returned, though it is said amongst the veterans of the White Scars that the Great Khan will one day return to his legion in the time of their greatest need and bring righteous fury to the enemies of his Imperium. It is not enough to take from an enemy their life, rather take from them also their places of safety, their allies, their homes and their loved ones, crush all those in their care, lay their chattels to waste and then drive them alone and naked into the darkness, take everything they have and burn it for the mere pleasure of seeing the ash crackle between your fingers, and call it nothing more than a beginning. There are those who undervalue the penal battalions, but they should consider this. Should a man who has wronged the Emperor be allowed to wrong him further? For each man executed is a man who can no longer serve, and to fail in service to the Emperor is the greatest of sins. Loyalty is a trait that defines the heroic Primarchs who refuse the temptations of chaos. Each Primarch weighed the cost of portraying their Imperium by clashing blades and bolters with their brothers. For some, the Imperium would be secondary yet compatible of their true allegiances, whilst for others their allegiance to the Emperor would be unshakable. But there is only one Primarch whose loyalty is truly ironclad, with no hesitation to reject the poison chalice of chaos. Though seen by many of his brothers as a butcher of men, he would nonetheless be the Emperor's greatest executioner and loyal servant, the Wolf King of Fenris, Lehman Russ. The young Primarch would land on the icy death world of Fenris, his incubation pod plummeting into the flank of a vast mountain. Despite the harsh weather, the infant would be found by a she-wolf, a gigantic Fenrisian thunderwolf. Despite its ferocious nature, the wolf would nurture the child and raise it within its wolf pack, a third child to raise alongside its own children, the male wolves whom would be known as Freki and Geri. During the season of Hellwinter, the child and the wolf pack would scavenge for food within the territory of Thengir, King of the Rus. Escaping with their food, the king would send a raiding party after the wolves, armed with poisonous arrows and blades of sharpened steel. The child would attempt to defend them, being injured trying to protect his adoptive mother 
and killing dozens of men with his bare hands. The she-wolf would die, but the tribesmen of the Rus would realize the creature bearing its fangs to be a small boy and lower their weapons. The child would be led to their king, and with his brothers, Freki and Geri at his side, the chieftain would see great potential in the young boy and order him to be given a place within his household. The boy would learn to laugh and to sing and understand his human traits. Even at such a young age, he would learn to speak and master the battle techniques of axes and swords. With this, he would be named by the king, Leman of the Rus. His exploits would be legendary on Fenris, said to battle entire armies of rival tribes alone, to uproot great oak trees with his bare hands, and to even wrestle the gigantic Fenrisian mammoths of the wilds. With time, the aging king would die, leaving the Rus alone as his successor. Under the rule of their new wolf king, the people of Fenris would thrive, the Rus's deeds even reaching the scouting parties of the Emperor of Mankind. Recognizing these incredible feats to be those of his son, the Emperor traveled to Fenris and disguised himself to venture into the court of the Rus. Meeting Lehman, the Emperor would challenge the youth to free trials. Knowing the proud Rus would not bend his knee without proof of his acumen, the Wolf King would decide the nature of the challenges. First, the two would indulge in an eating challenge. The Emperor would eat more than any man at the Rus's table, save for the Wolf King. For the second challenge, the two would drink, and by the time the Emperor had drunk his sixth barrel of Fenrisian mead, the two would conclude that there was no more mead to drink. The Wolf King would drain every ounce of alcohol within the feast hall. Failing both challenges, the Emperor would grow angry, decrying the Wolf King as a drunkard and a glutton. Unable to achieve anything more in life, with exception to stuffing his face and bellowing hollow boasts of glory. The Rus would declare his final challenge, drawing his sword from its scabbard. They would face each other in combat, the Emperor throwing his disguise to one side and revealing the splendor and glory of his power armor. The Emperor would not lose, and within an hour of being knocked unconscious by the Allfather's power glove, Lehman would admit defeat and swear fealty to the Emperor with a broken fang jutting from his bloodied smile. Under the tutelage of the Emperor, Lehman would learn of the Imperium's star-spanning technologies, understanding the finer points of High Gothic and earning the Emperor's approval to engage in the Great Crusade. He would meet the only other brother to so far be found during the scouring, Horus Lupercal. Horus would see his new brother as a savage and treat him with jealousy, masked as disdain. But the Rus would nonetheless seek to ease tensions between himself and his brother. Lehman would then be given command of his legion, the Space Wolves, and gifted his thrice-blessed suit of power armor and the legendary Frostblade, Mjolnar. Forged with the teeth of the great Kraken of Fenris, the blade was said to be strong enough to cleave its ice mountains in two. During the Great Crusade, Lehman Rus would gain a reputation as a cunning and fierce warrior. Whilst fighting the Wheel of Fire campaign, the Space Wolves would lose a third of their legion's numbers to the onslaught of orcs. Yet for his efforts, the Rus would be rewarded with the fortress monastery known as the Fang to be built on Fenris. He would also be gifted the Spear of Rus, forged by the Emperor's own hand, which had previously been known as the Dionysian Spear. Though Lehman would see little of the Emperor during the Great Crusade, he would be mentored and tempered by Malkador the Sigilite's wisdom, forming between them an unshakable bond. Due to his fiery temper and boisterous personality, the Rus would inevitably clash with his brother Primarchs. During the Doolan campaign, the Space Wolves would fight alongside the Dark Angels. The Doolan planet's leader would verbally insult Lehman Rus, stoking his rage and leading him to vow to kill him personally. As the two legions besieged the throne room, Lehman would burst through the doors at the moment where Lionel Johnson Primarch of the First Legion would behead the planet's ruler. Denied his retribution, Lehman Rus would demand penance from the Lion for his lost honor. The Lion would refuse, leading to the Primarchs to brawl for an entire week without pause. On the seventh day, the Rus would realize the immaturity of their actions 
and laugh uncontrollably. With the lion seeing this jest as a mockery to his honour, he would use the opportunity to strike the Rus unconscious. And as the Primarch was roused from his dormant state, the First Legion would leave the system, fueling a feud between the legions which would last into the millennia to follow, with both chapters adopting the custom of their chosen champions dueling for the honour of their Primarchs. Lehman Russ would also be sent to retrieve Angron, Primarch of the World Eaters, to be brought before the Emperor. The Red Angel had sought to implant his legion's Astartes with the Butcher's Nails brain implants, to which the Emperor would demand him to relent, sending his most loyal son to bring Angron to justice. On Malkova, the two Primarchs would clash. The Russ would restrain his martial prowess as he was instructed to by the Emperor, However, this restraint would lead to the Rus being bested by the Red Angel, and his legion would undergo the foul surgeries of the Butcher's Nails. Despite his many rivals, Lehman was regarded with respect by some of his brothers, particularly Robute Gilliman, who saw Lehman as one of three other Primarchs who always served the Emperor's will with utmost conviction, the others being Rogel Dawn, Sanguinius, and Ferris Manus. Regarded by Gilliman, as the dauntless few. Gilliman even proposed that his legion of the Ultramarines could win any war outright if only one of those Primarchs, including the Rus, fought beside him. Though as the Great Crusade came to a close, Lehman Rus would earn a nickname within the inner circle of his brother Primarchs, the Emperor's Executioner. During the Horus Heresy, Magnus the Red would defy the Emperor's decree of the Treaty of Nicaea. Attempting to warn the Emperor of the betrayal of Horus Lupercal, Magnus would irrevocably damage the Emperor's webway project, flooding the webway with demons and dooming humanity to continue traversing the ever-deadlier wall and incur its wrath for millennia. Sent by the Emperor, Russ would be tasked with bringing Magnus to terror to face judgement, but be manipulated by orders from Horus Lupercal his orders now stating to eliminate the Sons of Magnus. Prospero would burn, and the Thousand Sons would be decimated, but Magnus would nonetheless escape into the warp. Leaving Prospero, the space walls would be forced into a rout by the Alpha Legion, taking shelter in the Alaxis Nebula. Surrounded and abandoned by the White Scars Legion when called for aid, Russ would confide with Bjorn the Fell Handed stating that blindly serving the Emperor as his executioner was a grave mistake. Vowing to forge his own path, Lehman Russ would lead his forces in a desperate last stand against the 20th Legion. The Space Wolves would be saved, but grudgingly by the Dark Angels and return to Holy Terror. During his time on Terror, Russ would aid Malkador and the Knights Errant in planning the assassination of Horus Lupercal. Dawn and Sanguinius would implore Russ and his legion to stay on terror to defend against the oncoming traitor forces, but Lehman would resolve to kill Horus himself. With the aid of the Knights Errant, Russ would track the location of the vengeful spirit and prepare to duel Horus Lupercal. With the aid of his rune priests, the Russ would look for a weakness in the War Master by travelling to the Underverse, known by the Imperium as the Warp, and venture to Surtur's door. The Rus would confront the Earl King, a warp entity that collected the souls of Fenrisians who die outside of battle. Before he could be consumed by the Earl King's Vulfen, Lehman Rus offered to complete one of four tasks in exchange for his soul. Accepting his terms, the Earl King challenged Lehman to drink the damned soul of Amarok's bowl until it was dry. Second, he would wrestle an ancient crone, and finally, move the Earl King's great slumbering wolf. Lehman Russ had failed all challenges, but for his fourth, he would need to explain what the challenges he had attempted to accomplish really were. Russ assessed that the bowl represented the changing seasons of Fenris, the old crone was a manifestation of age, and that the wolf was death. The chamber crumbled, and a mirror of Russ dressed in finery would reveal the secret of the Dionysian spear. It held a portion of the Emperor's power and could illuminate the truth to those who were pierced by its tip. The false Russ would impale Lehman with the spear, revealing the true nature of the Primarchs. Despairing for a time, Russ would nonetheless emerge from Surtur's door, 
with the knowledge that he had the capacity to end the war should he win his duel with Horus. With the aid of his wolf lords, Beeman Russ would ambush the vengeful spirit and confront Horus. Offered to join the traitors, Russ flatly refused Horus's offer and fought the war master. Allowing a chance for Horus to wound him with his lightning claw, Russ would use this feint to impale Horus with the spear of Russ. However, due to a moment's hesitation, his strike would land, but not be fatal. Badly wounded, Russ would be dragged from the battle by Bjorn the Fell Handed and Grimnar Blackblood as hundreds of space wolves swarmed the War Master. Russ would fall into a comatose state as Abaddon the Despoiler pursued the depleted space wolves to the Yarrant system. With the aid of Raven Guard Primarch Corvus Korax, the space wolves would manage to escape the Yarrant system, with Lehman Russ passing on the Dionysian spear to Bjorn. The Russ would not be present for the Siege of Terror and would not return until well after the entombing of the Emperor on the Golden Throne. Returning to Fenris one last time, Lehman Russ would host a great feast, then address his sons before embarking into the Eye of Terror. Listen but closely, brothers, for my life breath is all but spent. There shall come a time far from now when our chapter itself is dying, and as I am now dying, and our foes shall gather to destroy us. Then, my children, I shall listen for your call in whatever realm of death holds me. And come I shall, no matter what the laws of life and death forbid. At the end I will be there, for the final battle. For the wolf time. This tale would be retold every 1,000 years by Bjorn the Fell Handed, the now great wolf of Fenris. The Space Wolves would on occasion scout the galaxy in a great hunt in search for their Primarch, but to this day, to no avail. There is no enemy. The foe on the battlefield is merely the manifestation of that which we must overcome. He is doubt, and fear, and despair. Every battle is fought within. Conquer the battlefield that lies inside you, and the enemy disappears like the illusion he is. Virtue is often attributed unto the Primarchs of the Imperium. For it is true that many of the Emperor of Mankind's sons imbue their legions with their greatest traits, inspiring their sons with ideals such as heroism, loyalty, bravery, and sacrifice. Though of all the Primarchs, there is only one synonymous with righteousness, symbolizing the Imperium's truth, fortitude, and valor. Primarch of the Seventh Legion of Adeptus Astartes, Rogal Dawn. During the scattering of the Primarchs, Rogal Dawn would land on the death world of Inwit within the system of the same name. Caught in the gravitational pull of a dying star, Half of Inwit's surface would be blanketed in perpetual darkness, with the other illuminated by faded sunlight. Dawn's capsule would be discovered by an ice cast, native to the ice hives of the world. The Patriarch of the House of Dawn would raise the Primarch as his grandfather, teaching him tactics and survival skills. When Rogal Dawn eventually discovered that his grandfather was not a blood relative, he still held his memory in high regard keeping a fur-edged robe that belonged to him, blanketing his bed with each night that he slept. Inwit bred hardy people as the planet bore little of value, but Rogal Dawn would lead his caste. Reaching other planets for greater resources and unifying the system's people under the Inwit Empire, with Rogal Dawn becoming its emperor. The Primarch would also discover a ship within the orbit of his homeworld, the Phalanx. A colossal vessel constructed during the Age of Technology, Dawn would spend years trying to reactivate it. Within 40 years of the death of his adoptive grandfather, Dawn would be discovered by the Emperor of Mankind and his Imperium. As the seventh Primarch to be found by the Emperor, Rogal Dawn would meet with him at the helm of the Phalanx. Returning the vessel to his father's care, Rogal Dawn would bend the knee to the Imperium and the Phalanx would become the Imperial Fist's fortress monastery. Dawn would from this day remain fiercely loyal to the Emperor, becoming an exemplar of the truth. He would never tell a lie and be a staunch defender of the Imperium. 
commanding his legion and expeditionary fleets with both military genius and peerless devotion to the task set forth by the Emperor, Dawn would be compared to his brother Primarchs due to his similar traits. Bearing the same discipline as Gilliman, the bravery of the Lion, and even revealing moments of reckless zeal akin to the Khan or the Rus. Horus Lupercal would even state that a fortification held by Dawn's legion of the Imperial Fists could stave off his own legion of the Lunar Wolves in an endless stalemate should the conflict ever occur. Tasked by the Emperor with constructing the capital homeworld of Holy Terror's Imperial Palace, Dawn would forge a magnificent fortress which would prove crucial in time for the upcoming betrayal. As the Imperial Fists were recalled to Holy Terror, the Horus Heresy would ignite the flames of betrayal. Warp storms would impede the Seventh Legion's journey to Terror, allowing fate to cross Rogaldorn's path with the escaping Death Guard battle captain, Nathaniel Garrow, and his ship of Loyalist forces aboard the ship known as the Eisenstein. As Garrow relayed his news of Horus Lubakow's betrayal, Dawn would barely contain his rage, almost ending the life of Garrow, believing his words to be heretical lies. With the intervention of Remembrancer Mercedes Oliton and her cortical implants, Dawn would see with his own eyes the tyranny and butchery of his brother Primarch, as his forces massacred their detachment of Remembrancer historians, poets, and artists. Dawn would dispatch the majority of his legion to combat the rebellious factions in an attempt to quash Horus's plans before he had amassed a sizable force. Returning to Holy Terror, Dawn would inform the Emperor and his subjects of the events that were transpiring personally. The Emperor would declare Dawn as the Lord Commander of the Imperium. Charged with fortifying the Imperial Palace's defenses, Dawn would assume command of the Imperium. Whilst the Emperor managed the war within the webway and his project to end the Imperium's reliance on warp travel. Whilst Malkador the Sigilite dealt with the politics of the Imperium, Dawn would divide the Soul System into several spheres of defense, attempting to contain the traitor advance and split their forces. With the beginning of the 31st millennium, Horus would enact his invasion of the Soul System. With Mars and the Moon of Luna under attack, Dawn would helm the Phalanx and engage the traitor forces. Mercedes Oliton would travel to the station with urgent news of the traitor forces' actions, only to be revealed as corrupted by the demonic being known as Samus. Bringing with it demonic forces of chaos, Dawn would engage with the foul beings and continuously kill Samus. However, the demon would be reborn until Mercedes Oliton would take her own life, closing the portal from which the demons had emerged. With the soul system falling to traitor forces, Dawn would return to the Imperial Palace to command the defenders of the throne. Leading the forces of the Bab Bastion and Sky Fortress, Dawn would forbid his Primarch brothers Sanguinius and Jagatai Khan from leaving the palace walls, intending to slowly bleed the forces of Horus with a protracted siege. Buying time for the arrival of Abute Gilliman's fleet of Ultramarines to turn the tide of battle. Dawn would relent when realizing the Ultramarines would not arrive in time, giving permission to Sanguinius and his Blood Angels to lead a counterattack from the Helios Gate. Dawn would position one of his lieutenants, Fafnir Ran, to defend the Lion's Gate spaceport, and his most fearsome son, Sigismund, would engage the World Eater forces. Aiding in the defense of the spaceport, only to be bested by his former friend, Khan. Dawn would save Sigismund's life, swatting away the chosen warrior of the chaos being known as Khorn. Despite his stalwart defense, the Lion's Gate would fall. Threatening the integrity of the Colossi, Saturnine and Gorgon Gates, imperiling the Eternity War spaceport. The Loyalist forces had the numbers to only protect three of these key structures, with Dawn deciding to abandon the spaceport. Dawn would set a trap at the Saturnine Gate, and at the height of the skirmish, clash blades with his brother Primarch, Fulgrim. Dawn would best his brother in combat, but the wounds he dealt would be instantly healed by Fulgrim's chaos-born powers. Fulgrim would tire of the battle and retreat, sending his elite honor guard led by Lord Commander Eidolon to kill Rogel Dawn. With Sigismund's aid, they would survive the onslaught, and for the next three months of the siege, Dawn would not sleep or rest for a moment. Even for a Primarch, his superhuman body strained to exhaustion. 
Jagat Icon would insist that he should lead a charge to retake the Lionsgate spaceport, which Dawn would allow. The Khan would not return from the spaceport, Dawn believing him to be lost. In a last-ditch effort to end the war, Dawn, Sanguinius, and the Emperor of Mankind would assault Horus Lupercal's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. Dawn would be separated from the Emperor and Sanguinius during the assault. Later, he would find his brother's corpse and his father fatally wounded. Receiving his final instructions from the Emperor, Dawn would carry the Angel and his Emperor back to Terra. Interring the Emperor unto the Golden Throne, Dawn would feel the weight of guilt bear down on him. Failure now scarred him, and the Primarch would inflict suffering upon himself with a device known as the Pain Glove. The pain revealed to him visions that his Legion would need redeeming as penance for his failure to protect his Imperium. Seeing an opportunity, Dawn would assault the Iron Cage, a gigantic fortification built by Perturabo and his Iron Warriors to mock the fighting capability of the Imperial Fists. Dawn would rise to the challenge and spend weeks attempting to conquer the Labyrinthine Fortress. With the end of the battle near, it is uncertain as to which Legion would survive. Regardless, Rebute Gilliman would intervene, causing the Iron Warriors to retreat into the Eye of Terror. The Imperial Fists had suffered catastrophic losses during the battle, but nonetheless redeemed themselves in their duty to spill the blood of traitors to the Imperium. The remainder of the 7th Legion was split into successor chapters, including the Black Templars and Crimson Fists, and for the next 20 years, Dawn would continue to split his Legion into Codex Astartes' compliant chapters. The final record of Rogal Dawn would soon follow, with the Primarch engaging in battle with a Chaos Fleet Despoiler-class battleship known as the Sword of Sacrilege. Leading a desperate attack on the ship's bridge, the Primarch's fate would be unknown, with his sons recovering only a severed hand from the aftermath of the battle. Keeping the severed skeletal fist in stasis within the shrine aboard the Phalanx, with every chapter master of the Imperial Fists etching their names into the bones of the relic, a reminder of the Legion's duty to sacrifice for his Imperium. Discipline, duty, unyielding will, these are the measures by which every warrior is judged. Unarmed, a warrior with these qualities will still find victory, no matter how long or arduous the path. When girded with the sacred armaments of the Adeptus Astartes, such a warrior becomes truly indomitable. It has been said by the tacticians throughout the ages of mankind that no plan survives contact with the enemy. I do not waste my time countering the plans of my foes, brother. I never care for what they intend to do, for they will never be allowed to do it. Stir within their hearts the gift of truest terror, and all their plans are ruined in the desperate struggle merely to survive. The Sons of the Emperor would all shoulder a burden during the years of their infancy. Raised on feral, feudal, and even deaf worlds, each Primarch would be molded by the environment to which he would grow. Yet it cannot be denied the lot of some Primarchs would be starkly worse than others for not all the Emperor's offspring would be fostered by kind or benevolent fathers. For today, we shall elucidate the creature born of crime, murder, and spite. The Night Haunter of Nostramo, Conrad Kurz. Of all the Primarchs of his Imperium, the child of the Eighth Legion would be raised on the most inhospitable and wretched of worlds. The world of Nostramo would be coated in endless night, its lullabies of the screaming of the murdered the only solace for the inhabitants of the world. Save in the knowledge that another had died in their place that night, the Nostramans would live in an existence steeped in violence, depravity, and lawlessness. The Primarch of the Eighth Legion would descend upon the planet, his gestation pod crashing through its polluted hide of the planet's largest city. Nostramo Quintus. Burrowing through the urban architecture 
the gestation pod dived into the planet's crust and halted near the liquid molten core of Nostramo. Born into a world of darkness, the infant Primarch would claw his way to the surface through the scar carved through the adamantium and mineral-rich earth. Reaching the surface, the child would be confronted by a crazed inhabitant of the planet. Seeking to consume the child for his ripe, fresh meat, the first act of the child would be to defend himself from the murderous intent of his first contact with humanity. Slaying the would-be cannibal, the child would swiftly come to realize the twisted morality of his planet. Nostramo was a world drenched in despair, with no authority or power capable of culling the malevolent and desperate criminals of the planet. Poverty would be rife within the planet's society, with its main productivity derived from the world's mining industry, allowing the tormented populace to eke out a humble existence. The minority of the society would grow bloated with wealth and exploit the lawless underhives and their overpopulated peoples. With no soul on the planet, willing nor capable of adopting the young Primarch, the child would survive alone. His wits and instincts allowing the Primarch to survive of the vermin and carrion of the planet within the darkness. Plagued by visions of a future he did not comprehend, the Primarch would begin to forge an identity befitting his dour and nihilistic existence, the Night Haunter. The feral scavenger of Nostramo would begin to form a reputation among the populace. Sightings of an uncanny presence atop the roofs and slums of Nostramo Quintus would abound, with tales of a monster preying on the most dangerous of society. The screams of the Night Haunter's victims are balm to his anxieties, and dreams of countless dead upon unknown worlds shaping the Primarch's personality. Isolation and nightmares would be his only allies within the shadows of the abandoned derelicts to which the Night Haunter would rest. Yet with time, the Primarch of the Eighth would grow in both stature and infamy, until the entire planet knew of his deeds. Disgusted at the criminality of his homeworld, the Night Haunter would hunt the delinquents and felons of the hives. Consuming the brain matter of his victims, the Night Haunter would digest the populace's language, memories and sins due to his omophagia organ, and the Primarch would experience firsthand the depravity and weakness of his people. Sickened at the deeds of his homeworld's people, the Night Haunter would enact his own dark crusade to purge all crime from the planet. Merciless and savage in his dealings, the Night Haunter would purge the world of swathes of the populace's most revered and notorious criminals. The tales of the avenging spectre of the planet would be hushed by the civilians within the hives, and it would not be long until the gangs of Nostromo would band together to hunt the creature down. Slaying any who would attempt to end his crusade, the Night Haunter would leave a sole survivor of each failed battle. Severing their hands and gouging their eyes, the survivors of his wrath would return to their masters bearing a simple message, I am coming for you. Instilling terror within Nostramo, the Night Haunter would slowly erode and silence the corruption of the ruling elite. Leaving their hanged bodies atop the hive's highest windows, often maimed and flayed in horrific displays, within a year of his reprisal, crime would cease. Confronting the rulers of the planet, the Night Haunter would make a simple demand. Obey the law of the Night Haunter, or be judged. Cowed by fear, the Nostramans would relent and allow for the ascension of the so-called Dark King to rule their world. The first monarch of Nostramo would diligently work to restructure his fiefdom. Consuming the planet's historical archival knowledge with ravenous hunger and murdering the last remaining criminal elements within the hives, it would not be long until the Night Haunter would dominate the populace completely. Ruling with temperance, Unheard of by Nostraman standards, the civilians would share their wealth equally among themselves. For should they own too much, they would fear reprisal from their dark king. Within months, the planet's fortunes would abound, the fear instilled within them progressively allowing for years of prosperity and industrious toil. Broadcasting the screams of his final victims across every home of the world as a reminder that none would escape his justice, the dark king had achieved his goal of total obedience. For decades, the Night Haunter 
would have no need to hunt prey, for none would dare to defy the will of the Dark King. Yet with the arrival of the Emperor of Mankind to the planet, Nostromo's future would be sealed by its own prophecies that the Emperor would cause their downfall. Foreseeing his father's eventual reunion, the Night Haunter would prepare. Upon the Emperor's arrival, the inhabitants of Nostromo would be unable to look in the direction of the being of gleaming light. The so-called Delegation of Light would see the populace weep at the arrival of the father of their benevolent dictator and blind any who looked directly upon his visage. Met by the Primarchs Rogul Dawn, Lorgar Aurelian, Ferris Manus, and Fulgrim, the Night Haunter would envision dark portents of each of their futures. Meeting the Emperor of Mankind, the Night Haunter would be overwhelmed by a vision so terrible he would sink to his knees and attempt to claw his own eyes from their sockets. Ending his torment with a touch of his hand, the Emperor would utter, Be at peace, Conrad Kurz. I have arrived, and I intend to take you home. Submitting to the Emperor of Mankind, the Night Haunter would refuse to adopt his supposed name given by his father. Brought to Holy Terror to study the doctrines of the Legiones Astartes under the tutelage of the Phoenician, Fulgrim, Conrad Kurz would with time be installed as the leader of his legion. Naming them the Night Lords, the Eighth Legion would quickly become synonymous with brutal and decisive victories. A humorless yet efficient army, the Night Lords would employ torture, terror tactics, and merciless persecution of any dissenting opposition. Yet with the absence of the Night Haunter, his homeworld of Nostromo would descend once more into rampant criminality with his absence. Claiming the Night Lords to be nothing more than murderers, gifted with the strength of godlike beings, the Nabal of Nostromo would rebel. Conrad Kurz would regard his sons in a similar manner, seeing them as unworthy yet necessary tools to bring compliance to the lawlessness of the galaxy. Believing peace could only be achieved through methods of instilling terror within non-compliant worlds, the Night Haunter would slay his own legionaries should they delight in the act of mutilation and slaughter for their own personal gratification. Instilling within his legion that such methods were merely tools to achieve peace, Kurz would be disgusted at his son's flagrant degeneracy. Bringing worlds into compliance through many atrocities, though his brother Primarchs would decry his methods, Kurz would maintain that his actions, though harsh, would allow for the least amount of bloodletting. Hypocritical in his own enjoyment of inflicting pain unto his victims, the Night Lords would only disguise their enjoyment of their craft from their gene father. Their sinister nature left unaddressed by their Primarch due to the constant harassment of his own visions of the future. The Nostraman recruits to the Night Lords would further exacerbate their legion's downfall as each initiate would encompass their homeworld's descent back into delinquency. The rot had been set within the Eighth Legion, and with the preponderance of the Legion now born of Nostromo and its culture, the downfall of the Night Haunter would be inevitable. Tormented by visions of betrayal and fratricide, the Night Haunter would delve further into the clutches of madness. Confiding in his mentor, Fulgrim, the Primarch of the Third Legion would relay the Night Haunter's mad ravings to the Primarch of the Imperial Fists, Rogal Dawn. Incensed at the slight made against his brethren and the Emperor, Dawn would confront Conrad Kurz. Found unconscious with deep gouges left in his torso, the Primarch of the Seventh Legion would lay at the side of Conrad Kurz. Weeping and racked with guilt, Kurz would be imprisoned for his assault of his brother. As the Primarchs discussed the means of how to deal with their brother, the Night Haunter would escape his bonds and slay the Imperial Fist Huskars stationed to guard his chambers. Escaping with his legion, the Night Haunter would travel to his homeworld to seek solace. Yet upon arrival to Nostromo, Conrad Kurz's remaining sanity would break. During 984.M30, the Night Haunter would discover the fate of Nostromo. Once more corrupted by ceaseless crime, the vengeance of the Primarch of the Eighth Legion would be unequivocally merciless. Firing laser bombardments into the rend in the planet's surface, 
originally made by the Primarch Cestation Pod, Nostromo's Molten Core would detonate. With Imperial Pursuit Craft sent in the wake of Rogaldorn's injuries, witnessing Nostromo's destruction, the depravity of the Night Haunter would soon be relayed to the Emperor. Recalled to Holy Terror, Conrad Kurz would answer for his crimes. Explaining to the Emperor that his actions were justified, Kurz would accuse the Imperium of hypocrisy in their own dealings of bringing worlds into compliance and utilizing exterminatus to any who would deny the Imperial truth. His excuses would not satisfy the judgment of the Imperium, and as a result, the Imperium would deny the Eighth Legion supplies to their dominions and banish them from the forefront of the Great Crusade. Yet despite his punishment, Kurz would seek vindication for his actions, and soon an opportunity for revenge would present itself. The Horus Heresy, perpetrated by the War Master of the Imperium, Horus Lupercal, would coincide with the prophesied visions of the Night Haunter. Believing his visions to be unchangeable, the Primarch of the Eighth Legion would surrender all responsibility for his actions and side with the traitor war effort. Choosing to enact his vengeance against the Emperor, Conrad Kurz would lead his men to the Battle of Istvan V. Aiding the traitorous betrayal of the Loyalist forces of the Iron Hands, Salamanders and Raven Guard, the Night Lords would revel in their slaughter of the Imperium's noble sons. As the Night Lords butchered the Loyalist Astartes, Lorgar Aurelian, Primarch of the Wordbearers, would battle the Raven Lord of the 19th Legion. Besting the bearer of the word in combat, the Eurizen's life would be spared by Conrad Kurz, who would duel his rival in darkness, Corvus Korax, in Lorgar's place. Their claws struck, and despite Korax's speed, the Night Haunter would grab his brother by the wrist. Escaping Kurz's grasp with the use of his jump packs, the Primarch of the Raven Guard would not risk dueling the Dark King of Nostromo. With the death of the Gorgon and flight of the Raven Lord, Kurz would find a new subject for his depraved tortures and mutilations. The Primarch of the 18th Legion, Vulcan. Aboard his flagship, Nightfall, Kurz would attempt to break the will of the Primarch of the Salamanders. Finding the Primarch of the 18th to bear the gift of a perpetual, Vulcan's body, no matter how many times it would perish, would rebuild itself and bring new life. Seeing an opportunity to torment his noble brother forevermore, the Night Haunter would delight in slaying his defenseless brother time and again. For months, the Night Haunter would devise the means for the mutilation and execution of his brother. Sating his sadism with increasingly extravagant displays of torture until growing weary of his relentless returns. Tearing him limb from limb, riddling his body with bolter shells, and even disintegrating him within the ship's engine shafts, no matter the cause of death, Vulcan would be resurrected. Unable to break the will of the Lord of Drakes, his attempts to break Vulcan with a variety of methods would always fail. Devising a final trial to end the perpetual Primarch's resolve, Kurz would beseech the Primarch of the Iron Warriors, Perturabo, to construct a labyrinth to destroy Vulcan's resolve. Teasing at the center of the labyrinth, Vulcan's personal warhammer, Dawnbringer, Kurz would not expect the Primarch of the Salamanders to reach his prize. Yet with tireless, unrelenting drive, Vulcan would reclaim Dawnbringer. The Warhammer had been fitted with a secret teleporter within its construction, and after attempting to prevent Vulcan's escape, Kurz would be struck by Dawnbringer before Vulcan would activate its teleporter and escape to the Ultramar system. In the wake of the Night Haunter's ever-increasing distractions during the Traitor War effort, War Master Horus Lupercal would dispatch the Night Lords at the forefront of their push to Holy Terror, sending a message across the stars that any whom did not kneel would be gifted untold miseries, the Night Lords would enact the War Master's remorseless will. Harbingers of the traitor's bloodlust and cruelty, the Night Lords would for months be unopposed in their campaign of defilement. Yet within the Framas sector, the Night Lords would be halted by the First Legion, the Dark Angels. For three Terran standard years, 
the 1st and 8th legions would wage a bitter war. Nobility and discipline would face opprobrium and barbarity. Leading his men during the Framas Crusade, Conrad Kurz would delay the Dark Angels from interfering with the plots of the War Master. Under the command of their Primarch, Lionel Johnson, the First Legion would prove to be more than a match for the Night Lord's underhanded tactics and cunning. Attempting to sway the Lion to join the War Master's cause, Kurz would parley with the Lord of the First. On the planet of Sagwalza, the Primarchs would face each other. The Lion would reject the Night Haunter's offer and attempt to slay Kurz. The Lion Sword would clash against Kurz's Lightning Claws, Mercy and Forgiveness. Two of the greatest duelists of the Primarchs would descend into brawling as they disarmed and wounded one another. Yet eventually, Kurz would gain the upper hand. Denied the killing blow against the Lion, the Dark Angel Seneschal, Corswain, would bury his sword in the back of the Night Haunter. Both legions would reinforce the Primarch's positions and drag their wounded liege lords from the skirmish. Yet when the legions would clash again, the Dark Angels would prove to be the greater strategists. Ambushing the Night Lord's fleet, the Primarchs would once again duel. Slaying the Night Lord's elite Atramenta and destroying the Eighth Legion's fleet, the Dark Angels would prove to be an indomitable foe. Yet the Night Haunter would not be so easily slain and escape the Lion within his own flagship. For months, Conrad Kurz would skulk the dark corners of the Dark Angel's flagship, Invincible Reason. Cut off from the wider Imperium with the birth of the Ruin Storm, the First Legion would relocate their might to the burgeoning Imperium Secundus of Ultramar. The home system of the Ultramarine's Primarch, Rabute Gilliman, Macrag would be the seat of power for the contingent new Imperium should the Emperor be slain by the War Master. Yet upon the First Legion's arrival to Macrag, Kurz would escape from the bowels of the Invincible Reason. Wreaking havoc among the populace of the Ultramarines' homeworld, the combined might of the Primarchs of the First, Thirteenth, and newly arrived Ninth Legions would hunt the Night Haunter. Primarch Rabute Gilliman of the Ultramarines would elect the Primarch of the Blood Angels, Sanguinius, as the Imperator Regis of their new contingent empire, with Lionel Johnson appointed as Lord Protector of the Imperium Secundus it would be his duty to enforce the campaign to apprehend the Night Haunter. Despite the Dark Angel's attempts to thwart the rampage of Conrad Kurz, the Night Haunter would come close to crippling the Loyalist's research of the Sofa device, ministered by the Imperial Fist Captain, Alexis Pollux. Confronted by Rabute Gilliman and the Lion within the Fortress of Hera, Kurz would detonate explosives concealed within the temple. Before dealing the killing blow, the Loyalist Primarchs would be rescued by the ministrations of the Loyalist Warsmith, Barabas Antioch, and Alexis Pollux by once more utilizing the Sofa device. Unaware of their survival, Kurz would turn his attentions to add one final wound to the Ultramarine's Primarch. Within the capital city of Macrag, the Night Haunter would attempt to slay Rabute Gilliman's adoptive mother, Tarasha Uten. Hindered by the Space Wolves, appointed to monitor the Ultramarine's Primarch, Kurz would nonetheless seemingly be unopposed in slaying the Mother of the Lord of Ultramar. Yet against the odds, the reborn Primarch of the Salamanders, Vulcan, would face Kurz. In spite of the intervention of the perpetual John Grammaticus and Kurz's banishment into the Warp, the Night Haunter would not be denied so easily. Infiltrating the throne room of Macrag, the Night Haunter would confront his vision-attuned brother, Sanguinius. Seeking answers for why the Great Angel still remained loyal, despite the visions that he had endured, Kurz would never understand the loyalty he had shown the Emperor. Offering Sanguinius the chance to end his misery, the Great Angel would abstain from slaying his brother, and Kurz would escape once more into the dark corners of Macrag. With the return of Lionel Johnson and Rabute Gilliman, Kurz would finally be brought to justice. Captured and brought before trial to judge him for his crimes, the proceedings would be conducted by the Emperor of Imperium Secundus, Sanguinius. Admitting to his actions, Kurz would not accept any guilt for his misdeeds. Turning the Lion and Gilliman against one another 
due to the methods the Lord of the First had used to root out the Night Haunter, the Lords of Imperium Secundus would fracture. Dissolving their new Imperium, Gilliman and Sanguinius would in private decide to execute the Night Haunter, yet with the intervention of Lionel Johnson, stay their hand. Repeating Kurz's claim to observe his own death at the hands of an agent of the Emperor, the Lion would surmise that the Emperor still ruled Holy Terror. Hope burgeoned in the hearts of the Primarchs, and with Sanguinius's own visions of his death at the hands of the War Master, the Loyalists with Kurz in their custody would venture to breach the Ruin Storm. Chaining the Night Haunter within the bowels of the Invincible Reason, the Lion would endure the taunts of his degenerate brother. Upon the world of Darwin, the Primarchs would drag Kurz to the Temple, wherein the War Master had been first corrupted. With the eruption of demons from a portal within the Temple, Kurz would once more be shackled within the Dark Angel's flagship as the Loyalists countered the demonic incursion. Finding a means to breach the storm, the Dark Angels and Ultramarines would buy time for Sanguinius and his Blood Angels to venture to Holy Terror. Taking custody of the Night Haunter, Sanguinius would bring to him the Emperor's Judgment. Yet once aboard the Red Tear, Kurz would be confined within a stasis coffin and jettisoned into space by the Great Angel. Sanguinius would tell the Night Haunter that alike to himself, he must follow his own envisioned path. Adrift for many years, Kurz would survive into the following millennia. The Horus Heresy would end with the Emperor slaying the War Master and the traitors scattering across the stars. Discovering the salvage ship, Sheldron, the stasis pod would unknowingly release the Night Haunter among their crew. Assuming control of the vessel, Kurz would journey for four years once more to Sagwalza and reunite with his disparate gene sons. Reuniting his legion, Kurz would enshrine the Night Lord's base of operations upon the Carrion world. Accepting his prophesied fate, the Night Haunter would guide his legion on a path of self-sufficiency without his presence and await his killer. The Calidus Assassin, Hem Shen, would discover the Dark King upon his Carrion throne. Unguarded and with no obstacles preventing the Assassin's path, the God Slayer would act. Slicing the Night Haunter's head from his body, the torment of Conrad Kurz had finally ended. Yet whispers across the galaxy persist that the Spectre of Death shall one day return against all odds and records of his demise. For the shadow of the Night Haunter still stalks the galaxy, with the Night Lord's continued defilement of the Imperium in his name. By reason, by truth, I have learned how your hearts and minds function. With that law, I brought peace to this culture. At the cost of freedom, the Night Haunter drew in a slow breath through his knife-slit smile. Peace reigns as I reign. I wouldn't expect your little minds to understand. You are a little man with little dreams. You've ushered in the peace of the graveyard. The noble dared to take a step closer. Peace at the cost of surrendering all choice, all freedom. The city lives in terror, forced to live by the standards you place upon our shoulders. Yes, the Night Haunter replied. Yes. But every sin is punished. The Night Haunter listened to their hearts beating blood through their bodies. But punishment by death, no matter the crime, no matter the scale of the sin, the people of the city live in silence, lest a single word earn them death for speaking out against you. Yes. The Night Haunter closed his dark eyes, as if listening to that very silence drifting across the city. Listen. Listen to the sound of raw silence. Is it not serene? It is not the descent toward the shadow nor the rise toward the light that makes us superior. It is the endless struggle between the two that greatness of character lies. We are tested, and we do not break. We will never fall. The loyalist Primarchs of his Imperium are beloved by all, paragons of the potential of humanity. Each Primarch embodies a fragment of the Emperor's might. Though of all the Primarchs a select few are regarded even by their brothers with respect, or even 
adoration. Yet there is one Primarch who was beloved by all his brothers, with only a trifle of exceptions. The noble son of the Emperor who most embodied not only his power, but his very being. Sanguinius, Primarch of the Ninth Legion of the Adeptus Astartes. During the scattering of the Primarchs, Sanguinius would land on the radiation-soaked moon of Baal Secundus. Discovered by the tribal people inhabiting the moon's surface, they would adopt the infant Primarch into the people of the pure blood. Within three weeks of his arrival, he had grown to the size of a large child capable of walking and learning speech. By the year's end, he towered over the people of the blood. Uniquely amongst the Primarchs, Sanguinius bore two angelic wings that sprouted from his back, the origin of which is uncertain. Some claim them to be a gift bestowed by the Emperor, whilst the more cynical people of his Imperium would claim them to be the result of a mutation born from the radiation endured by his time on Bull Secundus. Though of all his abilities, it would become apparent that the Primarch had the gift to divine the future. Using his visions, immense psychic power and martial prowess, Sanguinius would lead the people of the blood to defeat vast hordes of mutants which threatened their lives. With their defeat, the people of the blood would worship Sanguinius as a god, which would endure until the arrival of the Emperor. Disguising himself, the Emperor would witness Sanguinius give an impassioned speech to his people, yet with Sanguinius' ability to divine the future, he would instantly recognize the Emperor. The great angel would fall to his knees and pledge his allegiance to his father. Inducting the greatest warriors of the people of the blood, the Emperor would integrate them into the pre-existing Ninth Legion of Adeptus Astartes, soon to be monikered the Blood Angels. Sanguinius would become highly regarded by all the legions of the Adeptus Astartes, even gaining the greatest respect from his brother Primarch, Horus, whom would confide in the angel for advice. More than any Primarchs, Sanguinius and Horus would form a bond of trust and adoration. The great angel would even convince Horus to change the name of his legion from Lunar Wolves to the Sons of Horus after being given his new title of War Master. With Horus even concealing his knowledge of the flaw within the Blood Angel's gene seed from the Emperor, making these events all the more tragic considering the way in which the future would unfold. Horus would fall to the forces of chaos and begin his campaign with the keen awareness that Sanguinius was arguably his most deadly foe. Before his treachery had been revealed to the Imperium, Horus would command Sanguinius to fight the Xenos Nephilim species on the planet of Cygnus Prime. The Blood Angels would be ambushed by hordes of demons within the Cygnus system and become stranded. During a fierce battle against the greater demon of Khorn, Kabanda, both of Sanguinius's legs would be broken. The Great Angel would be comatose due to a psychic backlash caused by the activation of the Rage Fire, a device constructed by Fabius Bile of the Emperor's Children and employed by Erebus of the Word Bearers. The device would cause the Gene Seed Curse of the Blood Angels, the Black Rage, to erupt. With their Primarch unconscious, the Blood Angels would tear each other limb from limb. With the intervention of the Ninth Legion's librarians, Sanguinius would be restored. Battling the Greater Demon in a second duel, Sanguinius would slay Kabanda and banish it into the Warp. With the Demon's leader banished, Sanguinius led his forces into the Chaos Fortress on Cygnus, known as the Cathedral of the Mark. Therein, Kyrus the Perverse, Keeper of Secrets and Demon of Slanesh, would offer to cure the Blood Angels of their curse, should Sanguinius sacrifice himself unto the rage fire. Sanguinius decided to accept the bargain, but before his pact would be become binding, Blood Angel Apothecary Meros would sacrifice himself before his Primarch could act, transforming him into the Red Angel. Enraged, Sanguinius would slay Kyrus and swear vengeance upon Horus for the loss of his noble son. Reeling from the catastrophic events of Cygnus, Sanguinius would set course for Terra. His journey altered by a ruin storm, orchestrated by Erebus, would make communication and travel throughout the Imperium near impossible. His legion would arrive on the Ultramarine's homeworld of Macrag and meet with Primarch Rebute Gilliman. Fearing holy terror to be lost, 
Reluctantly, Sanguinius would accept the title of the new Emperor Regent of the newly founded Imperium Secundus, with the support of Lionel Johnson and Gilliman. Plagued by prophetic visions of his death at the hands of Horus, the Great Angel would be confronted by the stowaway Primarch Conrad Kurz. Confirming his own visions of the Angel's death, Kurz would inquire as to why Sanguinius still remained loyal to the Emperor, with the knowledge that it would lead to his demise. Sanguinius urged his brother that it was not too late for him to return to the Emperor's grace. Kurz would state that chaos was all there would be, not just for himself, but every man, woman and child in the coming future. Setting off an explosive to mask his escape, he would eventually be recaptured by the Lion. Sanguinius would preside over Kurz's trial and would eventually determine to end his life. The Lion would demand to instead become his jailer. Kurz believed his death would come at the hands of an assassin sent by the Emperor, which the Lion deduced meant that their father still lived. The Primarchs would pull their resources and attempt to breach the Ruin Storm. Sanguinius would suffer the beginning stages of the Black Rage, fueled by the visions of his own death. A preternatural vision would lead Sanguinius to travel to the planet of Davin, the world in which Horus began his path of corruption to the forces of chaos. The Primarchs would find evidence of a mass drop pod assault on the planet's surface. Sanguinius, Gilliman, the Lion and their prisoner Conrad Kurz would discover a ruin, the Temple of the Serpent's Lodge. Inside, they would find the altar wherein the fell ritual had been conducted by Erebus on the War Master. Their presence would trigger warp storms to bellow forth and create a portal, dragging Sanguinius away from the temple. He would see himself on the surface of terror in a vast beautiful garden within the Imperial Palace, with his brother Lorgar's corpse at his feet he would observe the remaining traitor Primarchs bound in chains. His father, the Emperor, congratulating him on his victory and bestowing the title of the Emperor's Regent to his son. He would lead a campaign to purge the galaxy of the remaining traitors to his Imperium and eventually become the ruler of the galaxy. Sanguinius would see through the deception of the vision and cut through the visage of the Emperor, revealing it to be the demon known as Medale. Sanguinius and Medale would duel, Medale unleashing lesser demon hordes through the portal, preventing the Lion and Gilliman from breaking through to aid their brother. Overpowering the Angel, Medale would bargain with Sanguinius. Deeming Horus to be an unworthy vessel of chaos, he would offer to aid Sanguinius in killing his brother and taking the mantle of Warmaster for himself. Added to the bargain, Medale would cure the Blood Angels of their curse. Refusing, the Great Angel would impale the Greater Demon with his weapons, the Blade in Carmine and Spear of Telesto. With the Demon's banishment, the Temple collapsed, and Davin would crumble. In its place, a breach in the Warp Storm would appear, leading directly to Holy Terror. The Alpha Legion would blockade the breach, with Gilliman and the Lion distracting the 20th Legion, allowing the Great Angel to pass through. Taking Kurz as his prisoner, Sanguinius ventured through the breach. Once through, Sanguinius revealed that he would release Conrad Kurz, sealing him within a stasis coffin and jettisoning the Primarch into space. Knowing it might be millennia until his brother would be found, Sanguinius would tell him that fate would catch up with him eventually. Perhaps the Night Haunter's vision of the death at the hands of the Assassin may well come true. Arriving on Terra, Sanguinius would meet with Rogal Dawn, Jagatai Khan, and Malkador the Sigilite. The assembled defenders of Holy Terra would strategize on how to combat the oncoming forces of Chaos. The Great Angel's arrival would also be used as a symbol for the Imperium to rally behind. His deific visage boosting the morale of the soon-to-be-tested defenders of the throne. His visions would show him the events of the battles from the perspective of his traitorous brother Primarchs. As the months of war waged on, Sanguinius believed that the defences would soon falter and that he must confront his destiny in battling Horus directly. Leading the final defence of the Imperial Palace, Sanguinius would battle the reborn greater demon of Kabanda, banishing it once more. Injured from this battle and weary from his vigil, Sanguinius would then board the vengeful spirit at the side of his father and Rogal Dawn. Separated from the Emperor, 
Sanguinius would face Horus Lupercal alone. Attempting to redeem his brother, the angel would remind Horus of their past friendship, but Horus would refuse to listen. The two would battle, with Sanguinius landing only a glancing strike on Horus, creating a dent within his mass of ceramide armor. This battle would enmesh itself within the Imperium's history as its darkest hour. The War Master would wound Sanguinius with the blades of the Talon of Horus and end his life with a psychic barrage, ensuring the Angel's death would be the most painful and malicious ending that his benefactors of chaos could administer. With the intervention of the Emperor, Horus and his rebellion would be destroyed. The Great Angel's body would be taken back to Holy Terror by Rogel Dawn, and with the heresy over, Sanguinius would be laid to rest within a resplendent golden sarcophagus, later interred on his homeworld of Baal. And so it was that they fought, the Angel and the Beast. Titanic must have been that struggle between those two gods amongst men. Long must they have rained blows upon one another until it seemed that the life of the universe itself hung in the balance. Yet, Sanguinius was bested. Even as the Blade of Death waited to strike him, Sanguinius would not turn from the path of light. Thus, it was that Sanguinius passed from this world. He who was everything a man should be was taken from us by the darkness. A thousand times a thousand years of lamenting will never atone for our loss. When the armor of your faith is buckled and torn, see in your mind that magnificent hero. Think upon his deeds and be humble, for his like will never walk the galaxy again. Rest. We were not made to rest. We go on, unflinching, unstoppable, unending in our strength. The Emperor did not make us for such mortal concerns as hearth and home, vanity or contemplation. We are his engines of war, his hammers, beating out the fabric of existence into a vessel fit for mankind to inhabit. Many of the Primarchs of the Imperium are adored for their benevolence, but not all exhibit the traits of grace or kindness. Though the traitor Primarchs particularly are remembered for their bloodlust and cold demeanor, there is one true son of the Emperor whose commitment to the Imperium's ideals were ironclad. A Primarch whom should he achieve his goals and duties without fault would care not how the subjects of the Imperium would see him. A taskmaster and courageous leader, this Primarch led his legion as a harsh but fair commander. Primarch of the 10th Legion, Ferris Manus. As the sons of the Emperor were scattered throughout the stars, Ferris Manus's pod would land on the feral world of Medusa, impacting on the highest mountain, Karashi, the ice pinnacle. The capsule shattered the mountaintop, burying itself deep into the ice. Medusa's surface collapsing, reforming and shifting with the arrival of the Primarch. Growing in solitude, Ferris would inspect the markings on his pod embossed with an X. Realizing it not to be native of the world, Manus would further examine runes and electroconductive stalagmites within the chamber in which he lived, his interference awakening a colossal biomechanical worm that lay dormant beneath the chamber, and after a futile effort to fight it, Ferris would watch the creature escape and destroy everything within its path. The young boy would swear that one day, it would die by his hands. The boy would then observe the world outside, seeing humans in the distance but remaining hidden from their gaze. As years passed, the clans of Medusa would discuss sightings of a strange boy, being dubbed names by the many sects and groupings of inhabitants such as the Cataclysm, the Hunter, the Finality, and the Son of Man. More years passed until the Primarch was fully grown. Unscathed from living isolated within the mountain's core, Manus would not join with the clans of Medusa, instead seeking challenges on the planet to test his might and resilience. Slaying many ferocious beasts would prove his raw strength, culminating with his battle against the great silver worm, Asirnov, the metallic beast which he had vowed to destroy. 
Impervious to conventional weapons, Verus would drown it in a river of magma, its flesh melting and fusing with the Primarch's arms. Imbuing the Primarch with his legendary Necrodermis-coated arms, with which his future legion would make their namesake. Returning to the clans and tribes, Manus would divulge his knowledge of technology, advancing their stunted civilization and allowing Medusa to prosper under the rule of his iron grip. Though the clans would fight amongst themselves, Ferris would never intervene, seeing the competition wrought by their infighting to be healthy for their continued improvement. With the arrival of the Emperor, Manus would test his father through battle, leveling entire mountains as they fought. Manus would relish the test of his strength and willingly bend the knee to a warrior worthy of matching his power. Assuming command of the 10th Legion, the Iron Hands would stand obediently at their father's side, for soon they would be needed to fight the Emperor's Great Crusade. Fulgrim would be one of the first Primarchs to meet Ferris Manus. Initially, Manus would show disdain for his brother seeing him as a foppish artist wasting time on culture whilst the reclamation of the galaxy was at stake. Fulgrim would jokingly refer to Ferris as the Gorgon, a mythical Terran creature renowned for its ugliness and ability to turn men into stone. The moniker would resound throughout the Imperium as fitting for the Primarch of the Iron Hands, the Legion bringing untold thousands of planets into compliance due to their Primarch's remorseless and relentless drive to fulfill the will of his Emperor. Purging every weak link in his chain of command or non compliant world in pursuit of strengthening the Imperium. Fighting alongside the Emperor's children on many occasions, such as the compliance of the human Disparek civilization, the two legions would forge tremendous bonds of trust and friendship, despite their unlikely contrast as warriors. Fulgrim had even boasted that he would create the perfect weapon to wield in the coming Great Crusade. As a master craftsman, the Gorgon would not let such a boast go unwarranted, and decided that they should compete to craft the finest weapons. Manus forged a sword known as Fireblade, its edge able to ignite are like to that of the Emperor's own weapon of choice, with Fulgrim forging the mighty Warhammer Forgebreaker, a weapon capable of leveling entire mountains. The two would see their brother's craftsmanship as superior and concede defeat, and in an act of respect and solidarity, exchange their weapons their bond as brothers, now complete. However, during the Horus Heresy, their kinship would be tested and tragically torn asunder. Fulgrim would be lured by the temptations of chaos and before the beginning stages of the Heresy would try to persuade Ferris Manus to join his cause. Enraged at even the suggestion of such an act, Ferris attacked Fulgrim, a short duel wherein Ferris would break Fireblade mirroring the breaking of the bond of their brotherhood. Due to a hesitation to kill his brother for his treachery, Fulgrim would take the opportunity to strike Ferris unconscious and claim his own creation, Forgebreaker. The Gorgon's elite honor guard of the Morlocks would be ambushed and killed during the deception, injuring their captain Gabriel Santor, letting him watch the betrayal unfold. Gaining consciousness, Ferris Manus would resolve to enact his revenge on his traitorous brother. Departing with all haste, the Gorgon would lead a charge of Loyalist legions to destroy the traitor forces before their armies could engage the wider Imperium. With the aid of the Salamanders, Raven Guard, Night Lords, Iron Warriors, Word Bearers, and Alpha Legion at his command, they would quash the traitor legions of the World Eaters, Death Guard, Sons of Horus, and Emperor's Children with overwhelming force of numbers. The battle would take place on Istvan V, with the Loyalist initial waves of Vulcan, Corvus Corax, Ferris Manus and their respective legions engaging the traitors, with victory assured should their Loyalist inbound legions be at their side. Their trust in their brothers would be misplaced. As the second wave descended upon Istvan V, they would show their true colors. With the strength of eight traitor legions, they would crush the Loyalists. Istvan V was no longer a battle, it was a massacre. In an act of desperate defiance, Ferris Manus would command his men to kill as many Emperor's children as they could. The Gorgon would face his brother Fulgrim again in battle, but this time only one Primarch would survive. Ferris wielded Fireblade, reforged by his hand for one purpose, to end Fulgrim's life. Fulgrim would fight with the Layerblade, 
a demon-infused sword which would aid Fulgrim's strike, cutting the head from the Gorgon's neck. With news of Ferris Manus's death, Rabute Gilliman of the Ultramarines would grieve at the loss of his most favoured brother, with even Horus Lupercal claiming the Gorgon's skull and rambling to its facade, confiding that he lamented Ferris's choice not to stand by his side during the Great War to end the Imperium. Though later in the Heresy, in a final act of defiance, Manus would be reborn during the Battle of the Webway by the Emperor himself, fighting alongside the fallen heroes of the Imperium as a blazing specter against the demonic hordes. The skull of Ferris Manus would be returned to the Iron Hands. To this day, it rests upon the altar of the Eye of Medusa, guarded by the chapter's stalwart Hellfather. They are not my hands. This fact is forgotten by my brothers. Inexplicably, it has always seemed to me. The hands are strong, to be sure, and have created great things for us all. But they are not mine, and that counts for something. They forget that the silver on my arms comes from a beast that I vanquished. It is the mark of a great evil that I ended, and yet it persists within me. I would struggle to remove it now. I will not remove the silver from my flesh because I have learned to depend on it. The fault is with my mind. I rely on the augmentation given to me by my metal gauntlets, so much so that the flesh beneath them is now little more than a distant memory. A day will come when I will strip it from me, lest I lose the power to master myself forever. Already my legion's warriors replace their shield hands with metal in my honor, and so they are too learning to doubt the natural strength of their bodies. They must be weaned of this practice before it becomes a mania for them. Hatred of what is natural, of what is human, is the first and greatest of the corruptions. So I record it here. When the time comes, I will strip my hands of their unnatural silver. I will instruct my legion to recant their distrust of the flesh. I will turn them away from the gifts of the machine and bid them to relearn the mysteries of the flesh, bone and blood. When my father's crusade is over, this shall be my sacred task. When the fighting is done, I shall cure my legion and myself. For if fighting is all there is, if we may never pause to reflect on what such devotion to strength is doing to us, then our compulsion will only grow. You kept that mule Corferon. Russ kept his kin friends. The lion kept Lufa. Humans, brothers and Foster fathers, saved and raised into legion ranks. But not me, not Angron, no. Did the Emperor teleport his gold-wrapped custodians down to help me and my army? No. Did he free the Warhounds and order them to battle, fight alongside me? No. Did he save my brothers and sisters the way he spared and honored the Lion's closest kin? The way he honored Corferon? No, no, and no. No mercy for Angron. Angron the Oathbreaker, Angron the Betrayer. The Primarchs of his Imperium would shoulder many burdens with their service. Created to lead humanity's greatest armies, to purge the galaxy of heresy and malevolent influence, each Primarch would wrestle control of their inner nature to best lead their legions as exemplars of the Emperor's vision. Yet many of the sons of the Master of Mankind would be afflicted with inner turmoil and prove to be unsalvageable. For today, we shall elucidate one such Primarch whose homeworld influence would forever damn him to a life of pain, fury, and bloodlust. The Lord of the Red Sands, Angron. With the scattering of the Primarchs across the stars, the Primarch of the Twelfth Legion would land upon the world of Nuceria within close proximity to the Ultima Segmentum. A civilized world ruled by aristocratic tyrants, the technologically advanced civilization would, though self-sufficient, bear a deeply troubling fascination with violence. The impoverished civilians under the ruling elite of the planet hungered to vent their frustrations by observing the misery and suffering of others. Organizing gladiatorial spectacles to distract the populace, the oligarchic nobles would cybernetically enhance their chosen pawns to enact brutal rampages within the gladiator pits. 
the young Primarch would be discovered by a slaver of the pits. Finding the injured boy surrounded by Xenos corpses high in the Deshelica Mountains. Scholars would theorize the assailants to be the Eldari, armed with the forewarning of the scourge that the young boy would bring to the galaxy. Their assassination failed, the corpses of the Xenos would aid in encouraging the slaver to sell his foundling for a high price to the rulers of Nuceria. Brought to the palace of Praxica, within the city of Deshea, the slaver would sell the young warrior to the house of Falkir. Thrust into battle, barely of the age of a toddler, the child Primarch would alongside 100 slaves battle an acid-spewing creature upon the gladiator pit Ziggurat. As acid filled the arena, the Primarch would by necessity kill any who took up space on the ever-dwindling platform. Surviving his first battle within the pit, the child would shed a tear for those he had slain to endure his barbaric trial. His promise as a gladiator would see the child ascend to fight within the largest arena of the land and be given the name Angronius Falkir, Child of the Mountain. Recovering from his wounds, Angron would rapidly grow in size due to his enhanced genetics and within months become the foremost acclaimed gladiator of Nuceria. The populace of Nuceria would come to cherish the champion of the arena. Dubbing the Primarch as the Lord of the Red Sands, after his deeds on the blood-soaked earth of gladiator pits, Angron whilst physically strong would also display a profound sense of honor and mercy. Sparing the lives of gladiators whom had proven their merit in battle, Angron would slay hundreds of warriors yet never succumb to his baser instincts. The unbeaten gladiator of Deshea would despite his circumstance enjoy the thrill of battle and adulation of his people. Yet in secret, Angron would plot to escape his bonds of slavery and on many occasions attempt and fail to escape his captors. Mentored by the veteran gladiator of the pits, Oenimus, the old warrior would act as a foster father to the young and impressionable Primarch. Side by side, Angron and Oenimus would slay scores of opponents within the pit. An especially acclaimed victory against a pair of Ogren berserkers implanted with the deadly contraption known as the Butcher's Nails. Their ample strength further amplified by the cortical implants, the opponents of the Lord of Red Sands would bound into the fray with feral rage and fury. Yet such a victory would sour the efforts of the so-called High Riders of the Aristocrats of Nuceria, and soon after, Angron would be pitted against his mentor in combat. Facing one another in a duel to the death, Angron would refuse to fight his father figure. The Primarch's insolence would see him restrained by the guards of the arena, and as punishment, the High Riders would implant the Butcher's Nails within Angron's skull. A relic from the Dark Age of Technology, historical records are unclear as to how the Nusarians came to own such dangerous implants, but what can be gleaned is that their actions would damn countless billions to death across the millennia. Imbued with increased adrenal function, strength, aggression, and overwhelming bloodlust, Angron's path to damnation would begin, blinding all sense of reason or morality within the Primarch's mind. The nails would dig deep until all that would end their inflicted suffering would be the release of blood and viscera. Rewarding violence with spasms of pleasure, Angron would become a living embodiment of rage. The High Riders would test their new feral beast's abilities by releasing Oenimus to face him in combat. Tearing him limb from limb, Angron's hunger for violence would not be sated in his frenzied, berserk state. Regaining clarity after the maiming of his foster father, Angron would quickly wallow in despair at his actions. Howling alike to a feral beast, Angron's wails of sorrow would not end for several days. Angron would swear that one day he shall escape the shackles of the High Riders and achieve vengeance for his manipulation and his father's death. For several years, Angron would train and organize the gladiators of the arena into a brotherhood of warriors. Dominating any challengers chosen to face them, the Deshean gladiators would respect their leader with utter devotion and aid in his plot to escape the arena. Upon the grandest spectacle of the Death Games, the gladiators would make their escape. Assembling the entirety of his men, Angron and his gladiators would enter the arena en masse to rapturous applause. 
Turning on the arena guards, the gladiators would butcher their wardens and escape the arena among the panicked stampede of the civilian onlookers. Armed with firearms, the remaining arena guards would put down a swathe of the gladiators, armed with swords and scant armor. Yet despite the resistance, 2,000 Deshaean gladiators would escape to the mountains of Angron's origins. For years, the rulers would hunt down the gladiators and slowly erode their numbers. Naming themselves the Eaters of Cities, the Deshaean gladiators under Angron's command would hold any incursion to capture or slay their band of warriors. However, attrition would slowly see to the dwindling of the Eaters of Cities until their numbers declined to 1,000 men and women. Upon the mountain of Fed and Moor, Angron's band of gladiators would make their final stand. At the Jest Elica Ridge, the Eaters of Cities would be surrounded by seven armies of Nuceria. Angron and his warriors would be doomed to die in combat, for even a Primarch would be unable to best such an overwhelming force. Yet Angron would not die this day, and with the intervention of the Emperor of Mankind, the Primarch of the Twelfth Legion would be saved. Observing the Primarch's struggles in secret, the Master of Mankind would watch his son's rebellion from afar. Descending to the battle with a cadre of his custodians, the Emperor would offer his aid in the battle should his son assume the mantle of leadership of the Twelfth Legion, the Warhounds. Refusing the Emperor's offer, Angron would demand that he remain on Nuceria with his gladiator kin and not withdraw from the planet until his enslavers had been brought to justice. Reluctantly, the Emperor would teleport Angron to his flagship, shocked at the sheer refusal of his son to adopt the responsibility ordained by his word. Finding his son wanting in strategical acumen, the Master of Mankind would not let his irreplaceable son die to the rabble of a backwater planet. The Eaters of Cities would be massacred without the leadership of Angron, to which the Lord of Red Sands would watch their annihilation helplessly from orbit. Lashing out at the Custodian Guard, Angron would slay one of the Emperor's Guardians until the Master of Mankind would use his psychic might to subdue the Primarch. Hoping in time that Angron would understand the realities of why the Emperor had abandoned his band of warriors, the Master of Mankind would seek to salvage the potential of his much beleaguered and scarred son. Angron was a ghost of the Emperor's former plans, yet a Primarch he would remain. For every Primarch would serve the Imperium in the campaigns of the Great Crusade. Embittered to his father's dismissal of his plight, Angron would come to resent the Emperor for his disregard for his honor to die with his men. Nurturing the deep wound in his psyche, the Lord of Red Sands would regardless assume command of his legion, the Warhounds, in an attempt to sate the ever-worsening cravings of the Butcher's Nails. Murdering the captains of his legion and the Twelfth Legion Master, Ibram Greer, in a fit of rage, Angron's hatred for his stranger sons would be calmed with the intervention of the Legion's eighth captain, Khan. Volunteering to soothe his Primarch's torment, Khan would be beaten to near death by his gene father. Yet Khan's resolve to never accept defeat would resonate with his Primarch, and for his efforts, a bond between Khan and Angron would form. Convincing his Primarch that the Legion was worthy to honor the legacy of the gladiators of Deshaea, Captain Driga would offer a change in the Twelfth's title. No longer would they be the Emperor's Warhounds. From then on, they would become the Eaters of Worlds for the Lord of Red Sands. Now known throughout the Imperium as the World Eaters, Angron would lead his men to bring many worlds into compliance into the fold of the Imperium. Incorporating the Nusarian gladiator cultural trappings into their legion, the World Eaters would become synonymous for their efficient yet bloody deeds. Experts in neurological surgery and cortical implant technologies would study the Primarch's affliction of the butcher's nails. Realizing that the implants combined with the Primarch's enhanced biological functions had integrated beyond all hope of removal, Angron's brain had been remapped to incorporate the nail's influence above all other stimuli of his body. Reducing his serotonin neurotransmitters and deadening all emotions beside aggression, Angron's capabilities of reason would be continually lost as the influence of the nails progressed. Removal of the Butcher's Nails would definitely kill the Primarch, 
yet their continual presence would regardless slowly kill him. The Twelfth Legion's burdens would be many, as not only was their Primarch slowly dying from his affliction, his reputation as the only Primarch to fail in conquering his homeworld would worsen the World Eater's already infamous reputation. Morale was low within the Twelfth Legion, yet their purpose as the serrated edge of the Great Crusade would at least give them purpose. Conflict was the only measure of the worth of the World Eaters, for they would earn no glory or plaudits, only satisfaction in battle as warriors. Seeking to emulate their Primarch and become closer to his solitary struggle, the Legionaries of the World Eaters would volunteer themselves to undergo the procedure to be implanted with butcher's nails of their own devising. Ordering his apothecaries to construct the nails and begin implanting them within his legion, Angron would seek to transform the Twelfth into warriors befitting the heritage of Nusaria's gladiators. Initially yielding a 100% failure rate, the nails would cause any implanted to die a painful death, yet Angron would not relent in his demands for the nails to be refined and trialed. Abandoning his legion for their weakness to follow in the steps of the gladiators of Deshea, it would take two years for his equerry, Khan, to reunite the Lord of Red Sands with his legion. Shedding their weakness, Khan would be the first to survive the Butcher's Nail surgery, and by his example, the legion would completely integrate the nails into their bodies or die in the attempt. Observing the rapid devolution of the World Eater's discipline in favor of frenzied rage, detractors of the Twelfth Legion would let their criticisms be known. Rebute Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines Legion, would be disgusted during his joint campaign alongside Angron during the cleansing of Aragata. Nicknamed the Red Angel, Angron's reputation for committing atrocities would become of great concern to the Imperium. The World Eaters in their frenzied state had hurled themselves into the most unwinnable of odds and enacted a heavy toll of losses for their lack of self-preservation. Ordering his men to bring worlds into compliance within 31 Nusarian standard hours, upon failure, the Red Angel would execute one-tenth of his men in order to root out the weakness within the Legion. Learning of the Butcher's Nail's implantation within the Legion, the Emperor of Mankind would dispatch the Primarch of the Sixth Legion, Lehman Russ, to order Angron to end his heretical surgeries. Known by Imperial records as the Knight of the Wolf, the Emperor's executioner with his legion of Space Wolves would confront the World Eaters after the massacre of the planet of Gena. Refusing the orders of the Wolf King, Angron and Lehman Russ would battle. The Fenrisian chainsword, Krakenmore, would clash against Angron's chain axe, Widowmaker. Each legion would claim that the other fired the first shot that would begin the melee, but all that bears remembering is that there would be no clear victor of the skirmish. Widowmaker would be destroyed at the hands of the Wolf King, yet Angron would assert his victory in combat against the restrained might of Lehman Russ. Yet Angron would assert his victory in combat against the restrained might of the Wolf King. Withdrawing from battle, despite their censure and warning of the Imperium, the World Eaters would continue their Butcher's Nails implantation. Claiming the skulls of their foes from battle, the World Eaters would not relent in their ever-worsening onslaught across the galaxy. The Imperium would ignore the barbarity of the Twelfth Legion's actions should they continue to enforce the will of the Emperor. Yet such oversight would prove to be devastating to the future of the Imperium, with the dawn of the Civil War for humanity's soul, the Horus Heresy. Corrupted by the fraud of the ruinous powers, the War Master and Primarch of the 16th Legion, Horus Lupercal, would begin his quest to end the reign of the Emperor. Before his duplicity would be known, the Master of Mankind would send the War Master to confront Angron for his actions during the Great Crusade. Offering the Lord of Red Sands a chance at vengeance against his most hated father, it would not take much of Horus' lauded charisma to convince Angron to join the rebellion of the traitor Primarchs. Culling the loyalist elements within his legion, Angron would once more seek to purge any sign of weakness from within his ranks. Among the first members of the Pact of Betrayal, the World Eaters would stand at the forefront of the War for Humanity. Joining the second wave of traitors during the Dropside Massacre of Istvan V, Angron would relish the chance to slay the loyalists to the throne. 
proving to be instrumental in the vanguard of the traitor war effort, Angron's rampages across the stars would seemingly be destined to succeed. As the word bearers and world eaters joined forces to engage the Ultramarines within their home system of Ultramar, their so-called Shadow Crusade would slow the advance of the Imperium's most numerically superior and lauded legion. Yet with every battle fueled by the sting of the Butcher's Nails, Angron's terminal affliction would worsen. Attempting to heal his brother, the Primarch of the Word Bearers, Lorgar Aurelian, would beseech the Red Angel to return to his homeworld of Nuceria. Due to its close proximity within the Ultima Segmentum, the Eurozone would hope to confront the High Riders of Nuceria, and with Angron by his side, find a means to remove the Butcher's Nails from his afflicted brother. At last given an opportunity to bring his enslavers to justice, Angron and his World Eaters would venture to Nuceria. Upon the arrival of the 12th and 17th legions to the planet of Nuceria, Angron would descend once more to the Deshelica Ridge of the mountains. Paying his respects to his fallen brothers in arms, Angron would collect the skulls of his former brethren and adorn them across his armor. Confronting the High Riders of Deshea, Angron would be enraged at their disrespect of the retelling of the deaths of his noble gladiators. The populace believed Angron to have fled the battle and left his men to die in disgrace. Incensed by the lies of the High Riders, Angron would order his men to execute every living soul within the city and once finished, commit genocide across the planet. Yet the Lord of Red Sand's plot to annihilate his people would be halted by the Ultramarines commanded by their Primarch, Rebute Gilliman. The Retribution fleet of Ultramar would battle the combined might of the World Eaters and Word Bearers, both in orbit and on the planet's surface. The Lord of Ultramar would battle Lorgar Aurelian in single combat and after a bitter clash, come close to ending the Eurizen's life. However, Angron would not allow Gilliman to end the life of the Bearer of the Word. Unleashing his fury against the Lord of Ultramar, Angron would, despite his might, receive a glancing blow from Gilliman's power fist. A skull of Angron's once dead gladiators would fall from his armor, and Gilliman would unwittingly crush it beneath his mighty ceramite boot. Surrendering fully to his anguish, Angron would once more launch himself into the fray. Feeling the malevolent power of the warp in the wake of Angron's boundless grief, emanating from beyond the veil of the mortal realm, Chanting heretical litanies and imbuing Angron with the fury of the Blood God, Lorgar would enact the ascension of the Lord of Red Sands into a demon prince of corn. His torment, rage and despair, coalescing into the form of a demonic being of unimaginable wrath, the Red Angel would achieve apotheosis. Withdrawing from the battle, the Ultramarines and their Primarch would retreat in horror at the sight of the being birthed on the planet of Nuceria. Lorgar had saved his brother from the clutches of death, yet in doing so, damned countless future souls to suffer at the hands of the reborn Red Angel. Ordering Khan to butcher the slaves within the hold of the World Eater's flagship, Conqueror, the Demon Prince of Khorne would demand a throne of skulls to be built in his honor. Rampaging throughout the galaxy in his now ascended form, Angron's hunger for blood would not be sated by the lesser mortals and fiefdoms of the stars. Only the blood of humanity's most cherished bastion and its ruler would be fitting for such a horrific being. Brought to assemble with the traitor Primarchs at the world of Ulanor by the Primarch of the Iron Warriors, Perturabo, the World Eaters would once more lead the charge to Holy Terror. Creating a gigantic warp rift above the moon of Luna, Angron and his World Eaters would be the initial hammer blow of the traitor advance. Perched atop the Conqueror, Angron would observe the bloodletting of his legion with grim satisfaction. Enslaved to the whims of the blood god, Khorne, Angron would assault the Imperial Palace during the Siege of Terror as a terrible angel of vengeance. Slaying friend and foe alike, Angron's massacre of any who stood in his path would be terrible and uncompromising in its savagery. Destroying the defenses of the Lionsgate Spaceport and Eternity Wall, even the bravest of souls would fall to the fell Black Blade and its malevolent wielder, before its edge would crash through the Great Gate of the Imperial Palace. 
yet despite the efforts of the World Eaters, would need to hasten their assault. Wary of the ever closer arrival of the Dark Angels, Space Wolves, and Ultramarines to Holy Terror, the War Master would confront the Emperor in single combat. The Emperor would defeat Horus Lupercal and destroy his very being from existence. The armies of Chaos would fragment and retreat from the Siege of Terror, to which Angron, though the last to withdraw, would be no exception. Seeking refuge within the Eye of Terror, the World Eaters would over the millennia abandon their Primarch and fragment into several warbands. His last great revenge against the Master of Mankind thwarted, Angron skulks the Emeterium and bides his time for his seemingly random conquests of distant worlds. Prosecuting wars in the name of his patron god, Angron would be banished from the Material Realm during the Dominion of Fire campaign and First War for Armageddon. Yet with the return of the long dormant Primarch of the Ultramarines, Rabute Gilliman, rumors stir that the Red Angel shall once again return to real space during the Era Indomitus. Further transformed into a being of unrelenting fury, whose death grants only a momentary reprieve before his inevitable return, the Lord of Red Sands shall not cease his campaign of bloodshed and butchery. For in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war, and the Red Angel shall delight in every death made in the name of conflict across the stars. What brought you so low, brother? Did the machine in your skull finally refashion your loyalty into madness? <sighs> they let me dream. They give me peace. What would you know of struggle, perfect son? <sighs> when have you fought against the mutilations of your mind? When have you had to do anything more than tally compliances and polish your armor? Childish, Gilliman sighed, gesturing to the burning, dying city. Does it really come down to this? So pitiably childish. Childish? The people of your world named you Great One. The people of mine called me Slave. Angron stepped back, chainsaws revving harder. Which one of us landed on a paradise of civilization to be raised by a foster father, Rabute? Which one of us was given armies to lead after training in the halls of the McCraggian Highriders? Which one of us inherited a strong, cultured kingdom? Angron splayed blood as he frothed the words. And which of us had to rise up against a kingdom with nothing but a horde of starving slaves? Which one of us was a child enslaved on a world of monsters with his brain cut open by carving knives? The two Primarchs met again. Gilliman's powered gauntlets should have easily deflected Angron's chainsaws, but the World Eater's strength drove his brother back step by step. Chain teeth sprayed from the weapons as eagerly as the saliva from Angron's lipless slit of a mouth. Listen to your blue-clad wretches yelling of courage and honor. Courage and honor. Do you even know the meaning of those words? Courage is fighting the kingdom that enslaves you, no matter that their armies overshadow yours by 10,000 to one. You know nothing of courage. Honor is restraining a tyrant when all others suckle and grow fat on the hypocrisy he feeds them. You know nothing of honor. The warrior who acts out of honor cannot fail. His duty is honor itself. Even his death, if it is honorable, is a reward and can be no failure. For it has come through duty, seek honor as you act, therefore, and you will know no fear. The loyalist Primarchs are beloved by all subjects of his Imperium, though only some are venerated as true paragons of virtue, their legacies enduring as symbols of sacrifice, honor, and conquest. Yet there is one Primarch whom epitomizes the Emperor's will more than any of his brothers, an empire builder, patrician statesman, and valiant warrior, a man of indomitable will, cold reason, and preternatural intelligence. Primarch of the 13th Legion, Rabute Gilliman. As the infant Primarchs were scattered amongst the stars, Rabute Gilliman would land on the planet of Macrag. A robust civilization with its own laws and governing bodies, the young Primarch would be found by a group of noblemen within the sprawl of a hunting ground forest. 
Discovering a glowing capsule surrounded by an aura of light, the nobleman would bring the child to Connor Gilliman, one of two governing consuls whom ruled McCrag. With the arrival of the infant, McCrag's populace had reported several oddities and strange tidings that befell the planet. Connor himself had dreamt of the Emperor of Mankind. In his dream, he walked to the foot of Hera's Fall, within the Valley of Laponis. As he awoke from his slumber, the nobleman would bring the child to Connor. In light of the strange phenomena and his own visions, Connor would adopt the child, naming him Robute. Translated from McCrag's dialect as Great One. With the help of Connor's seneschal, Tarasha Yutin, Robute would grow into a wise and courageous man. At the age of ten, he had mastered the finer points of history, philosophical contemplations, and science, surpassing even the elders whom had mentored him. As a military commander, his strategic mind was unmatched. In light of this, Connor Gilliman would grant his son command of an expeditionary force that would venture into the Illyrium region of McCrag. A mountainous region to the north, the wilds of which were home to wild men, which harassed the city's populace. As the campaign waged, Gilliman would occupy various shrines throughout the region, forcing the hand of the Illyrians to engage his forces on his terms, to which Gilliman would challenge their chieftain to single combat. Using only defensive blocks and parries, Gilliman would exhaust his opponent, and when the battle had ended, Rabute would gift the chieftain with a prized relic that the people of McCrag's past had stolen. Preventing unnecessary losses of life, Gilliman's acumen would win over the wild men of the north, whom relented in their attacks on the populace of McCrag. The people were safe, and the Illyrians would never harm them again. Yet as Rabute returned to his capital, he found his home and his people in a state of chaos. Connor's co-consul, Galen, had incited a coup to overthrow the Gillimans and seize control of McCrag for himself. Watching Galen's army sacking the city, Rabute instructed his men to secure the capital whilst he ventured to the House of Consuls and lifted the siege. On his arrival, he would find his adoptive father fatally injured, and with Connor's dying breath, he would tell his son of Galen's betrayal. Rabute would reveal Galen's treachery to the assembled governing administrators, and amid a wave of support from the populace, would become the sole consul of McCrag. Now the most powerful man on McCrag, Rabute would enact his father's vision to change it into a meritocratic government and would purge the populace of the conspirators whom had followed Galen's orders. Unbeknownst to Rabute, his true father, the Emperor of Mankind, had been observing his actions since the battles fought between his armies and the wild men of the Illyrian region. From the neighboring planet of Espandor, he would observe but be impeded from contacting the crag due to rampant warp storms which embroiled the system. Five years would pass until the storms would subside and the Emperor would venture to McCrag personally to meet his son. Within the lapse of time, McCrag now stood as a bountiful planet that was self-sufficient, prosperous, and equipped with both a strong military and abundant trade networks. Rabute would bend his knee to join the Imperium. Impressed with his son's prowess as a ruler, the Emperor would relocate the 13th Legion's forward base to McCrag and give Gilliman command of his legion now renamed the Ultramarines. As the Great Crusade waged, the Ultramarines would prove to be one of the most effective legions in bringing in planets under compliance. With exception to Horus Lupercal's Lunar Wolves, no other Adeptus Astartes legion would conquer as many worlds as fast and with such a rate of compliance during the Crusade. With each conquered world, Gilliman would not leave until the planet's people had a robust means to defend themselves technologically flourish, enact trade, and govern effectively within the Imperium. For Gilliman, the well-being of the world's people was of utmost importance. McCrag would be overhauled with the insight of Gilliman's hand-picked advisors, bolstering itself and its surrounding planet's military and enabling a constant flow of new recruits to join the Ultramarines Legion. Combined with the Legion's rare casualty rate due to Gilliman's tactical genius, the 13th Legion grew into the most numerically superior of all the Adeptus Astartes Legions. The Emperor would value the Ultramarine's vast numbers and utilize them often as his personal hand of judgment. With his most infamous decision, 
being to order Gilliman and the Ultramarines to accompany himself to confront Lorgar Aurelian, Primarch of the Word Bearers on the Imperium compliant world of Monarchia. Used as a hammer blow to shame the 17th Legion, the Ultramarines would oversee the destruction of Monarchia. The idolatrous inhabitants led astray by Lorgar, the Emperor would purge the planet of worshipping his likeness, to which Gilliman would forever feel discomfort for his Legion's involvement the result of which would lead to the Ultramarines' greatest betrayal. With the Horus Heresy making its crucial first steps, the War Master would command the Ultramarines to station their forces within the Viridian system at the planet of Kalf. During a joint operation to build trust and cohesion between the Ultramarines and Wordbearers, Lorgar's men would launch a surprise attack and cause devastating losses to the 13th Legion. Lorgar would attempt to assassinate Gilliman with the use of demon forces and jettison Rebute into space without a helmet. Gilliman would fight the word bearers in the vacuum of space and reboard his ship. Commanding his men to counterattack Lorgar's forces, he would end the battle by confronting Kor Theron, the Dark Cardinal of the 17th Legion. Offering Rebute to join the forces of Chaos, Rebute would respond by ripping one of the hearts from the first captain's chest. Reinstating the chapter's Librarius, Gilliman would return to McCrag with all haste, finding the planet under attack by Primarchs Lorgar and Angron of the World Eaters Legion, a battle that would be known as the Shadow Crusade. Joining forces with Sanguinius and his Legion of Blood Angels, the Loyalist Astartes would engage the traitor forces, attempting to destroy the Ultramar system. Driving the traitors from Ultramar, Gilliman would pursue the word bearers and world eater forces to the homeworld of Angron, Nuceria. As the three legions clashed, Gilliman would face Lorgar Aurelian in single combat. Observing his brother to be empowered by chaos, Gilliman would match his brother's attacks until Angron's intervention. As the two traitor primarchs fought Gilliman, he would be overwhelmed. Yet before being cut down by the Red Angel, he would be saved by his valiant sons swarming the Primarch of the World Eaters as the Ultramarines retrieved their father. Tending to his wounds, Gilliman and his legion would be cut off from the wider Imperium by the Ruin Storm. Fearing that the Imperium had been lost, Rebute would found the Imperium Secundus, creating a secondary empire to act as a contingency. Refusing the title of Emperor of this new Imperium, Rebute would look to his brothers, whom had likewise been stranded by the Ruin Storm naming his brother Sanguinius as Emperor's Regent. Imperium Secundus would be plagued by the actions of Conrad Kurz during its founding, orchestrating suicide bombings, terror attacks, and raids on McCrag's populace. With the intervention of Lionel Johnson and his Dark Angels Legion, Kurz would be brought to heel, though not without friction between the Primarchs and their methods of rooting out the Night Haunter. With Kurz captured, the three Primarchs would attempt to breach the Ruin Storm and aid in the defense of Holy Terror, due to the Night Haunter's visions giving credence to the Emperor and his Imperium's continued survival. Venturing to the world of Davin, Rebute, the Lion, and Sanguinius would attempt to uncover truths pertaining to Horus's betrayal from the world with which his path of corruption had begun. Upon arriving on the planet, the Primarchs would discover the temple with which Horus's body had been claimed by Chaos. Sanguinius would be dragged through a warp-spawned portal and demons would spill forth, preventing Gilliman and the Lion from aiding their brother. As Sanguinius bested the demon Medeo within the portal, the temple would collapse. The three Loyalist Legions would evacuate Davin and destroy the demon-spawning planet with cyclonic torpedoes destroying the anchor point with which the demons traversed into the material realm. With the planet's destruction, a breach in the warp storm would appear, leading directly to Holy Terror. Yet Horus would foresee this development and send the Alpha Legion to blockade it. Gilliman and the Lion would distract the 20th Legion, while Sanguinius would traverse the breach, facing his destiny in the defense of Holy Terror. With his path to Terror lost, Gilliman and the Ultramarines would never reach its sacred soil during its time of greatest need. With all haste, Gilliman would travel to Terra and force Horus Lupercal's hand in ending the war by attempting to kill the Emperor, before the 13th Legion could add their might to the Loyalist defense. Arriving on Terra, 
Rabute would discover his father's wounded body interred on the Golden Throne. Absent from the final assault on the Imperial Palace, Rabute now commanded the most powerful legion within the Imperium. The Ultramarines spared the decimation endured by the other legions. Given the title of Lord Commander of the Imperium, Rabute would deploy his legion in the subsequent years to aid in the reclamation of planets enthralled by the forces of chaos and rebellion. Rabute would draft the Codex Astartes and limit the size of the Loyalist legions to prevent any from following in the path of overwhelming might, first abused by Horus Lupercal and his traitorous brothers. Gilliman would also venture forth to bring his brother Primarchs, whom had betrayed the Imperium, to justice, killing Primarch Alpharius of the 20th Legion on the planet of Escredor, and eventually facing Fulgrim of the Emperor's children during the Battle of Tessala. Facing the reborn demon prince, Gilliman would be greatly outmatched by his corrupted brother, resulting in him being mortally wounded by Fulgrim's poisoned blade. As the demon prince of Slanesh retreated into the Eye of Terror, Gilliman would fall into a coma, tended by his legion's apothecaries and interred inside a stasis field. For 10,000 years, Rabute Gilliman would lay dormant as the Imperium of Man corroded and fell to ruin as he slept, though one day he would awaken and avenge his Imperium. I am the fist, clenched tight in ceramite, smashing with the force of a legion. I am the blade, awaiting my foe's flesh, as keen as the Emperor could make me. I am the bolt, fired from afar, fleet and true, an end to all who stand before the Imperium of Man. Forget no insult, my sons, as I have never forgotten those of my father, of the Emperor, nor those of Horus. Forgive no slight or grievance. Hold your bitterness deep within you, and there let it fester. Let it roil and squirm and churn, until you are filled with bile so poisonous that all you touch falls to ruin. Thus shall you serve Nurgle best. Thus shall you spread his virulent gifts across the false Imperium and watch its final rotting. The Primarchs of his Imperium, though demigods of humanity, would not be without flaws. Brashness, arrogance and pride would mark the fallen disgrace of many of the Emperor's sons. For even in his most loyal champions, they would lay bare their most exploitable weaknesses in personality and resolve. For today, we shall elucidate a Primarch enshrined in bitterness and morose isolation. The Primarch of the 14th Legion, Mortarion. During the scattering of the Primarchs, the 14th child of the Emperor would be transported to the death world of Barbarus. Wreathed in deadly toxins, the steam-fueled contraptions of the planet would heavily influence the demeanor and temperament of the Primarch's personality. The populace would be ruled by inhuman necromancers, empowered by the influence of chaos, whilst barbarous as human inhabitants would attempt to farm the land for a meager existence within the small pockets of the world not sullied by poison. Constantly wary of the creatures spawned by the necromantic overlords of the planet, the humans would toil in ignorance as the Primarch's gestation pod would be discovered. Among the ceaseless battlefields between the overlords of Barbarus, one such tyrant would discover a child among the corpses of the war zone. Perplexed at the child's tolerance to the noxious air of the land, the overlord would find the infant screaming among the dead. The high overlord, Nikar, would see an opportunity for his superhuman foundling to become the heir to his legacy. Naming the child Mortarian, or Child of Death in Barbara native dialect, the Primarch of the 14th would be housed within a small tower enveloped in the planet's toxic fumes. The High Overlord of Barbarus would diligently build his own lair within the most toxic peak of the planet's mountains. Mortarian superhuman resistance to poison and disease would be pushed to its limit as the maturing child's lungs fought desperately to filter the miasma with every breath. 
Gifted with a voracious hunger for knowledge, Mortarion would be tutored by his captor in all manner of battle doctrines and arcane arts. Yet as the child matured, his mind would come to question the lot of Barbarus's human populace and the manner in which they would be treated. Questions which would go unanswered should the young Primarch remain in captivity. Escaping his tower of isolation, Mortarion would fell any guard whom attempted to stand in his path. Venturing to the valleys of Barbarus, Mortarion's tolerance for poisons would allow him to survive the noxious mists. Binding the human populace to be of his own species, Mortarion would realize his kinship with the oppressed people of the poisonous world. Slow to trust the Primarch, the Barbarians would see the child of the mountains to be an unnatural interloper into their ranks. Such opinions would be short-lived with the Primarch's defense of the settlement from the attack of a horrific creature. Dispatched by a rival overlord of the Necromancers, the settlers would stand little chance of defending themselves from the monster's rampage. Yet with the intervention of Mortarion, armed with a large harvesting scythe, the monster would be slain. The Necromancer Overlord would smirk at the upstart defender of Barbarus as he retreated back into the poison mists, yet would be shocked as the Child of Death charged into the noxious fumes and cleaved him in two with his scythe. Championed by the people of Barbarus, Mortarion would use his knowledge bequeathed from his foster father to reinforce the settlements of the valleys. Creating strongholds and traveling from settlement to settlement, Mortarion would transform the disorganized and vulnerable citizens into a resistance militia. Recruiting the most durable and bold men of the settlements into a band of warriors, Mortarion would train his lieutenants capable of leading small battalions. Incorporating artificers and blacksmiths to create weapons and armor for his men, Mortarion's band would soon be equipped to venture into the poison wastes of the world and fight at his side. His so-called Death Guard would battle against the hordes of the necromancers and with each victory hone their martial prowess and adapt their armor to endure ever increasingly deadly environments. Besting the overlords of the planet, only one trial would stand in their way before the world of Barbarus would be rid of the malevolent curse of its ruling tyrants. Mortarion's foster father, Nakar, and his fortress within the most deadly peak of the mountains. Assembling his men to assault the fortress of the High Overlord, Mortarion would be conflicted in waging war against his father figure. Under the advisement of his most trusted advisor, Callus Typhon, the Death Guard would call off their assault of the stronghold of the Necromancer. Their armor would not be capable of surviving the deadly peak of the mountains until further advancements could be made. As such, Mortarion would withdraw his people to their village, yet on their return be informed of the arrival of a peculiar stranger to their settlement promising salvation. Confronting the stranger as he sat in conference with the elders of the village, Mortarion would balk at the insinuation that he was capable of liberating his people unaided. Offering Mortarion a challenge, the stranger would give the ultimatum that he would intervene if the champion of Barbarus would be unable to defeat the High Overlord. Should the stranger lend his might, Mortarion would swear fealty to him, yet should Mortarion free his people unaided, the stranger would leave the planet. Alone, Mortarion would venture to the stronghold of his foster father, despite the protestation of his death guard. Seeking to prove the stranger wrong, the child of death would attempt to breach the thick smog of toxins surrounding the High Overlord's fortress. Mortarion's armor began to rust and fragment, with every step closer to his prize. Yet as Mortarion reached the gates of the Overlord's citadel, he would collapse. Nekar would stand outside the gates of his citadel and mock the Child of Death for his weakness. Within Mortarion's mind, a whisper of a being of malicious intent would resound. The being known as Nurgle had delighted in Mortarion's circumstance and began his slow influence within his mind. Nekar would attempt to end the Primarch's life, yet before delivering the fatal blow, the stranger to the village would intervene. Slaying the High Overlord with his sword wreathed in flame, the stranger would save the life of the child of death. Recovering from the ordeal, Mortarion would true to his word pledge his fealty to his revealed true father, the Emperor. Granting Mortarion command of the 14th Legion, the Dusk Raiders, it would not be long before the Primarch would incorporate his Barbarian warriors into the Legion's ranks and rename them 
the Death Guard. Yet despite the Emperor's salvation of his homeworld and the death of its tyrannical overlord, Mortarion's pride would be irrevocably damaged. Denied vengeance against his life's tormentor, Mortarion would bear a grudge against the master of mankind which would never heal. With time, the slight submerged deep within his psyche would be nurtured and exploited by the plague god, Nurgle. For Mortarion's descent into the thrall of chaos had already begun. Rallying his new legion and restructuring its ranks to reflect his homeworld's cultural trappings, Mortarion would be a striking figure to his Terran-born Astartes. The manifestation of the ancient Terran figure of the Grim Reaper, the Lord of Death would utter a simple axiom to his legion. You are my unbroken blades. You are the Death Guard. By your hand shall justice be delivered, and doom shall stalk a thousand worlds. Striking fear into the hearts of the Imperium's foes, the 14th Legion would trudge a relentless path of destruction in the Emperor's name. Drafting recruits exclusively from Barbarus, the Terran cultural heritage within the Legion would erode with time. Creating tension within the Legion, as the Great Crusade waged on, the Terran Astartes of the 14th would dwindle. The Death Guard would bring compliances to the Imperium with the fervor of liberation. Never pausing their crusade, as each world fell to their sides, the Death Guard would resupply their might in transit to their next objective. Never reinforcing or garrisoning worlds brought into their compliance, the Death Guard would sow death and reap their harvest of souls. Fueled by a desire to cleanse humanity of terror and oppression, Mortarion's campaigns would be waged without mercy or restraint. Often waging joint campaigns with his brother Primarch, Horus Lupercal, the Death Guard and the Lord of Death would gain a reputation as a reliable and efficient legion. Weakening their foes with their sheer fortitude in battle, the Death Guard would drain their opposition of firepower until the 16th Legion, the Lunar Wolves, would deliver the hammer blow to destroy their ranks. A close bond would form between Horus and Mortarion, despite the Lord of Death's visage of breathing apparatus and pallid skin, resulting in the majority of his Primarch brethren to distance themselves from his favor. Deemed a freakish figure among the sons of the Emperor, with exception given to the Night Haunter of Nostramo, Mortarion would be criticized by his brothers, such as the Primarch of the Ultramarines Legion, Rabute Gilliman, for cherishing his brotherhood of Horus above even the Emperor's grace. For in time, such a criticism of the Lord of Death's character would be proven to be true. As the Great Crusade began to draw to a close, the use of psychers within the Legiones Astartes would begin to cause concern within the Imperium. The Librarius had proven time and again to be a tool of great power among the Legions, yet their reliance of drawing power from the unstable depths of the warp would be called into question. Convening the Council of Nikea, Primarchs and Astartes alike would debate on the use of psychers within the Astartes ranks. Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Sons, would champion their inclusion, whilst Mortarion would seek to abolish their continual use. The Lord of Death's childhood had been plagued by the influence of foul sorcery and shown Mortarion firsthand the depths and depravity that those who wielded psychic powers could stoop. Convincing the Emperor to disband the Librarius, Mortarion would be satisfied with his father's decision to outlaw sorcery within the legions. Yet such a victory to his ideals and values would not be enough to absolve the Emperor of the Lord of Death's resentment. The War Master of the Imperium, Horus Lupercal, would begin his descent into the clutches of chaos with the intervention of the Plague God. Wounded by the Anaphane Blade, wielded by the corrupted planetary governor, Eugen Temba, the chosen born of Nurglef would injure the Primarch of the 16th Legion and allow for his corruption by the forces of chaos. Now poised to overthrow the galaxy with his rebellion to the throne, the War Master would turn to his trusted brother for allegiance. Mortarion had never been accepted by the Emperor, nor his most lauded sons, save for Horus. The War Master would reveal to Mortarion that the Emperor had stolen power from the beings of the Warp, and empowered himself through their means to become the most powerful Psyker of their galaxy. Mortarion's intolerance of Psykers would cement his resolve to face the Emperor, and alongside the Sons of Horus, 
the Death Guard would join in their betrayal. The Death Guard's path to damnation had been set, for even among their ranks, the seeds of corruption had been planted. First Captain Kalos Typhon had concealed his surrender to the ruinous powers, and with the influence of his rank, sown the influence of the Plague God into the 14th Legion. Upon the Istvan system, the traitor legions would begin their campaign to conquer the Imperium. Purging the loyalist remnants within their legions, the sons of Horus, World Eaters, Emperor's Children, and Death Guard would slaughter their brethren. The lingering glories of the Dusk Raiders would be expunged from the ranks of the Death Guard, and despite the escape of the Legion's battle captain, Nathaniel Garrow, and a detachment of loyalist Death Guard, the 14th submission to Chaos would begin. Deploying his men to aid in the betrayal of the loyalist counterattack during the Isfahan V dropside massacre, Mortarion would not linger to indulge in the grudges perpetrated by his traitorous brothers. Without delay, the Lord of Death would venture to attempt to bring another legion into the fold of the traitor war effort. Horus had been especially close to the Primarch of the White Scars, Jagatai Khan, during the Great Crusade, and as such, the Lord of Death would use this bond to bring the Khan of Khans into the fold. Absent from the opening stages of the Horus Heresy, the Fifth Legion had not pledged their blades to either side of the conflict. Refusing to intervene by aiding the Space Wolves within the Alaxis Nebula in the wake of the burning of Prospero, the White Scars would travel to the homeworld of the Thousand Suns to find answers. Confronting the Warhawk within the Ashen Derelicts of Prospero, the Lord of Death would offer the Khan an invitation to join their rebellion against the Emperor. Observing Mortarion's changes gifted by the Ruinous Powers, Jagatai would surmise that the Pale King merely sought to expunge every trace of Psykers from the galaxy. Having drafted the outlines of the Librarius alongside his brothers Magnus and Sanguinius, the Khan, though not gifted with psychic power, would be sympathetic to those who were gifted with such abilities. Despite the restraint suggested by the White Scars and the Emperor's decision to outlaw the use of the Librarius, the traitors had surrendered to the beings of the Warp, and for such flagrant hypocrisy, the Warhawk would refuse to side with the Lord of Death. Warning Mortarion that the Warp shall claim him should he continue on his path, Mortarion had chosen to betray humanity for the promise of strength and found his rewards wanting. The Kargan would state that the Primarchs were not Empire Builders, for only the Emperor could be capable of leading humanity. Enraged at the Khan's refusal to join the Traitor Legions, Mortarion and his Death Guard would battle the White Scars and their Primarch. The Keshig and Death Shroud would clash as the Sons of the Emperor circled one another. The Death Lord and Kargan would clash, their blows matching one another in a battle between speed and constitution. Yet with the arrival of the Death Guard fleet, above Prospero, Mortarion would retreat from the fray. With the Second Battle of Prospero ended and his attempt to recruit the Fifth Legion failed, Mortarion would command his fleet to purge the planets of the Prosperine system. For the Lord of Death sought answers within the bones of the Crimson King's Empire. Upon the Mandeville Point during 007.M31, Mortarion would descend upon the world and capture one of its inhabitants. Possessed by a demon of the warp, the captive woman shackled within the Death Guard flagship, Endurance, would reveal its nature to Mortarion. Having never encountered such a being, the Pale King would be taunted by the possessed woman's insinuation that his soul had been claimed by the Lord of Decay. His intolerance of the warp further stoked, Jagatai's words had been proven true, for Mortarion was now surrounded by the servants of fell gods. Alone in his resolve to stave off the influence of chaos among the traitor ranks, Mortarion would seek the means to prevent his damnation. Yet the power of Nurgle would not be denied, for Mortarion had not been chosen, he had been claimed. Believing himself to be incorruptible, the possessed woman would mock the Primarch's self-delusion and hypocrisy. Transforming into a being of the Immaterium, the demon would taunt the Lord of Death as he struggled and failed to crush it with his raw strength. 
forced to unleash his innate yet repressed psychic abilities buried deep within, Mortarin would rend the demon apart. Mockingly saluting the Primarch with the phrase, Hail, Master of the Plague, as its soul receded back into the Immaterium, it would leave the Lord of Death in a state of hypocrisy. Now empowered with the very sorceries he had always denied, Mortarion would acknowledge his self-loathing nature and attempt to master the warp to prevent becoming its pawn. The Death Guard Legion would become fragmented with the First Captain's continual fascination and pursuit of the powers of the Chaos Gods. Already tutored in the arts of sorcery by the Word Bearer's first chaplain, Erebus, Typhon would not repress nor hide his own psychic abilities. Mortarion would order his legion to aid in the assault of the Siege of Terror, yet Callus Typhon now no longer served the whims of his Primarch. Surrendering his soul, men and vessels, to the clutches of Nurgle within the Immaterium, the splintering of the Death Guard by its first captain had begun. Murdering the navigators of the fleet, Typhon would allow the fleet under Mortarion's command to be soaked in the powers of Nurgle within the Immaterium. Unable to escape the warp, the Astartes of the fleet would transform into bloated, pus-coated beings. Their rusted armor and rotten flesh, ripe for the many contagions and viruses, to grow plump within their seeping wounds and rotten skin. Mortarion would not be spared such gifts of the Plague God, nor once more be saved by the Emperor's grace. Mortarion would endure untold suffering and transform until the gifts of Nurgle would cease. Reborn as a demon prince of the Plague Father, Mortarion would pledge his soul and the fate of his legion as a bargain of his deliverance from pain. Returning to real space as horrific harbingers of disease and pestilence, the Death Guard would join the traitor assault of the Siege of Terror. Descending as the first assault wave upon the throne world and slaughtering swathes of the defenders of the Imperium, Mortarion and his Death Guard would wreak havoc. Conquering the Colossi Gate, the Death Guard would redeploy to the Marmax Bastion and once again face the Warhawk and his White Scars in battle. Mortarion's outcast gene son, Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow, would intervene and alongside his Knights Errant confront his gene father. Offering Garrow the chance to rejoin his legion, the Hand of the Sigilite would reject the corrupted Primarch's offer, and before perishing, wound Mortarion with his broken blade, Libertas. Capturing the Lionsgate spaceport from Imperial forces, Jagatai would engage Mortarion in the battle to reclaim the vital linchpin of the Throneworld's defense. Once again dueling, Jagatai would be no match against the now fully empowered pawn of Chaos, yet the Kargan knew a weakness he could exploit. Scolding Mortarion's weakness of giving himself to the entities of the Warp, the Kargan would strike a crippling blow to the Lord of Death's ego. Taking advantage of Mortarion's frenzied state, Jagatai would injure the Lord of Death before being impaled by Mortarion's scythe, Silence. Pulling himself close to Mortarion, Jagatai would endure the pain of the blade as it dug deep into his flesh and decapitate the Pale King. Banished into the roiling ties of the warp, Mortarion would materialize once more into the mortal realm and claim dominion of a demon world. Residing on the plague planet, the disgraced Lord of Death would not show his presence within the Imperium for many millennia. His plague marines of the 14th had failed during the Siege of Terror and the Horus Heresy had been thwarted by the Emperor and the Loyalists to the throne. Ruling his world as a tyrant alike to his foster father, the hypocrisy of Mortarion would ascend new heights as he ruled the world as a tyrannical overlord. Ascending fully into the form of a demon prince, Mortarion would rule his kingdom as the Death Guard splintered into warbands of varying loyalties. Yet with the dawn of the 41st millennium, the Pale King would return to real space. During 901.M41, Mortarion would slay the Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights, Cornavin, and be banished by his successor, Kaldor Drago. Carving his predecessor's name onto Mortarion's heart, Mortarion would temporarily be banished once more to the Immaterium. However, the birth of the Cicatrix Maledictum across the stars 
would herald a new dawn for the Death Guard. The Great Rift would demand opposition, and with the return of the Avenging Sun, Rebute Gilliman, Mortarion would wage his Great Plague War upon Ultramar. Seeking to corrupt Macrag and its subordinate planets and spread the Garden of Nurgle across the bones of their ravaged husks, the Pale King would be confronted by the Ultramarines and their Primarch. Dueling Gilliman upon the world of Ajax in single combat, the culmination of the Plague Wars would see Mortarion slay the Primarch of the Thirteenth. Resurrected by the Emperor, through Gilliman, the Master of Mankind would banish Mortarion once more and deal a wound upon the Plague God, Nurgle. His garden burning and champion defeated, Nurgle would be displeased with his chosen Primarch as he tends to his wounded pride and ambition. Yet one day, the Prince of Decay shall return to wreak untold miseries upon the galaxy. Now I do not accuse my brother of such barbarism, but no evil begins with such monstrous acts. If it did, no sane man would ever consider it. No, it begins slowly, a small step here, a small step there. By such acts is a man's heart turned black and rotten. A man may begin with noble intentions, believing that such small trespasses are minor things compared to the good he will do at the end of his course. But every act matters, from the smallest to the greatest. Without the light of chaos, the universe would stagnate and collapse. Only through this struggle can any advancement occur. The Primarchs of his Imperium are among the strongest beings in the galaxy. Gifted power beyond the comprehension of mere mortals, the Sons of the Emperor would lead their armies at the vanguard of battle. Yet each Primarch would strive to push the limits of their strength, whether in martial prowess, artifice, or psychic potential. For today, we shall elucidate a Primarch unequaled in his mastery of the warp, blinded by the allure of fell knowledge. The Primarch of the 15th Legion, Magnus the Red. The young son of the Emperor would be unique among his brethren in many ways. The only Primarch to remember the origin of his creation, the psychic power of the Crimson Child would be potent from the start. Within his gestation pod inside the gene labs of Terra, the child would utilize his innate psychic abilities to commune with the master of mankind. Spirited to the colony world of Prospero during the scattering of the Primarchs, the son of the Emperor would emerge into a world steeped in the mystical arts of sorcery. The populace had been shunned by humanity for its manipulations of the immaterial realm since the days of the Dark Age of Technology, and in their isolation, they would work tirelessly to understand the nuances of the warp. Plagued by beings known as the Psychnuin, the power emanating from the psychers of the planet would draw the foul warp spawned insectoid creatures to prey on the minds of the weak. The sorcerers would band together to stave off the incursions of the creatures, and within their bastions, study means to hone their psychic might. Alike to a comet, the Primarch's gestation pod would plunge through Prospero's orbit and crash into the central plaza of the world's capital, Tizka. Among the sorcerers of the planet, a lone man would step forth to investigate the capsule. Amon, a senior member of the Tiscan Commune, would find a child within and raise the young boy as both father and tutor. The boy would quickly mature and demonstrate an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. The kind mentor and powerful psyker of Prospero would teach the son of the Emperor every art in the Arcanum within his understanding. Within years, Harmon's mastery of the ether would be surpassed by his adopted child, as Magnus read ancient tomes, compendiums, and scraps of text within the City of Light's librarium. No longer the most revered sorcerer of Prospero, Harmon would with pride relinquish his mentorship of the boy and assume the mantle of student to his own son. 
None had ever seen a being capable of the wonders Magnus could conjure, and with time, the Master of the Warp would rally the people of Prospero to eradicate the Psychnuin from their world. Entire cities of Prospero had been infested with the creatures of the Warp and claimed untold souls from their harvest. With Magnus's ascension as the ruler of Prospero by dint of his power, the Crimson King would lead his unified band of sorcerers to cleanse their once noble bulwarks. Purging the beings from Prospero, Magnus would see to the reconstruction of the city of Tisca with knowledge gleaned from the reclaimed city's long dormant repositories of knowledge and history. The City of Light would transform into a paradise. Marble and glass pyramids would jut into the heavens as the citizen re-studied Arcanum within the tranquil parks and boulevards of Tisca. Enraptured with bliss and safety, the Prosperans would flourish with the peace brought by their new monarch. Yet the Crimson King would not be satisfied with the lot of his people. Seeking to further master and explore the power of the so-called Great Ocean, Magnus would see to the construction of a vast great library within the heart of Tisca, for the scholars of Prospero to further probe their understanding of the Immaterium. Despite his once mentor Ammon warning the Crimson King against delving too deep into the nadir of the Great Ocean, Magnus would journey further into its tides. Such acts of psychic power would emanate through the galaxy and quickly draw the attention of the Master of Mankind to its origins. During 840.M30, the Emperor of Mankind would descend under the precincts of Tisca. The two had conversed for years as the Master of Mankind sought to reunite with his prodigal son, and upon the Emperor's reunion with his child, he would embrace him. Accompanying his father for solar decades, Magnus would join the Emperor in his traversal and study of the warp. Yet the Master of Mankind would warn Magnus that even though they were among the most psychically powerful beings in the galaxy, the machinations of the warp were not to be overindulged. For dangers lurked within the depths of the great ocean, to which no man, no matter his strength or wisdom, would be immune to its malevolent influence. Installed as the leader of the 15th Legion, the Thousand Sons, Magnus's kin would follow in their Primarch's image as the most gifted psychers of the Legiones Astartes. Yet their gifts would not be without cost, as the 15th Legion had been ravaged by a warp-born mutation known as the Flesh Change. Mutation and organ rejection would be rampant within the Legion as a direct result of their psychic affinity, to which their numbers had dwindled to a thousand souls. The Emperor had named them to honor those who had survived the decline of their numbers and remained resolute and stalwart in the face of their dire circumstance. Many within the Imperium would advocate for the euthanizing of its remaining Astartes to prevent further unavoidable mutations, but Magnus would plead to the Emperor to allow the Crimson King to seek a cure for their ailment. Agreeing to his request, the Emperor would allow the Crimson King several decades to find the cure for his gene sons. In secret, Magnus would naively consort with the entities within the Great Ocean and be offered a balm for his men. Sacrificing his eye in the bargain for his legion's survival, Magnus would be manipulated by the schemer of the warp, Zinch. Believing himself to have cleansed the flesh change from his legion, Magnus had bought only a temporary reprieve for his thousand sons. His arrogance damning his legion to endure future hardships, the Crimson King and the Thousand Sons would rejoin the Great Crusade a hundred years after the Emperor's arrival to Tisca for the Imperium still treated the army of Sorceress Astartes with suspicion, and the Thousand Sons of Magnus would need to vindicate themselves from their detractors. Regardless of their small numbers in comparison to their brother legions, the 15th would quickly prove themselves to be more than capable of bringing worlds into compliance. Displaying their mastery of the warp in bouts of immense arcane might, the Thousand Sons would emulate a fragment of the Emperor's own power during their campaigns. Led by their striking Crimson Lord, the 15th Legion would be among the most noble warriors of the Imperium. Akin to scholars more than warriors, the Astartes of Prospero would delight in their mastery of the Immaterium. Enthralling the populations of worlds rather than expunge them with devastation and fire, such tactics would earn the ire of the Primarch of the 6th Legion 
Lehman Russ for their flagrantly dishonorable manipulations of the will of their foes. Gathering knowledge from every corner of the galaxy, the Crimson King would pen a tome enriched with knowledge and arcanum of the warp, the Book of Magnus. Fastened to Magnus's armor in heavy golden chains, the book wrapped in the hide of a slain Psyche Nguyen would be for the eyes of the Crimson King alone. Breaching the Eldar webway with his scavenged knowledge, Magnus would ever further infringe upon the boundaries outlined by the Emperor. The Thousand Sons' obsession with claiming knowledge from conquered worlds would sow distrust among the Primarchs and their legions, for the 15th could not be trusted in indulging in knowledge in breach of the Imperial truth. Raising their concerns to the Master of Mankind, the Space Wolves, Death Guard, Imperial Fists and Raven Guard would demand reprisal for the Thousand Sons' abuse of sorcery. Convening the Council of Nikea, the Emperor would decide the fate of the Librarius within the Legions and be swayed by the Council of both Primarchs and Astartes invested in its cause. Magnus would champion the use of psychers within the Legions and despite a rousing speech before the assembled Conclave, his opposition would be vicious. The Primarch of the Death Guard, Mortarion, and representative of the Space Wolves, Ophir Weirdmake, would testify to the fraught dangers of the warp and sway the Emperor's decision. Outlawing the Librarius, the Master of Mankind would censure all use of psychers among the Legiones Astartes, a decision which would cement the Thousand Sun's destiny of betrayal. Infuriated with the Emperor's prohibition in the use of psychers, Magnus would seek a means to circumvent such a ruling. With the Orc menace routed during the decisive Battle of Ulanor, the Emperor would install his most cherished son, Horus Lupercal, to lead the Great Crusade in his absence. Returning to Holy Terra, the Master of Mankind would in secret attempt to claim the Eldar Webway for the Imperium's use in safe traversal of the galaxy in the stead of warp travel. Magnus would seek solace upon his homeworld of Prospero and seek a means to divine a future in which his legion would once again be free to harness their mastery of the Immaterium. Within his long meditations, Magnus would foresee a great ruination poised to sunder the Imperium. Horus Lupercal would turn against his father and plunge the galaxy into a war which would damn humanity to a future of endless war, suffering and ignorance. Unable to divine his own future and revealing that the War Master had already begun his corruption in the service to the ruinous powers, the Crimson King would in an act of desperation bring ruin to the future of humanity. With the aid of his Legion's greatest sorcerers, Magnus would attempt to contact the Emperor within his psychically fortified palace. Projecting himself to Holy Terror, Magnus would be prevented from contacting his father by a barrier constructed to keep out immaterial incursions. Accepting an offer of aid from an unknown entity within the warp to aid in his breach of the barrier, Magnus would naively accept the power of the Changer of Ways in the venture to tear through the psychic barrier. Bursting through the Emperor's throne room, Magnus's actions would allow for the tide of malevolent warp beings to spill through the tear in the palace's defenses. Corrupting the webway beyond all hope of salvation, the Crimson King had damned humanity to forever suffer void travel within the malevolent tides of the warp. Furious that his great work had been ruined, the Emperor would demand that Magnus face trial for his actions. Dispatching the Sixth Legion, the Space Wolves, under the command of their Primarch, Lehman Russ, the Emperor would order the Vilka Fenrica to bring Magnus to Terra. As Magnus's spirit returned to his mortal shell, he would be visited by the Architect of Fate, Sinch. Taunting the Crimson King that he shall serve as his champion, Magnus had failed to warn the Emperor of Horus' impending betrayal and doomed humanity to forever be cursed by the machinations of the Warp. As the Space Wolves neared ever closer to Prospero, the War Master would intercept their transmission and under the guise of loyalty to the Emperor, give new orders to the rout. Ordered to destroy the Thousand Sons with his detachment of Sisters of Silence and Legio Custodes, the Wolf King would have no reason to doubt the fealty of his trusted brother and accept his command. 
the Space Wolves would descend upon Prospero and burn its once beautiful vistas to ash. Magnus now understood that he had been manipulated by the powers of the warp, which he had time and again been warned to abstain. Deciding to sacrifice himself and his sons to deny the ruinous powers their prize, Magnus would no longer be a pawn of chaos. Allowing his homeworld to be razed to the ground, Magnus would hide the Sixth Legion's fleet from his men to hasten the demise of his people. Death reigned upon Tisca as the rout and their allies cut a sway through the streets of the once proud City of Light. Unable to accept responsibility for his actions, Magnus would not be capable of holding true to his own resolve and aid in his homeworld's defense. Confronting his brother, Lehman Russ, Magnus would battle the Wolf King in single combat. Protected with runic armor and the combined null power of the Sisters of Silence, Lehman Russ would face the Crimson King in a duel of steel alone. Shattering Russ's armor with a mighty punch of his fist, Magnus would further puncture one of the Wolf King's hearts. Yet such a strike had been a ruse, for Lehman would blind Magnus and after lifting the Crimson King across his knee, break the Primarch's spine. The Crimson King had fallen. His men had been slaughtered under his protection, and now his homeworld burned. Losing all hope of salvation or redemption, Magnus would surrender to the ruinous powers. Offering his fealty to the Changer of Ways, Magnus would pledge his soul to the being known as Sinch. By the will of the Lord of Change, the City of Light would be teleported to within the Eye of Terror. Upon a demon world of the Architect of Fate's choosing, Magnus would accept his bargain as a servant of the Ruinous Powers. Transforming into a demon prince of his patron, Magnus had relinquished his mortal form, which would shatter into fragments to ascend into a corporeal being. As the shards of Magnus were cast across the galaxy, each piece of the Crimson King's power would appear as mental projections to those whom sought his counsel. His primary form would remain on the demon planet of the sorcerers within the Immaterium, yet would deteriorate with the absent shards of his being. The Thousand Suns' first captain, Arzek Araman, would venture forth to retrieve the shards of Magnus. Obtaining all but one of the missing fragments, Araman would restore much of his gene father's power with the four reclaimed shards of his being. Bereft of the final shard, characterized by his humanity and good nature, Magnus would return to real space with his thousand sons to aid in the traitor war effort. Seeking out the final shard of his being on holy terror, the Crimson King would ally with the War Master by necessity alone. Joining the traitors at the muster point of Ulanor, Magnus and his remaining thousand sons would journey to holy terror. Absent from the battlefield, Magnus would orchestrate strategies aboard Horus's flagship the vengeful spirit for the traitors to breach the psychic barriers surrounding the Imperial Palace. Yet with the fall of the Lionsgate spaceport, Magnus would take to the field. Weakening the Emperor's psychic might and aiding his brother Mortarion, the Crimson King would bolster the traitors' assault before the great culmination of the war. As Mortarion and his Death Guard resumed their assault of the Imperial defenders, Magnus and his thousand sons would infiltrate the Imperial dungeons. Entering the Imperial Palace, Magnus would be confronted by Malkador the Sigilite and be informed that the final shard of Magnus was now beyond his reach. Imbued within the reborn last son of Prospero, Revuel Arvida, Magnus would never be whole again. Seemingly slaying the Sigilite, Magnus's fury would not be satisfied. Entering the chamber of the Golden Throne, the Emperor would sit immobile and vulnerable Aiming a psychic projectile to kill the master of mankind, Magnus's strike would be repelled by the Primarch of the 18th Legion, Vulcan. Denied his vengeance, Magnus and his thousand sons would battle the Salamanders and their gene father. However, during the fray, the Emperor would show Magnus a vision of a possible future. Magnus sat upon the Golden Throne blissfully drifting into the tides of the warp and its mysteries alongside his father. Powering the Imperial Webway, 
This vision of Magnus would guard the Imperium as the foundation for its dominion of the stars and long-reigning peace achieved by the Emperor. The loyal Primarchs now presided over humanity in its hard-won age of prosperity, peace and unending grandeur. Offering Magnus a chance to rejoin the fold of the Loyalists, the Emperor would claim that such a perfect future could still be achieved. Magnus had only to turn from the clutches of chaos and accept that his thousand sons could never be freed from the curse of the flesh change. Refusing his father's offer, Magnus would continue his attempt to end the Emperor's life. Pummeled into submission by the Lord of Drakes, Magnus would once again surrender the last shred of his soul to transcend fully into a being of the Immaterium. Banished by the anti-demonic wards of the chamber, the Crimson King would transform into a winged demonic entity. Once more clashing with Vulcan within the Imperial webway, Magnus would attempt to sway the loyal son of the Emperor, yet fail in his manipulations. Slaying the perpetual Primarch several times during their duel, Vulcan would not relent and be given new life with each mortal blow. Besting Magnus with sheer brute force and indomitable attrition, Vulcan would before disintegrating from a final desperate blast of psychic energy, crush Magnus's skull with his warhammer, Erdracul. With the Emperor's victory against the traitors to the throne, the pawns of chaos would retreat from holy terror. Fleeing to the planet of the sorcerers, the surviving Thousand Sons would for their defeat once more be afflicted with the curse of the flesh change. First Captain Arzek Araman would attempt to conjure a fell incantation to revoke the curse of his legion, yet further damn the Thousand Sons by transforming the psychically lacking members of the 15th into mindless automatons. Those whom proved worthy would be empowered and assume command of the so-called Rubric Marines and further fracture the 15th Legion. Magnus, now reformed from his banishment into the Warp, would grieve for the loss of more of his beloved sons by the careless meddling of sorcery. Seeking to punish his wayward son, Magnus would confront Araman upon the planet of sorcerers and demand blood for his callous actions. Yet Zinch would intervene and spare the life of the Sorcerer Lord. Banishing his first captain and ordering him to fulfill a quest to understand the warp to its full extent, Araman's actions had torn asunder the Legion into conflicting warbands. But despite the Thousand Sun's continual burdens, the Crimson King would rally those who remained loyal to his cause and seek penance for the loss of his homeworld. Emerging from the Immaterium during the 32nd millennium, Magnus would orchestrate the devastation of worlds throughout Imperial space. Hunted by the Great Wolf of the Sixth Legion, Harek Ironhelm, the Thousand Sons would evade the Space Wolf's persecution and assault their homeworld of Fenris. Despising the Sons of Rus for their chapter's past actions, Magnus would seek to raise Fenris in the manner of his own homeworld. Sieging the Space Wolf's fortress known by outsiders as the Fang, the Sixth Legion would endure the assault of the Thousand Sons for forty days. Awoken from his long slumber, the ancient venerable Dreadnought, Bjorn the Fell Handed, would lead his chapter on their survival of the invasion of the Crimson King, whilst the scout marines of the chapter would be dispatched to bring word of the assault to Harak Ironhelm. With the return of the Great Wolf, the Thousand Sons would be repelled. Wounding the Primarch of the Fifteenth, Harak would manage a valiant defiance against the Primarch, yet die during their brutal engagement. Yet the Ayat would stand, and with the reinforcement of Harak's men, the Thousand Sons would be driven from Fenris. Satisfied with destroying the gene stores of the Rout, Magnus would continue his plots to destroy the legacy of Lehman Russ. Returning to real space during the 41st millennium, Magnus would attempt to retrieve the holy relic of the chapter, the Spear of Russ. The Dionysian Spear would enable Magnus to revive his fallen sons, yet with the intervention of Ragnar Blackmane, such heretical rituals would be thwarted. Obsessed with the destruction of his most hated nemesis, Magnus would return once again during 999.M41 and enact the Siege of Fenris. Once more banished by the Great Wolf, Logan Grimnar, Magnus's relentless conquest of the Fenrisians would bear a heavy toll on the Sixth Legion. Yet despite his greatest efforts, 
the sons of Lehman Russ would endure and stand ever vigilant to face the Crimson King's campaigns. With Magnus's emboldening by humbling the walls of Fenris, he would soon find another foe to bring to heel. The Primarch of the Ultramarines, Rebute Gilliman, had returned to the faltering Imperium and begun his task of avenging the lost glory of humanity. During the Avenging Sun's Terran Crusade to return to the Throne World, Magnus would ambush his brother's fleet. Trapping Gilliman within the Maelstrom, the Primarch of the Ultramarines would regardless manage to escape the clutches of the Thousand Suns and would confront his once brother upon the moon of Luna. Dueling the Lord of Ultramar, Magnus would overwhelm the Primarch of the Thirteenth and seem poised to end the resurgence of the Emperor's solitary Beacon of Hope. Though Gilliman would not die this day, and with the aid of the Sisters of Silence, the Avenging Sun would impale the Crimson King with the Emperor's Divine Blade and banish Magnus once more into the Immaterium. Though Magnus remains a tireless fawn in humanity's side, relentless in his quest to one day crush the Imperium and seek retribution. Here I am in the flesh, and somehow there you are. Magnus cocked his head to one side and smirked. I don't remember you seeming so insignificant. Ten millennia have made you no less arrogant then, asked Gilliman, warily circling his towering foe. Inside his helm, a look of disgust twisted his patrician features as he regarded the monstrous form of the Crimson King. Certainly, those years have done you no other kindness. Magnus laughed. How could you have such grand plans and yet such scant vision has always eluded me? This, the demon Primarch said, empiric energy stirring as they gathered around his leveled glaive, is what a true power looks like. I see no power here, said Gilliman, shaking his head in dismay. I see corruption and enslavement to monsters that are worshipped as gods. On <laughs> that, Rebute, Magnus laughed, sparing a glance at the loyalist fighting nearby. Perhaps we can finally agree. The road to terror is open. The time has come for us to take the war to the Emperor in his most impregnable fastness. We will make immediate preparation for the invasion of terror and an assault on the Imperial Palace. Make no mistake, and it will be ours, my brothers. This will be no easy task, for the Emperor and his deluded followers will fight hard to prevent us from interfering with his plans for godhood. Doubtless, much blood has yet to be spilled, theirs and our own. But the prize is the galaxy itself. Are you with me? The Primarchs of his Imperium would exemplify the pinnacle of human creation. Demigods among mortal men, these titanic figures of the Imperium would lay the path for peace paved with the bones of the enemies of the Emperor. Yet while each Primarch would be legendary in their own right, one would be chosen as the first among equals and despite his favor, damn humanity's future. The Primarch of the 16th Legion, Horus Lupercal. Much of the origins of the being known as the Lupercal would be shrouded in mystery. Yet what is known is that the Primarch of the 16th Legion would be spirited to the planet of Cophonia during the scattering of the Primarchs by the ruinous powers. A mining world within close proximity to Holy Terror, the harsh environment of the young Primarch's homeworld would be rich in precious minerals. Ruled by tech barbarian criminal gangs, the Primarch of the 16th would quickly adapt to the now post-industrial hive cities and barren mines. Developing a rough, Cophonian accent from the inhabitants who influenced his youth, the Primarch would thrive among the violent gang wars of the planet until his ascension as a unifier of the disparate syndicates of the planet. Recorded by Imperial Records as the first Primarch to be found by the Master of Mankind, it would not take long for the Emperor to reunite with his protégé. Swiftly taken under the wing of the Emperor, the Primarch known as Horus Lupercal 
would be mentored in the methods of waging war and be privy to the master of mankind's plans to reunify humanity. As the Emperor formed alliances with the Mechanicum of Mars and began his conquest of the stars, Horus would learn from his father's conquests and prove a capable leader in his own right. Installed as the commander of the 16th Legion, the Lunar Wolves, Horus would stand by his father's side for 30 Terran standard years during the beginning of the conquest known by history as the Great Crusade. Drafting recruits from the rabble of Caphonia, Horus would mold his legion into the sharp claws of the Imperium's war machine. Their namesake proclaimed by the Master of Mankind, the Lunar Wolves would strike fear into the hearts of the Imperium's foes. With compliances gained as the momentum of the Great Crusade continued after 30 years of campaigning, reports of another Primarch's discovery would soon reach the notice of the Emperor. Granting Horus full command of the Principia Imperialis, Horus's first great test would be to continue the Great Crusade in the Emperor's absence. Proving his capabilities, Horus would continue to earn the favor of the Emperor as each of his lost brothers would be brought into the fold of the Imperium. Yet with each of his brother's appointment to lead their legions in the wake of the Lupercal, Horus would resolve to remain as the Emperor's most favored son. For 200 years, the Lunar Wolves would continue to bring worlds into compliance. Gaining the respect of each of their brothers, the deeds of their legions would not surpass the grandeur and glories of the vaunted 16th. Given opportunities to fight alongside his brothers in joint campaigns, Horus would combine the strengths of the legions in order to synergize and complement their specialities in warfare. A charismatic leader, Horus's legendary charisma would embolden the deeds of every subject of the Imperium and further increase humanity's dominion across the galaxy. Engaging newly conquered worlds in diplomacy enshrined in the cultural traditions of each unique world, Horus would treat with the new subjects of the Imperium in the manner befitting a venerable orator and statesman. Gifted an innate mastery of psychology, Horus would bring worlds into compliance utilizing minimal bloodshed by exploiting the hopes and fears of non-compliant civilizations. Empowering the most virtuous traits among his brother Primarchs and the subjects of his Imperium, Horus would facilitate the utmost efficiency in deployment of the Legiones Astartes and Imperial Army forces. Spurring the legions to ever greater proficiency and strength, Horus would sow the seeds of rivalry between rival legions in order to hone their potential. Deeds which would prove fatal in stoking hatred among the Legiones Astartes in the years to come. Yet despite the ever nearing culmination of the Great Crusade and unity thriving among the Legiones Astartes, a singular overwhelming threat loomed. The Greenskin Menace had spread like a plague among the stars. The largest empire of the Orc Xenos ever recorded had cut a sway through the Imperium strongholds led by their overlord, Erlach Erg. Rallying the Legiones Astartes, the Emperor would push back the greenskin tide with Horus at his side, as each Primarch brought their might to bear against the Xenos menace. Driving the Orcs back to the Ulanor system, the Emperor would end the threat of the Xenos before their numbers could once again burgeon. Deploying 100,000 Astartes, and eight million Imperial Army soldiers upon the world of Ulanor Prime, the Lupercal would lead the final battle of the Ulanor Crusade. Leading his Lunar Wolves and Army Regiments under his command to distract the Orcs upon the greater battlefield, Horus would assault the Great Tower of the Orc Capital. Alongside his elite Justair and First Company, Horus would face the Orc Overlord upon the peak of the tower and after besting the creature in single combat, cast its body from the tower. As its great carcass crashed and split upon the soil of Ulanor, the orcs would panic and be slaughtered by the lunar wolves. The Lupercal had proven to be the catalyst for the culmination of the Ulanor crusade and bested its champion. For his great victory, the Emperor would honor Horus for his deeds. Given the title of War Master by the Emperor, the new Commander-in-Chief of the Great Crusade would be gifted the Power Mace, Worldbreaker, as his new badge of office. The 16th Legion would be renamed as the Sons of Horus for their valor 
and bear their new insignia with pride. Horus had proven his worth as the first among equals and as War Master of the Imperium, lead the remainder of the Great Crusade with the authority of the Master of Mankind. Departing from the Great Crusade, the Emperor of Mankind would attend to his Imperial Webway project in secret as his chosen War Master continued his quest to persecute the war to unify humanity. Yet with the absence of the Emperor, Horus would be burdened with his new mantle of favor and begin his downfall from the Master of Mankind's grace. Uneasy with his ascensions above the esteem of the Primarchs, Horus would not be blind to the discontent and jealousy of his brothers. Though demigods among men, the Primarchs were not beyond petty rivalries to which Horus would attempt to quell the dissent brewing within the Legiones Astartes. Placating his more volatile brothers, Horus would continue his father's campaign under the scrutiny of the many generals of the war effort. Yet despite his accolades and favor, resentment would spark in the heart of the War Master. The Emperor had fled the Great Crusade to conduct an endeavor of the utmost secrecy as the War Master's victories would be attributed to his father's glory. The newly founded Council of Terror would rule on the Imperium with no counsel from the Primarchs. Bitterness and resentment would take root within the mind of the War Master, to which the malevolent powers of chaos would exploit. The first chaplain of the Word Bearers, Erebus, would install himself as a confidant to the War Master and whisper conflict into his advisements to Horus. Subtle in his twisting of the Lupercal's morality, Erebus would enact the plots of his patron gods with guile and linguistic subterfuge. Manipulating the loyalties of the Fraternity of the Mornaval within the 16th Legion, Erebus would tend to their resentment of the Emperor's treatment of the War Master. Upon the moon of the planet Davin, such treacheries would unfold. Once a compliant world, Davin had fallen to the clutches of the Plague God through the corruption of Horus's once close ally, Planetary Governor, Eugen Temba. Armed with the Xenos artifact, the Kinebrak Anaphame, the plot of Erebus would culminate in the duel between Temba and the War Master. Horus would be wounded by the chaos-empowered form of Eugen Temba, the corrupted blade of the Anaphame poisoning the War Master with an otherworldly infection. As Horus slew the Thrall of Nurgle, he would collapse and fall into a coma. Brought to the 16th Legion's apothecaries by the Mornival, the ministration of the Sons of Horus's medical technologies would prove insufficient in restoring their Primarch. The War Master worsened with each passing moment as the virulent curse within him drained his remaining vitality. In an act of desperation, the Mornaval would enact the Council of First Chaplain Erebus and bring their Primarch's body to the Temple of the Serpent Lodge upon Davin's moon. Warrior Lodges had already been installed within the Legiones Astartes by the Word Bearers in order to further corrupt the Astartes of the Legions, to which the Sons of Horus were no exception. Entrusting Horus's body to the Davonite priests, the War Master's soul would be delivered before the Gods of Chaos and become corrupted by the rituals and sorceries of the Chaos Cultists. Horus's soul would be submerged within the Immaterium and bear witness to nightmarish visions of humanity's future. The Emperor of the Grim Dark Future would be worshipped as a god, and the War Master would be ignorant of his own meddling in this portent of humanity's fate. Portraying themselves as victims with no stake in the matters of the material world, the beings of the Warp would entice Horus by fueling his long-harbored bitterness. The Spectre of Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Sons, would attempt to sway Horus from the path of damnation. Explaining that the future he foresaw could be avoided, Magnus would beseech the War Master from listening to the whispers of chaos. Yet Horus's jealousy would not be abated, and with a pact pledged in the name of the Dark Gods, the War Master would accept the bargain offered by the ruinous powers. Slay the Emperor, and the galaxy shall be yours. Reborn as the Champion of Chaos Undivided, Horus Lupercal would renounce the Emperor and begin his descent into madness. 
forming alliances with the Primarchs embittered to the Emperor, Horus would use his charisma to nurture the resentments sown deep within his brother's hearts. Bringing the World Eaters, Death Guard and Emperor's children into the fold, Horus would begin his great plot to overthrow the Imperium. Dispatching orders to the Ultramarines, Dark Angels and Blood Angels to the far corners of the galaxy on crusades to delay their involvement, the White Scars and Imperial Fists would prove too distant to influence the start of the Great War for Humanity. Purging the Loyalists within the ranks of his Legion and those of his allies, the blood of the noble warriors of the Emperor would salt the earth of Istvan free. Despite his efforts to conceal his betrayal from the Emperor, fragments of the Loyalists within the Traitor Legions would escape the War Master's grasp. Knowing reprisal would be swift, Horus would enact commands to contain and convert the Emperor's legions. Magnus the Red would, in his attempt to warn the Emperor of the War Master's impending betrayal, ruin the Master of Mankind's Imperial Webway project and bring censure to his own legion. Dispatching the Emperor's children to attempt to bring the Iron Hands into the fold and manipulating the Primarchs Conrad Kurz, Pertorabo, and Alfarius to join the traitor war effort, the War Master's mastery of planning and conquest would prove invaluable to his cause. With the aid of the Word Bearers and persecution of the Thousand Sons at the hands of the Wolves of Fenris, the War Master's gambit would unfold. The resolute Loyalist legions of the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard would hurl themselves into the fray and for their fervor be crushed. Ferris Manus, Primarch of the Iron Tenth, would be slain. Vulcan had been captured, and Corvus Corax had fled. Yet many battles lay ahead for the War Master in his inexorable campaign to defeat the Emperor. Convening the conclave of the Primarchs aboard his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, Horus would address his brothers. With the exception of the Alpha Legion Primarch Alpharius, the traitor Primarchs would begin to deliberate their strategy to destroy the Imperium. Many of their number had already submitted to the thrall of Chaos, and in doing so, pledged their allegiance to the ruinous powers. Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's Children, had become possessed with a demonic entity, whilst Magnus the Red had surrendered to the Changer of Ways in the wake of the burning of Prospero. Lorgar Aurelian had unwittingly been a patron of the Chaos Gods from his worship of the old faith of his homeworld, and within the ranks of Mortarion's Death Guard, and Angron's World Eaters, the presence of Chaos had begun to fester. An assortment of renegades, pawns of the ruinous powers, and psychotic madmen would stand against the glory of his Imperium, with Horus installed as the favoured general of the Dark Gods. The War Master would task his legions with campaigns to persecute across the stars. The Imperial Fist Retribution Fleet would be crippled by the Iron Warriors, the Death Guard would attempt to bring the White Scars into the ranks of the Rebellion, and the Word Bearers would trap the 1st, 9th, and 13th Legions within a warp-devised cage. The Tech Priests of Mars would wage a civil war, whilst the Legio Titanica, Knight Houses, and Imperial Army Regiments would pledge to join or resist the call to arms of the War Master. Three Loyalist Legions had already been broken beyond all hope of restoring to their former might. But the war for humanity would be fought and lost at the throne world of Holy Terror. Yet the Emperor would not stand idle as his Imperium burned, and with the aid of Malkador the Sigilite, attempt to end the Horus Heresy before it could gain further momentum. The Loyalist to the throne now stood at the knife's edge of the war. Severely outmaneuvered with the annihilation of the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard, the Loyalists would be put on a defensive footing. The Imperial Fist would fortify the throne world as the Shattered Legions fought a desperate guerrilla warfare campaign against the traitors. The Ultramarines, Dark Angels, White Scars, and Blood Angels were cut off from the wider Imperium, and the Space Wolves had incurred heavy losses from their persecution of the Thousand Sons. Malkador the Sigilite would begin his Shadow War against the traitors, whilst the Master of Mankind tended to the demonic incursions spawned from Magnus's destruction of the Imperial Webway project. The Imperium now faced its greatest trial, for it would take the toil of every loyal soul to deny the traitors their prize. 
though one weakness could be exploited within the Traitor Rebellion. Should the War Master perish, the Traitor War effort would collapse, for only Horus could unify such a disparate band of duplicitous degenerates. Dispatching the Assassin Clays, Malkador would orchestrate countless missions to slay the Arch Traitor. Yet with every failed assassination, Horus would be further emboldened in his cause to slay the Emperor. Contacting the Black Shields of the Fangs of the Emperor and founding the Knights Errant, comprised of the estranged and betrayed sons of the Legiones Astartes, Malkador would not relent in his attempts to kill the War Master. Recruiting former Lunar Wolves of the 16th Legion into his clandestine order, individuals such as Severian, Eacton Cruz, and Garviel Loken would seek to exploit the weaknesses known of their estranged legion. Alongside the Primarch of the 6th Legion, Lehman Russ, Malkador would plot and order the Wolf King to attempt one final strike against the War Master. A kill team of the Knights Errant would board the Vengeful Spirit and with the Lunar Wolves' knowledge of the 16th Legion, lay a path within the ship for the Space Wolves to assault the War Master's throne room. During the Battle of Molek, the kill team and their commander, the outcast son of Horus, Garviel Loken, would infiltrate the Vengeful Spirit. Captured and brought to the Lupercal court, Loken would face his gene father and be given an offer to rejoin the War Master's Legion. Defying his once noble father, Loken and his surviving knights errant would escape from their captors. For his battle brother, Braw Tearfinger, had lain Fufark runes for his gene kin and enabled a path for the future assault of the Sixth Legion. The wolves would strike during the Battle of Tresolian, and with the aid of Braw, the rout would seek to slay the War Master. Boarding the vengeful spirit, Russ would lead his men to the heart of the flagship and strike against Horus. Wielding the Dionysian spear, the Wolf King would manage to pierce the War Master's armor and wound Horus. Forged by the Emperor's own hand, the so called Spear of Russ would contain a portion of the Emperor's power and reveal the truth to any who would be cut from its edge. Horus would be cleansed of the corruption of chaos and for a moment return to his true self. No longer a thrall of the ruinous powers, Horus would, despite such a revelation, choose to remain opposed to the Imperium. Rejecting Lehman's offer to return to Holy Terror, Horus would attempt to slay the Wolf King. Yet the valor of the rout would hold true as hundreds of Astartes swarm the War Master and drag Lehman's body from the battle. The Sixth Legion would sacrifice their lives to save their Primarch, but at the cost of the vast majority of their remaining strength. Horus had been vulnerable and were it not for the hesitation of the Wolf King, would have died at the hands of Russ. Yet the wound inflicted by the Dionysian Spear would send the War Master into a coma, to which he may never recover. The ruinous powers would fight and clamor for the soul of their champion. Deep within the Immaterium, Horus's very soul would fight an endless battle to remain in control of his being, yet his legion would not stand idle. The War Master's equerry, Malagurst the Twisted, would attempt a ritual to reunite his genefather's soul with his body. Defended by Callus Echidon, the twisted son of Horus would leave his mortal body and delve into the Immaterium. Finding his father's fractured soul, Malagurst would beseech his liege to return to the material realm. Concluding the ritual, Malagurst would impale the wound Horus had sustained from the Spear of Rus with his own Aphame dagger. Sacrificing his own soul for his father, Malagurst would succeed in freeing Horus and once more install him as War Master of the Horus Heresy. Resuming control of the legions, Horus would rally the traitor Primarchs for their final assault of the throne world. Enacting the Battle of Terror, the traitor legions would descend upon the Sol system. Reaping untold millions of souls as the defense fleets of Luna were sundered by the traitor's guns, the traitors would begin their infamous siege of Holy Terror. Days of bombardments would hearken the countless drop pods which rained from the skies as heretics, butchers, zealots and warmongers descended upon the Imperial Palace. Titans unleashed their fury upon the walls of the Imperium's dauntless bastions 
as billions of soldiers hurled their worthless bodies into the munitions of the Emperor's devoted subjects. Horus would watch as his merciless harrying of the palace brought ground for his men, inch by bloody inch. For the traitors would not be invulnerable from the reinforcements of the Dark Angels, Space Wolves, and Ultramarines, should their siege tarry too long. The Emperor's forces were giving ground as each minute passed, yet the traitors had taken many losses and could not hope to survive should they be trapped between the palace defenders and the impending retribution of the 1st, 6th, and 13th legions. The Siege of Terror had stalled, and with the withdrawal of the Iron Warriors, banishment of Angron and Mortarion, and the disorganized Emperor's children indulging in their own debased atrocities, the War Master would not be able to breach the Imperial Palace before the impending assault of the Ultramarines. Challenging the Emperor to face him in single combat, Horus would lower the shields of the Vengeful Spirit and the Loyalist Primarchs Rogal Dawn, Sanguinius, and the Emperor would teleport upon the War Master's flagship and battle to decide the fate of humanity. Sanguinius, Primarch of the Blood Angels, would confront his once cherished brother and would behold the fell glory of the War Master of Chaos. Bloated with power, should Horus slay the Emperor, he would ascend as the fifth god of the ruinous powers, alike to the birth of the creature born from the downfall of the Eldari. Knowing his fate to be destined to die at the hands of Horus, the great angel would regardless launch himself into a battle to the death against his brother. Damaging the War Master's armor, Sanguinius would be unable to wound the Champion of Chaos, and in the attempt to slay him, fall to the Talon of Horus. Finding his noble son at the feet of the War Master, the Master of Mankind would face the Dark King. Proclaiming that he would spare the Emperor should he kneel before him, Horus would bask in his delusion. Yet the Master of Mankind would declare that Horus was nothing more than a slave to darkness, of which there would be no hope of redemption. Bolts of psychic energy would spill from the War Master as he charged into a duel with the Emperor. Within the throne room of the Vengeful Spirit, the two gods of humanity would clash for the fate of the Imperium's destiny. Restraining his immense strength, the Emperor would be unwilling to bring his full might against his once most beloved son, and for his hesitation, be wounded by the War Master. Disarming the Emperor, Horus would gouge his father's eye, tear his right arm from its socket, and break the Emperor's spine over his knee. Gloating at his victory, Horus's dominion would be achieved, yet it would be the action of a mortal man who would deny the War Master. Standing between the Emperor and the War Master, the Stoic soul would stare into the eyes of Horus and refuse to be cowed. Ripped apart for his insolence by the psychic power of the War Master, such an act of defiance would galvanize the Emperor's resolve. Summoning his remaining strength without restraint, the Emperor would unleash his full psychic might and rend the Dark King from existence. Realizing his folly for a singular moment before his death, Horus would shed a single tear before his soul was eradicated. The traitors would retreat from terror and be forever shamed for their hubris in attempting to usurp the master of mankind. With exception to the 17th Legion, the traitors would disband and fragment into warbands bearing no allegiance to a champion in the place of their slain war master. The first captain of the Sons of Horus, Ezekiel Abaddon, would abandon his father's legacy and seek answers for his purpose within the tattered carcass of what remained of the galaxy. Horus Lupercal's lifeless body would be taken to the world of Malium and enshrined upon the demon world. Yet the ever duplicitous Emperor's children would during the dawn of the 31st millennium enact the slave wars as the scraps of the traitors fought over the dominion of their tattered ranks. Fabius Bile, chief apothecary of the 3rd Legion, would steal the body of the Lupercal and conduct experiments in order to clone the Primarch to once again lead the traitors in their quest to destroy the Imperium. Yet as the Spider conducted his research, Ezekiel Abaddon would return to the 16th Legion and proclaim himself to be the inheritor to his father's failure. Installing himself as the new War Master of Chaos, 
the Despoiler would reforge his men into the accursed Black Legion and lead them to assault the Emperor's children fortress. The clone of Horus would be released from its confinement, and Abaddon would look upon the reborn visage of his father. Armed with the Talon of Horus, Abaddon would destroy his father's seal of office, Worldbreaker, and plunge the blades of his Talon within the chest of the clone. Firing a volley of bolter rounds from the Talon's Storm Bolter within Horus's chest cavity, the reborn Lupercal would be eviscerated by the blast. The time of Horus Lupercal was over, for a new warrior would assume the mantle of War Master and continue the 16th Legion's quest for vengeance. Strange is it not, that so many I wish besides me stand against me, while at my back are only the flawed and damaged. I am a master of broken monsters. Slowly, he began to circle the edge of the great hololithic table, the sound of his footsteps lost in the echoing silence. I cannot control them or their sons, and they know it. Mortarion and Perturabo and the rest, they can all feel it. They all know that this war is no longer something that can be guided, only ridden out. But they never understood me, not truly, and they understand less with each passing second. They doubt. They think that I have lost my way. I can see it in their hearts, the pettiness, the pride, the seeds of ruin driving them on, feeding the tempest. With such creatures, must I remake the future? He stopped again at the foot of the throne and reached out, his hand closed over Worldbreaker's haft. With casual ease, he raised it up so that the chamber's thin light caught every dent and scar on the polished metal. A thousand battles, ten thousand, ten times, ten times, ten thousand, to bring about the new age. All of the certainties of the past torn down, all the beliefs that made them turned to ash. War on every front, stretched across time until none can know when the final blow will come. There is no disaster, for all disasters serve me alone. The storm rises, only so that the thunderbolt may fall. It does not matter how the galaxy burns, only that it does. War Master, that is what it means, my brother. The strength to do what must be done. All I ever wanted was the truth. Remember those words as you read the ones that follow. I never set out to topple my father's kingdom of lies from a sense of misplaced pride. I never wanted to bleed the species to its marrow, reaving half the galaxy clean of human life in this bitter crusade. I never desired any of this, though I know the reasons for which it must be done. But all I ever wanted was the truth. The Primarchs of his Imperium would instill loyalty and fealty within the hearts of mankind. Paragons of humanity, capable of sundering empires and uplifting civilizations, the charisma, charm, and deeds of the sons of the Emperor would never be exceeded by mortal men. Yet their exceptional power would not only hasten his Imperium's rise, but also its catastrophic downfall. For today, we shall elucidate the architect of the Horus Heresy and devastation of the Imperium of Man, the Primarch of the 17th Legion, Lorgar Aurelian. With the scattering of the Primarchs across the stars, the young child of the 17th Legion would be cast to the planet of Colchis. A world rife with superstition and religious ideology, the subjects of the planet would bask in the rays of the heat of the sun and worship fell gods steeped in feudal tradition. Once a technologically sophisticated world, cultures had stooped to the zealous fervor of the ruinous powers taught by its people as the Old Faith. Disease, war and tyrants would rise and fall in the ebb and flow of the planet's historical record and its people would learn to accept their lot in life. Yet with the arrival of the child of the Emperor, 
the planet's transformation would begin. Discovered by the peoples, known as the Declined, their chieftain, Fan Morgal, would name the Primarch Lorgar, the Raincaller. Quickly maturing, within the span of 17 days, Lorgar had grown to the size of a young child and would meet the first of his mentors to set him on the path of damnation. Corpharon, an exiled priest of the planet's ruling religious sect, the Covenant, would pass through the encampment of the Declined. Seeing the favor of his patron gods within the young boy, Corpharon would convince the Primarch to become his disciple. Murdering Fan Morgul and the Declined peoples, Corpharon would hide the origins of his now adopted charge and begin to convert the young Primarch to his beliefs. Physically and mentally abusive in his methods of tutoring, Corpharon would mold the boy into a convert of the old faith with a peerless understanding of its fell teachings. Incorporating his own belief that there was a being known as the One, Lorgar would transform his understanding of the old faith from a polytheistic doctrine into a monotheistic religion. Dismissing the Primarch's notion of the One, Corpharon would continue to abuse his foster son for his belief and so deep within Lorgar's psyche, a perverse dependency to his guardian. With time, Lorgar would grow in stature and be beyond the physical torments of his father. Pathologically loyal to Corpharon, Lorgar's prowess as an orator would garner the Raincaller many followers. Known as the Godsworn, Lorgar's ever-expanding band of zealots would soon challenge the dominance of the Covenant. Naming their leader the Bearer of the Word, Lorgar's Godsworn would liberate the downtrodden slaves of the planet across its settlements and march for the capital city of Varadesh. Lorgar's army would descend upon the city of Grey Flowers, and after conducting a sermon at the gates of Varadesh, the low caste priests within would open the gates to the city. Presenting the corpses of the ruling ecclesiarchs of the Covenant before Lorgar, the bearer of the word would not stand idle as he commanded his godsworn to conquer each neighboring city. Converting swathes of cultures to his cause, Lorgar would preach his faith to his disciples. For years, the Godsworn would battle the heretics to their faith, and with time, Lorgar would descend to become the ruler of Colchis. Proclaiming his foster father, Corpharon, as the new High Priest of the Covenant, Lorgar would look to the stars for the arrival of the One. Seeing visions of a being clad in bronze armor, accompanied by a towering cyclops, Lorgar would see to the proclamation of his portents of the future. Members of the Covenant would decry such teachings, and as a schism grew within its ranks, its leaders would attempt to arrest Lorgar for his heretical views. Yet upon attempting to seize the Raincaller, Lorgar's disciples would tear his assailants limb from limb in a deranged frenzy to protect their prophet. A holy war would erupt upon Colchis and bathe its citizens in blood for six years. Storming the Cathedral of Illumination, and killing the dissident monks within, Lorgar and his godsworn would enact their great purge across the planet and follow their new archpriest in their devotion to the One. Knowing his true name to be the Emperor, Lorgar would await the salvation of his people by his prophesied god, safe in the knowledge that his arrival would be imminent. The Emperor would descend upon cultures during 857.M30 a solar year after Lorgar's conquest of his homeworld. Accompanied by his son, Magnus the Red, the master of mankind would meet with the bearer of the word. Falling to his knees, Lorgar would praise the being before him as his people in unison knelt before their messiah. The true god of mankind had descended from the heavens, and on this momentous day, the people of Colchis would be enraptured by his visage. Accepting his long-lost son with open arms, the Emperor would install Lorgar as the leader of the 16th Legion, the Imperial Heralds, and task the Raincaller with joining the Great Crusade. Accepting his offer with vigor, Lorgar would venture into the stars, proclaiming the divinity and salvation offered by his father. Admonishing Lorgar's treatment of his stature as a god, the Emperor would nonetheless allow the newly renamed Word Bearers and their Primarch to wage their campaigns across the galaxy. 
reorganizing the 17th Legion into a force of relentless scions of the Emperor's divinity, Lorgar would allow for his guardian Corferon to undergo surgeries to ascend to the stature befitting his most trusted counsel. Putting non-compliant worlds to the sword should they reject the Emperor's emancipation, the word bearers would be merciless in their application of violence to any whom would object to the master of mankind's divinity. Punishing blasphemy, heresy, and idolatry of pagan superstition, the 17th Legion would cleanse the galaxy with purging flame. The word bearers' campaigns would stall by virtue of their ritualistic sermons and spectacles of worship, and for their willing ignorance of the demands of the Great Crusade and their emperor, the word bearers would be punished. Unquestionable in their loyalty, the word bearers would nonetheless prove to embody every one of the greatest flaws at odds with the imperial truth of the Imperium. Unable to allow their zealous ways to continue, the master of mankind would summon the Ultramarines Legion and their Primarch, Rebute Gilliman, to censure the 17th. Upon the world of Kerr, the entire might of the 13th Legion, alongside the Legio Custodes, would descend upon the planet city of Monarchia. The Emperor and his most trusted advisor, Malkador the Sigilite, would confront the Urizen. A symbol of the word bearer's religious devotion, Monarchia epitomized every flaw that the Imperial truth espoused to prevent. Worshipping the Emperor as a god, the so-called perfect city, teeming with cathedrals and places of worship, was an affront to every ideal the Imperium stood for. Ordering the Ultramarines to raise the city to the ground, though reluctant with his orders, Primarch Rebute Gilliman would comply. Lorgar and his legion would be forced to kneel as they helplessly watched their perfect city burn at the hands of the Emperors and forces. Humiliated by the 13th Legion, the word bearers would be shamed by the Legion encapsulating the Imperial Truth's teachings to the letter. Lorgar had failed his people, his Legion, the Imperium, and most of all, his father. Boundless grief would be sown deep within Lorgar's very soul as he watched his cathedrals of stained glass and marble fall to the gunfire of the Ultramarines. Lorgar's devotion to his father would be ripped from his heart, and in the wound which took its place, a festering resentment would bloom. For the Golden One would never forget this slight upon his Legion, and would slowly begin to plot revenge for the destruction of the paradise he had created. Withdrawing from the public eye of the Great Crusade, the word bearers would stew in their disgrace. Their devotion to the Emperor as a living benevolent god had been proven false and shaken their purpose to the core. Unable to accept responsibility for his own failings, Lorgar Aurelian would venture into the galaxy to find answers befitting his ego. The ruinous powers would call to the Eurozone, for their influence had always been rooted within the Primarch's upbringing, from his adoption into the Old Faith. Offering atonement for his doubts in the Emperor, the forces of Chaos would speak through the honeyed words of Corferon and the first chaplain of the word bearers, Erebus. Resolving to seek out the beings whom had called to him, Lorgar would pilgrimage alongside his 1301st expeditionary fleet to the Cadia system. Watched closely by five members of the Legio Custodes, appointed by the Emperor, Lorgar would descend upon the world of Cadia and meet with the barbaric human tribes upon its surface. Met by the purple-eyed inhabitants of the planet, Lorgar would speak with the leader of the cultists, a female priestess known as Ingafell. Conducting a ritual by sacrificing the custodians and Darfa, Ingafell would transform into a being of chaos and whisper lies into the ears of the Urizen. Stating that the Aldari race had birthed the being known as Slanesh into existence and through ignorance and fear, abandoned their new patron's majesty. Grieving for the rejection of its divinity, she who firsts would punish the Eldar for their transgression. This deception would fuel Lorgar's naivety as Ingafell imparted a warning that should humanity wish to survive extinction, they must not follow in the Eldar's footsteps and submit themselves to the worship of Chaos and its pantheon of gods. The word bearers dispatched to the Eye of Terror within orbit of Cadia would return to their Primarch, transformed by the ruinous powers and bearing word 
of their own revelations. Believing the lies of Ingefell, Lorgar would order his warships to bombard Cadia in order to conceal the knowledge of the primordial truth. He alone would be the herald of the gods of chaos, and through their influence, the Eurizen would achieve vengeance against the Emperor. Unsatisfied with his knowledge of the primordial beings of the Immaterium, Lorgar would venture into the heart of the Eye of Terror. Piloting a Stormbird into the heart of the storm, Lorgar would be accompanied by Ingefell as his demonic guide. Upon the remnants of the Eldar craft world, Zulasa, the Raincaller would observe the carcass left in the wake of the birth of Slanesh and be confronted by an avatar of the Eldar, Cain. The ruined being of former divinity stood before the Urizen, and with his crozius mace, Illuminarum, Lorgar would bludgeon the avatar to its painful end. Demanding further insight from Ingefell, Lorgar would be transported through space and time to the Eternity Gate of the Emperor's Imperial Palace. Granted a vision of the Siege of Terror, the Urizen would watch as thousands of Phasmantagoria of the Legiones Astartes bled and died around him. Rogal Dawn, Primarch of the Imperial Fists, led his men against a horde of barbaric space marines clad in arterial red. They were his sons, their slate grey supplanted with shades of freshly spilled blood. They had cast aside their old beliefs and reinvigorated with new purpose, sought to bring the Imperium to heal. Watching his Astartes transform into demonically possessed warriors, Lorgar would marvel at their terrible might. At their vanguard, his most blessed son, Argul Tal, would charge against the great angel, Sanguinius, and perish as they clashed. This glorious promise of the future would impress upon the Primarch as his mind began to process what he had seen. Yet another vision would be gifted to Lorgar of the homeworld of the Crimson King. Prospero burned at the hands of the rout, to which Lorgar would be horrified that such a destiny would befall the Thousand Sons. Lorgar would enact the war of vengeance against the Emperor, though he would never be its leader. He would be its witness. The Emperor would pay for the treatment of his deeds, and the word bearers would lead the charge to rend the still beating heart from the Imperium. Each Primarch in his place would rule the Imperium or corrupt it to their own cause, but not Lorgar. Lorgar would destroy it completely and forge a new future from the ashes. Returning to the material realm, Lorgar would begin his slow treachery against the Imperium. Sowing the seeds of betrayal within the hearts of his Primarch brethren, the catalyst of the civil war of humanity, Horus Lupercal would be the linchpin to sunder the Imperium. Ordering his first chaplain, Erebus, to stand at the side of the War Master, the plot to corrupt the champion of the Emperor would with time be achieved. Forty years after his venture into the Eye of Terror, Lorgar would join Horus in his betrayal of the Master of Mankind. Aiding in the purge of the Loyalist elements within the Traitor Legions upon the world of Istvan Free, the Word Bearers would relish the chance to sate their blades in the blood of the Emperor's subjects. Achieving further reprisal against the Loyalist counterattack of the Emperor on the world of Istvan V, Lorgar would assemble commanders from the Iron Warriors, Night Lords, and Alpha Legion in their alliance to join the War Master's Rebellion. Employing his skill as an orator, Lorgar would further embolden the resentments harbored within the Lord of Iron, Night Haunter, and Hydra. Taking to the field during the Dropside Massacre, the Urizen would lead his men in their holy war against the Emperor's staunch defenders. Turning on their allies, the second wave of the Legion's assault would surround the Loyalists and massacre their amassed strength. Engaging the Salamanders and Raven Guard, the Word Bearers would unleash their armored vehicles against the exposed ranks of the 18th and 19th Legions. Seeking to staunch the wound inflicted to his forces, the Raven Lord, Corvus Corax, would charge into the skirmish and confront Lorgar. Carving a path through the Word Bearers, Corax would duel the Urizen and prove to be more than a match for the Primarch, known for his lack of martial prowess. Impaled through the stomach by Corax's talons, Lorgar, through desperation to survive, would break his brother's nose with a strike of his skull 
until the blades within him would be retracted. Fated to die, the Eurizen would with the intervention of the Night Haunter be spared, though for the remainder of his life bear the wounds to his face clawed by the Raven Lord. Healing from his grievous wounds, Lorgar would join the War Master aboard the Sons of Horus flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, as the deliberations of the Conclave of the Primarchs began. Nine Primarchs had been mustered to wage war against the Imperium, yet already signs of change within them had begun. Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's children, had become possessed by a demon, whilst Magnus the Red now bore power gifted by the Changer of Ways. Disgusted at his brother Fulgrim's total submission to a lesser being, Lorgar's notion of symbiotic cooperation with the forces of chaos would be challenged by the presence of this husk of the Phoenician. Storming from the chamber, Lorgar would return to his own flagship, the Fidelitas Lex. Conversing with the Crimson King, Magnus the Red, Lorgar would reveal his knowledge of the fall of the Eldari and the birth of the Prince of Pleasure. Cautioned by his brother not to indulge too deeply with his manipulations of the powers of the warp, Magnus would warn his brother that such dealings would invite malicious interlopers from the Immaterium. Ignoring the Crimson Lord's counsel, Lorgar would meet with the War Master to discuss their next objective in their crusade against the Imperium. The Ultramarines would prove to be the gravest threat posed to their rebellion, and for them to succeed, the Lords of Ultramar must be kept from interfering. The treachery of the Word Bearers had been contained within Istvan, yet it would not take long for the 17th to show their intent. Travelling to the Kalf system under the guise of reconciliation, the Word Bearers would meet with the Ultramarines. Fueled with the memory of their once proud city of Monarchia, the Word Bearers would parley with the Ultramarines until their time to strike would be ordered. Led by Corferon, the warships of the 17th would bombard the docked Ultramarines' vessels and in a surprise attack, slaughter the unaware and vulnerable Astartes. Annihilating clusters of the fleet of Ultramar, the Word Bearers' revenge would be achieved. As droves of demons would be summoned into the system by rituals and sacrifices, Corferon's men would jettison Rebute Gilliman into the vacuum of space, yet be unable to slay the stalwart son of the Emperor. As the 13th Legion retaliated, the Word Bearers would poison the son of Kalf and summon a gigantic warp storm to entrap the Ultramar system. The ruined storm would spread its wicked tendrils across the stars alike to a great wound. Yet Lorgar's hunger for vengeance would not be sated. Simultaneously, Lorgar's forces and the World Eaters Legion would rampage across the Ultramar system as they harried the populaces to mark their Shadow Crusade. Further draining the Ultramarines of resources and able-bodied souls, the barbarism of the Shadow Crusade would stall with the worsening state of the Primarch of the Twelfth Legion, Angron. The 500 worlds had been bled, yet upon the Lord of Red Sand's homeworld, the Eurizen would search for a means to cure his brother of his affliction, the Butcher's Nails. Finding no balm for his dying brother upon Nyseria, the 12th and 17th Legion would butcher the High Riders and rabble of the planet. Yet with their haste to cure Angron, the Ultramarines had regrouped and tracked the Shadow Crusade's leaders to the world of Nuseria. The retribution fleet of the Ultramarines would destroy Lorgar's flagship, the Fidelitas Lex, and led by their Primarch, descend upon Angron's homeworld. Facing his most hated brother in combat, Lorgar would attempt to slay Rebute Gilliman, yet prove no match against the Lord of Ultramar. Before the killing blow could be dealt, Angron would launch himself into the fray and battle Gilliman. Their clash would enrage the Primarch of the World Eaters, as a misstep of Gilliman would crush the skull of one of Angron's long-dead comrades-in-arms as it fell from a bandolier of his armor. Drawing upon Angron's rabid grief, the Eurozone would feel the presence of the Gods of Chaos and enact a ritual to transform his brother into the avatar of the Blood God, Korn. The ascension of the Red Angel would force the Ultramarines to retreat, and with the 13th once more withdrawn from the conflict, Lorgar would turn his attentions to the final battle to decide the fate of humanity. Lorgar had proven to be a worthy conduit for the will of the Ruinous Powers. A true disciple of the Gods of Chaos, 
Rorgar would resent Horus for his failure to fully submit to their will. Foreseeing that only through total surrender to their patron gods would victory against the Emperor be achieved, Lorgar would plot to overthrow Horus to become the War Master. Confiding his plans to his Dark Apostle, Sardu Lyak, and the Primarch of the Third Legion, Fulgrim, Lorgar would meet with Horus Lupercal aboard the Vengeful Spirit. The War Master had fallen during the Battle of Beta Garmon by a wound of the Dionysian Spear. Lehman Russ, Primarch of the Space Wolves, had delivered the blow and come close to slaying the Champion of Chaos. In orbit of Ulanor, as the traitors mustered their remaining forces to assault Holy Terror, the Eurozen would attempt his coup. Though with forewarning from the Crimson Apostle, Horus would attack Lorgar and prevent his betrayal from being achieved. Beaten to within an inch of his life, the Eurozen would be banished from the Warmaster's sight and ordered to not interfere with the remainder of the Horus heresy. Retreating from the amassed fleet of the Warmaster, Lorgar would be slain should he ever return to the presence of the Lupercal. Decrying the war to be lost beyond all hope of salvation, the bearer of the word's ravings would with time be proven true. The War Master would fail in his rebellion to overthrow the Imperium, and in the wake of his civil war, damn humanity to wage an endless struggle of survival. Lorgar would in the millennia following ascend to the form of a demon prince of chaos undivided, and seek penance for his failure to conquer humanity in the name of his patrons. His faith had been rewarded, yet his pledge to the Dark Gods still remained unfulfilled. Isolating himself within the Templum and Physio upon the demon world of Sicarus, the Eurozone to this day has not been interrupted in his meditations. However, rumors stir that the Archpriest of the Primordial Truth has been harried by the Raven Lord of the 19th Legion and after a bitter duel, followed by years of isolation, the Eurozen embarks upon the material realm once more. Leading his legion to bring his wretched sermons and litanies to worlds unfortunate enough to stand in his path and convert any willing to surrender their souls to his foul benefactors. Lorca wrote something several years ago that nourished my thoughts each day and night since he shared it with me. The World Eater snorted, showing just what he thought of his pious, Scrivener brother's musings, but Russ was unfazed. It was not that corruption is recognized, Russ quoted. It must be opposed. It is not enough that ignorance is acknowledged. It must be defied. Win or lose, what matters is making us stand for the virtues we will bequeath to the human race. When this galaxy is finally ours, We'll hold a worthless prize if we plant the last Aquila on the last day on the last world, having led humanity into moral darkness. Angron listened, but cared little. Even then he was a stubborn creature, taking spiteful pride in his own isolation. Lorgar wages war with a quill, he said, but the galaxy will not be brought to heel by crude philosophy. Your ideals are meaningless. You have suffered, I know this. You have come to the Abyss and almost surrendered yourselves to it. That changes now. I am Father, General, Lord and Mentor. I shall teach you if I can and pass on the knowledge I have gained. Honor, self-sacrifice, self-reliance, brotherhood. It is the Promethean Creed and all must adhere to it if we are to prosper. Let this be the first lesson. The loyal Primarchs of his Imperium symbolize the pinnacle of humanity. Imbuing their legions and the subjects of their homeworlds with their most cherished traits. Honor, valor, sacrifice, duty and loyalty. Though of all the Primarchs of his Imperium, only one symbolizes the virtue of empathy. A Primarch whom would cherish the subjects of his Imperium. Despite enduring great suffering, he would endeavor to protect his Imperium and his beloved sons. Primarch of the 18th Legion of Adeptus Astartes, Vulcan.
With the scattering of the Primarchs, Vulcan's capsule would land on the planet of Nocturne, within the settlement of Hesiod. Discovered by a local blacksmith, Labelle, he would name the child Vulcan after the namesake of the first king of the Salamanders, which roamed the volcanic wastes of Nocturne. Within the span of three years, Vulcan would outgrow the stature of all the local peoples. Combining his quick cognitive prowess with the teachings of his father, Vulcan would become a famed blacksmith, renowned throughout the planet. Soon he would impart his knowledge of the forge, inventing and discovering new techniques unknown to Nocturne's populace. Yet Nocturne would be plagued by raiding parties, led by the Dark Eldar. So common were the Drukhari raids that every person of the town had picked out a space to hide to avoid capture. On the fourth year of Vulcan's arrival to Nocturne, a raid would begin. The young Primarch would refuse to hide. Standing at the center of the settlement, he would wait. A large forge hammer in each hand, he would face his despicable foes, alone. Watching this inspiring gesture, the townspeople would stand by Vulcan's side and prepare to defend their home. The Drukhari would be routed decisively by the wrath of Vulcan, felling over a hundred Drukhari by his own hand. Hearing of this great victory, the settlement elders of the seven largest towns of Nocturne would converge to meet with Vulcan and join him in their fight against the raiders. To celebrate his victory, the people of Nocturne would hold a tournament, which a particular stranger to the planet would attend. Adorned in peculiar clothing and pale of complexion, in contrast to the native Nocturne populace, the stranger would ask to be granted a chance to compete in the tournament, claiming that he could best any challenger. The people of Nocturne laughed in his face as Vulcan accepted the stranger's terms, wagering that the loser of the tournament would serve the victor's whim without question. For eight days the contest would endure. Each challenger tested on feats of strength and endurance such as the anvil lift, wherein the competitors held an anvil above their heads for half a day. With the dawn of the eighth day, the challengers' scores would be tied. To decide a winner, the two challengers would be given 24 hours to craft a weapon and hunt the apex predator of Nocturne, the Salamander. The victor would be decided by the size of the Salamander with which they had slain. The two men would scale a large mountain and split paths. Vulcan would quickly find a massive fire drake and slay it. Carrying his prize over his shoulder, he would descend the mountain. Yet as a twist of fate, the dormant mountain would erupt and cast Vulcan over the side of a cliff. Hanging from the precipice with one hand, the Primarch would not release his prize, but be unable to pull himself to safety. Hours passed and Vulcan's strength began to wane until he would be found by the stranger. The stranger hefted over his shoulder a salamander, far larger than Vulcan's. Seeing Vulcan in distress, the stranger would cast his prize aside, tossing the salamander into a river of lava, its body acting as a bridge to enable him to reach the Primarch. Hoisting Vulcan away from the precipice, the stranger would aid him in walking back to the town, his superior prize now melting on the molten rock. Returning to the people empty-handed, the stranger would lose the tournament, where Vulcan declared the winner. Yet to the surprise of his people, Vulcan would bend his knee to the strange man and pledge his life. The stranger casting off his disguise revealed his identity as the emperor of mankind, now reunited with his long lost son. Unlike many of his brother Primarchs, Vulcan would not immediately be given command of his legion. For years he would be tutored by the emperor and fight at his side. Unifying with his sons during their battle against a massive orc horde, joining his sons' beleaguered forces, commanding a fleet of 3,000 new recruits he had brought to the fray. The Legion's name would be changed from the Dragon Warriors to the Salamanders, honoring the bond forged between the Emperor and Vulcan during their tournament on Nocturne. Vulcan's command of his Legion would stand in stark contrast with other Primarchs, the first signs of which involving the 18th Legion's cooperative campaign on the world of Kadatan, alongside the Night Lord's Legion and their Primarch, Conrad Kurz. Disgusted with the means that the 8th Legion used to wage war, Vulcan became enraged when the Night Lord slaughtered an entire city in order to root fear within the planet's populace. Vulcan would continually be scarred by the ravages of war, 
the planet of Karatan being inhabited by humans coexisting with Eldar Exodites, rejecting the intervention of the Imperium's forces. Vulcan surmised that the humans of Karatan would never turn from their Exodite liberators and would never accept the compliance of the Imperium. Combined with the death of his personal remembrancer, Seraph, he would become enraged, leading to the death of an innocent Eldar child. Wracked with guilt, Vulcan would nonetheless order the planet to be cleansed of life, knowing that the human Eldar coexistence that flourished would never be compatible with the Imperium and its creed. Vulcan's misfortune would continue to grow with his legion's intervention during the Istvan V dropsite massacre. A full-scale assault of nine legions sent to quash Horus Lupercal's fledgling rebellion. Commanded by Ferris Manus of the Iron Hands, Vulcan and Corvus Corax of the Raven Guard would aid the 10th Legion in the initial assault. Against the combined traitor forces of the Emperor's children, World Eaters, Death Guard, and Sons of Horus. The battle waged, the three Loyalist Legions holding their ground until the arrival of their inbound allies of the Iron Warriors. Night Lords, Word Bearers, and Alpha Legion. The second wave of legions would turn on their brothers, decimating the three Loyalist Legions in their ensuing battle. Vulcan's forces would be targeted by the Iron Warriors Legion, firing nuclear missiles into the midst of the Salamander forces, targeting their Primarch. With the fallout subsiding and the battle over, Vulcan would awaken from the blast, his flesh healing itself amongst the ashes of his fallen sons. Vulcan was evidently a perpetual, a being almost incapable of dying. Surrounded by hundreds of legionaries of the Iron Warriors and Night Lords, Vulcan would be stabbed, shot, bludgeoned, and eventually beaten unconscious. Conrad Kurz, Primarch of the Night Lords, would relish the opportunity to torment his brother. For months, Vulcan would be tortured by the Night Haunter, dying over and over again. His head cut from his neck, his throat ripped out, his limbs torn from his body and riddled with bolt of fire. He would be jettisoned into space and left within the venting shaft of a starship engine. However, Vulcan would rise from death every time. Growing bored of the torture, Kurz would utilize the powers of the priests of Davin. They would conjure scenarios within Vulcan's mind. He would face trials destined to fail and watch as the illusory innocence lives at stake would perish. Yet Vulcan's mind would not break. Tiring of his brother's resilience, Kurz would imprison Vulcan within a maze constructed by the Primarch of the Iron Warriors, Perturabo. At its center lay Dawnbringer, the personal weapon of Vulcan, surrounded by the dead sons of his legion, a tempting prize in a futile game. However, after many attempts, Vulcan would reach Dawnbringer and overpower Kurz. Using the teleporter device installed within his Warhammer, Vulcan would escape, teleporting to the Ultramar system in the upper atmosphere of Macrag. There Vulcan would burn during re-entry to the planet's surface, knowing he would revive again under the care of the 13th Legion, the Ultramarines. The Ultramarines would discover Vulcan's charred body and within days the flesh and bone that remained would regenerate. Summoning their Primarch Rebute Gilliman as Vulcan awoke, the Ultramarines would see Vulcan exhibiting signs of mania, incoherence, and mental trauma. Vulcan's time with the Night Haunter had made him sensitive to Kurz's presence, and Vulcan knew that his tormentor was near. Conrad Kurz would break from the confinement of Lionel Johnson's vessel, the Invincible Reason, and wreak havoc throughout McCrag. Vulcan would escape from his cell and pillage Gilliman's personal armory, setting out to confront the Night Haunter. As the two Primarchs battled, the perpetual human, John Grammaticus, would arrive on McCrag. Armed with the Fulgrite, a concentrated spear tip of pure energy unleashed by the Emperor, Grammaticus would stab Vulcan through the heart, unleashing a massive psychic explosion, killing them both within the blast radius. Vulcan's corpse would be interred within a stasis field, handcrafted by Rebute Gilliman. The remaining salamanders on McCrag would guard their Primarch's body and bring it to the summit of Mount Deathfire on their homeworld of Nocturne. Artelus Numian, Vulcan's loyal son and first captain of the Firedrakes, 
which sacrifices life unto the magma core of the mountain, allowing Vulcan to awaken, his mind and sanity restored by the Fulgrite infused with the Emperor's power. In fraud by a vision, Vulcan would be led to two artifacts he had previously created, but had no recollection of crafting. One such artifact being the Talisman of Seven Hammers. Using the talisman, Vulcan would travel through the webway and after many trials, eventually reach Holy Terra. On Terra, Vulcan would be led by the Adeptus Custodes to his father, the Emperor. Trapped upon the Golden Throne, the Emperor would reveal that he had led his loyal son to his side throughout his journey. Revealing that the Talisman of Seven Hammers had been created as a contingency to destroy Holy Terra should the traitor forces of Chaos succeed in defeating the Imperium. Entrusting its creation to Vulcan as the only son whom would hesitate to use it due to the incredible loss of life that it would cause. Vulcan installed the talisman under the Golden Throne and would defend his father in secret during the Siege of Terra. Soon thereafter, Magnus the Red and a group of his thousand sons would infiltrate the Imperial Dungeon to confront the Emperor. Vulcan would block their path, protecting his father from a lethal attack from Magnus's staff. The Emperor and Vulcan would bid the Crimson King to return to the Path of Righteousness, but their offer would be refused. Vulcan and Magnus would duel. Saved from a fatal blow by Salamander Legionnaire Ijen Gargo, Vulcan would wield his fallen son's warhammer in one hand and Dawnbringer in the other, using them to pummel Magnus into submission. In desperation, Magnus would call unto the dark powers of chaos, fully surrendering his soul to the fell powers and retreating into the warp. With the siege of terror over and his father wounded during his duel with Horus, Vulcan would leave his Salamander's legion and venture into the far reaches of space, vowing alike to his brother Primarch Lehman Russ to one day return to his legion in their darkest hour. Over a millennia and a half later, Vulcan would engage the Orc Hordes during the War of the Beast. Alone, he would defend the world of Caldera from the Orc invasion, dying over and over again, yet reviving and facing his foes with relentless ferocity. Crafting the Warhammer Doom Tremor, Vulcan would rally the Imperium's forces, leading the counterattack against the mighty Orc warboss, the Beast, on the planet of Ulanor. Vulcan would face the Beast, tackling the warboss into a large power generator absorbing the orc energy within, known as Wa. Vulcan would unleash its raw power through Doom Tremor, ending the War of the Beast and obliterating himself and the war boss. In the years since his passing, no trace has been recovered of Vulcan, his legion maintaining that he shall one day uphold his promise when all nine artifacts of Vulcan have been gathered. Their Primarch shall return. Ours is a violent calling, but as adherents of the Promethean Creed, we believe in the Circle of Fire. None can come back as they once were. But in death, we are returned to the ash from whence we came to be born anew. Our blood and bone bonded with the earth. Through fire are our remains made protean. Through fire and their union with earth do we experience rebirth. After death, after our duty is ended, we give ourselves to these elements, and in doing so, become part of them. This is the nature of the Circle of Fire. We have no room for hope. We plan and we act. Hope is for dreamers and poets. We have our will and our weapons, and we shall dictate our own fate. The Primarchs of his Imperium are heavily influenced by the planets and circumstances of their upbringing. Molded on death worlds, feudal empires, and oppressive regimes, the Primarchs are akin in the methods in which they shouldered their respective burdens. Though many would resent their brother's privileged positions, some would bear their struggle with quiet contemplation, and of all the Emperor's sons, a particular Primarch would incorporate his misfortune to forge his own ideals. Primarch of the 19th Legion of Adeptus Astartes, Corvus Corax. During the scattering of the Primarchs, Corvus Corax would land on the moon of Lysaeus. 
orbiting the planet of Kiavar. The planet was more advanced than most others with which the Primarchs would inhabit. A forge world that gorged itself on the planet's plentiful minerals extracted from the non-atmospheric moon, its harvest mined by legions of slaves. Under the watch of heavily armored guards, the slave labor would consist of criminals, workers who had underperformed on their work quotas, and political opponents of the ruling class. One such slave, Nasturi Ephrenia, would discover the pale infant inside his capsule. The prisoners would raise the child in secret, naming him Korax, translated from Lycaeus's dialect to mean the Deliverer. As the Primarch grew, the slaves would teach him skills to defend himself and eventually fight back against their oppressors. Mastering urban warfare, close quarters combat, and demolitions, Korax would become a fierce warrior. It would also be taught philosophical and political theory. With Korax's accelerated maturation, the slaves of Lycaeus would look to him as a symbol, the soon-to-be savior they had desperately waited for. Korax finally grew to be a fierce leader and began organizing the slave labor force into teams of freedom fighters. With each skirmish, his resistance would amass stockpiles of weapons and conceal caches amongst the camps, orchestrating guerrilla campaigns of psychological warfare, riots, and precision strikes. Breaking the morale of their oppressors and draining their garrisons of strength, the resistance numbers swelled, leading to their final assault. Strategically targeting the Lycaeus Defense Force's security points, Korax would lure Kayavar's rulers into a trap. Outmaneuvering the Lycaeus forces with his own battle-forged warriors, Korax destroyed their supply lines and struck the five largest cities of Kiavar with atomic mining charges. The charges snuck aboard transport shuttles, their detonation crippling Kiavar's factories. Unable to construct materials and facing a critical loss of raw minerals, the tech guilds of Kiavar collapsed, tearing themselves apart in the incitement of civil war. Thousands died, nuclear warfare cleansing the planet of its corrupt tyrants. And from the ashes of war, millions of freed slaves would celebrate their emancipation, renaming the moon of the Primarch's resistance, Deliverance. That same day, the Emperor of Mankind would arrive. Meeting with his long-lost son, he would converse with the Primarch for a day and a night, appointing him the Primarch of the 19th Legion on the condition that the Emperor would bring peace to Kiavar. With the aid of the Adeptus Mechanicum, the world would be transformed. The Black Tower, which once housed the tyrannical guards of Lycaeus, redubbed as the Raven Spire. Fortress Monastery of the 19th Legion, the Raven Guard. Unleashed upon the enemies of the Imperium during the Great Crusade, the Raven Guard would prove to be masters of sabotage and strategy. Regularly deployed by the War Master Horus Lupercal to conduct covert operations, sabotage, infiltration, and lightning-fast precision strikes. At the Battle of Gate 42, Korax would lose thousands of Astartes within his legion, most of which had been Terran-born. After the battle, Horus Lupercal and Corvus Korax would never see eye to eye. Unable to reconcile their differences, Korax would refuse to allow the War Master to command his forces. The Primarch's continued distrust of Terran-born Astartes had been bolstered. Disgusted by their proclivity to enforce the Imperium's will, via terror tactics akin to the Eighth Legion, the Night Lords. Korax would further hone his legion to uphold their duty to act as liberators of the oppressed, rather than tyrants hell-bent on accomplishing compliance of worlds by any means necessary. Korax would send the remaining companies of his legion that were Terran-born to far-flung regions of unexplored space, further purging his legion's ranks of those not born on deliverance. Despite this, much to his chagrin, Korax would often be compared to the Primarch of the Night Lord's Legion, Conrad Kurz. Not only were the two Primarchs similar in appearance, but they also bore striking resemblance in their methods of waging war. Korax would revile such comparisons as much as the Night Haunter, disturbed at the notion his legion were akin to the Night Lords in their use of mass slaughter. During the Carinae Retribution, the two Primarchs would nearly come to blows over their differences. Yet with the intervention of Jago Sevatarian, first captain of the Eighth Legion, no blood would be spilled that day. 
yet rivers of blood would flow from the 19th Legion with the betrayal of Istvan V. The Dropside Massacre of Istvan V would break the Loyalist Legions of the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard. Led by Ferris Manus, Primarch of the Iron Hands, the Loyalist Legions would be slaughtered by the combined might of eight traitor legions. Despite being severely outnumbered, the Raven Guard would endure. Korax would face Primarch Lorgar of the Word Bearers Legion in single combat, impaling him with his lightning claws, yet be prevented from landing the killing blow by Conrad Kurz. Kurz would injure the Raven Lord, yet Korax would escape the battle wounded but alive. For the next 98 days, Korax would leave his forces in a grueling guerrilla war. Yet through the cunning and unknowable intent of the Alpha Legion, Primarch Alpharius would allow the Raven Guard an opportunity to escape. Quitting the Istvan system, Korax would command his legion to return to Deliverance, whilst he would travel to Holy Terror to seek counsel with the Emperor. The Emperor knew that the 19th Legion, decimated by the Dropsite Massacre, was now unable to provide the much-needed force of arms to defend the Imperium. Providing Corvus with a psychic vision, the Emperor would show his son the location of a laboratory which housed the infant Primarchs and held stores of their genome. Enduring through the laboratory's defensive system, known as the Labyrinth, Corax would succeed in his task, retrieving the Primarch genomes and entrusting them to his newly appointed Chief Apothecary, Vicente VI, implanting the genome into fresh recruits. With the aid of Mechanicum Genitor, Nexin Orlandrias, Vicente would succeed. 500 war-ready space marines would be crafted in a matter of weeks, yet the 20th Legion would show their hand, infiltrating the laboratory with the intent to steal the Raven Guard's newfound technology. Implanting the genome with a virus, the Alpha Legion would corrupt the newest recruits to the Raven Guard, preventing their Legion's recovery. Corvus Corax would utilize his remaining Legion forces to conduct surgical strikes of critical enemy weak points for the remainder of the heresy. Compensating for his legion's small numbers, Corax would nonetheless aid the loyalist forces by instigating uprisings within traitor-corrupted worlds, eventually mustering the disparate 19th legion companies into a united force. When the embers of heresy had finally died, Corvus would comply with the ruling of Rebute Gilliman of the Ultramarines to separate his remaining legion into chapters. Deciding to end the lives of the mutated sons corrupted by the Alpha Legion and locking himself within the Raven Spire to grieve at their loss. A year later, Corvus Corax would leave the Raven Spire and Deliverance, setting a course directly into the Eye of Terror. Corax would exact his revenge for his fallen brothers, Ferris Manus, Vulcan, and the Imperium of Man itself. With exposure to the warp, Corvus Corax would be mutated by its strange powers, transforming into a creature of shadow. The being that had once been the Primarch of the Raven Guard would mete out retribution to the traitorous word bearers. Engaging in a duel with Lorgar Aurelian, the warp infused monster would dominate the now demon prince of the word bearers. As Lorgar retreated from the battle, Corax would swear to kill his fallen brother, ending his tyranny and absolving his legion of their shame. His final words to his legion on the world of deliverance, a promise to prevent further ruin at the hands of his traitorous brothers. Never more. The first axiom of victory is to be other than where the enemy desire you to be. The first axiom of stealth is to be other than where the enemy believes you to be. The first axiom of freedom is that justice without force is powerless. Force without justice is tyranny. This is my record, and all the records are lies. The Primarchs of his Imperium are beyond the comprehension of mortal men. Gifted great power and mastery of humanity's most venerated traits, the Sons of the Emperor would mold the galaxy's future with their actions. Yet there exists a Primarch whose very nature is shrouded in mystery, whose deeds have spun a web of deceit so impenetrable 
that even his gene sons fail to understand its purpose. The Twin Serpent of the Hydra, Alpharius Omegon. The origins of the Primarch of the 20th Legion would be shrouded in mystery. Yet despite such an enigmatic shred of information, records have survived the long millennia. Accounts vary, with some speculating that the Lord of Serpents would be discovered by the 16th Legion, the Lunar Wolves, during the Great Crusade. Engaging with the 16th Legion's fleet with his own armada of vessels, though inferior in their firepower, they would outmaneuver their opposition and employ many devious tricks. Enraging the Primarch of the Lunar Wolves, Horus Lupercal, the future War Master of his Imperium would personally give chase to the Hydra's fleet. Annihilating the Armada with their superior warships, the Lunar Wolves would be oblivious to the infiltration of an assassin aboard their flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, whom would slay the Primarch's elite, Jostaran Honor Guard. Recognizing the assailant to be his brother, Horus would accept the last Primarch into the fold of the Imperium. This is a lie, for another account states that the Primarch of the 20th would be found on a desolate world at the edge of the Mandra Oran stars. Surviving against the elements of the barren planet and commandeering a vessel crewed by a band of miscreant Xenos and human mercenaries, the young Primarch would venture forth to find the Emperor. Another account derives from the tome The Transit of the Human Soul Through Strife, also known as the Codex Hydra. Its ancient writings state that the Primarch would descend upon the world of Bar Savor. Its skies overcast with the shadows of gigantic worm like Xenos, the Slaw, the horrific creatures would attempt to sate their hunger with the flesh of the Primarch. Capturing the Lord of Serpents, the strange Xenos would keep the Primarch as a curiosity as they beheld his innate strength and ability to resist their manipulations. Converting Alpharius into a living weapon, the Slaw would enslave the young Primarch's mind and set him loose upon the stars. Saved by the Emperor, Alpharius' mistreatment would fuel the Master of Mankind's vengeance to crush the Xenos, and for ten Terran standard years, the Emperor would salvage his son's fractured mind. This is also a lie for an account of the Primarch of the Twentieth remains, for those whom delve into the depths of the Hydra's deceptions. Penned by Alpharis' own hand, the true record of his origins would be decried as further deception of the Primarch's origins. As the Primarchs of his Imperium would be scattered across the galaxy by the manipulations of the ruinous powers, the twin Primarchs of the Twentieth Legion would be separated. Alpharius would never leave Holy Terror, and in contradiction of Imperial records, would be the first of the Emperor's sons to be reunited with the Master of Mankind. Within the shadow of the Imperial Palace, upon the Zaranam Plateau, a group of scavengers would set upon the young Primarch. The Emperor would find his son and slay the scavengers to prevent knowledge of his existence from spreading across Terror. Mentored by the Master of Mankind and his most trusted advisor, Malkador the Sigilite, the young Primarch would learn the value of secrecy, necessity, and the elevation of the vision of the Imperium above personal glory. No mortal soul of the Imperium would know of Alpharis' existence, and it would not be long before the Primarch of the Twentieth would test his innate talents and abilities. Disguising himself as a member of the First Legion, Alpharius would observe the palace coup to remove the custodian Captain General, Constantin Valdor, from power. The conspirators of the Grand Provost Marshal of the Adeptus Arbites, Uoma Kandawaya, Thunder Warriors Primarch, Ushatan, and scientist Amara Stati would demand reprisal for the custodian's massacre of the Emperor's Thunder Legion without the consent of the High Lords of Terror. With the failure of the coup, Alpharius would seek flaws within the defenses of the Imperial Palace and exploit its weaknesses. Attempting to assassinate the Master of Mankind in order to test the Custodian's abilities, Alpharius would come close to assailing the Emperor and slay a member of the Legio Custodes during his infiltration of the palace. The Primarch's ingenuity and resolve to identify flaws within the palace would be the first of the Legio's vaunted blood games 
to which the Emperor's Praetorians would to this day continue. Meanwhile, Alvaris' twin, Omegon, would land upon a nameless world bereft of life. Among the empty ruins of the planet, the distant Primarch would discover an ancient relic, the Pale Spear, and study the remnants of the planet's former civilization. Escaping aboard a vessel piloted by human pirates, Omegon would venture into the expanse of the stars and hear tales of the Emperor, his angels, and the Primarchs of his Imperium. In secret, Alvarius would conceal his identity as several sons of the Emperor would be brought into the fold. Disguised as an Astartes, during the Emperor's reunion with Primarchs Lionel Johnson and Lorgar Aurelian, Alvarius would in secret lead his Ghost Legion in their covert dealings across the stars. For years, the 20th Legion, known as Alpha, would hide in plain sight and leave no evidence of their existence as they enacted compliances across the stars. Yet with the installment of each Primarch with their Legion, the 20th would reveal themselves to their brethren. During the Rangdan Xenocides, the Alpha Legion would present themselves to the First Legion, the Dark Angels. Under the guise of a nondescript Astartes, Alpharius would meet with the Lord of the First, Lion L. Johnson. Offering aid to the First Legion in their war against the Slaw, Alpharius would deny his identity as a Primarch to the Lion and succeed in his deception. For the Alpha Legion, though alike to the First, in their championing of secrecy, had not offered aid out of trite notions, such as honor or cooperation. They sought a being upon the world of Barsavor, Omegon. Slaying the Slaw in their path, the Alpha Legionaries led by Alpharius would reunite with Omegon. Instantly recognizing one another, the soul of the Legion would become whole for the first time since its inception. The time had come for Alpharius to reveal his being to humanity yet conceal the existence of his twin from not only the Imperium and its Primarchs, but also the Emperor. Alpharius would proffer that the twins shall interchange their names to sow confusion within the Imperium, should their identities be discovered, and with such obfuscation, the Primarchs of the 20th would become ever more mysterious within even their own ranks. The Alpha Legion would be known to the Imperium, yet the Emperor would seem hasty to implement the so-called Last Primarch and his Legion into the Great Crusade. Already veterans of a hundred Shadow Wars, the Ghost Legion would increase their proficiency in waging war, with two Primarchs leading their ranks. Despite their secrecy, the Emperor would not be blind to the existence of Omegon and allow the twin Primarchs to wage war in his name unhindered. Alpharius would lead the 20th, with Omegon as his most trusted advisor, the Primarch's cunning and intelligence would be without peer, even among their Primarch brethren, as the 20th would follow in their example and be renowned for their disciplined unity among their ranks. Coordinating intricate and deadly warfare characterized by sabotage, assassination, and disruption, the Alpha Legion would not allow any of their brother legions to peer too closely into their arts of war and dealings. Arrogance and superiority complexes would begin to fester within the Legion, for the 20th had always looked down upon its more barbaric and unsophisticated brethren. The Legiones Astartes would bear a great distrust against the Alpha Legion and their Primarchs, for even the Primarchs of his Imperium would forever be wary of their ploys and misdirection. Despite being the last Legion to openly reveal itself to the Imperium, with many of its glories and deeds retracted from Imperial records, the now visible Legion would quickly prove its efficacy. Among the most efficient Legions to bring worlds into compliance, it is debatable among Imperial scholars if the 20th can be proclaimed among the most lauded Legions of the Imperium during the years of unification and the Great Crusade. All that can be known for certain is that their methods combined with a willingness to sacrifice anything for victory would deem the Alpha Legion to be a singularly devastating force. Their pedigree would foster infamy among the ranks of the Astartes, as rivalries would form against the Ghost Legion. With even the Sons of the Emperor harboring grudges and acrimony against Alpharius. With the Primarchs of the Ultramarines, Rabute Gilliman, and Death Guard, Mortarian, bearing the most spite 
against Alpharius for his seemingly dishonorable tactics, the Lords of Serpents would make no attempt to cooperate with his detractors. Yet not all would bark at Alpharius's methods of waging war, with the chief among his praise, War Master Horus Lupercal, valuing his elaborate strategies and battle doctrines. An endorsement which would prove fatal during the era of the Horus Heresy. The Lupercal would be the only Primarch to which Alpharius could be considered familiar, and with the fall of the War Master to the clutches of chaos, the Alpha Legion would be called to join his rebellion. Influencing Horus's gambit to ambush the loyalist counterattack of Istvan V, the Lord of Serpent's deceptive nature would be the foundation for the first devastation of the Emperor's forces. The Alpha Legion would pledge their allegiance to the traitors to the throne, though their decision to side with the War Master is debated by many chroniclers of the history of the Imperium. Records suggest that Alpharius Omegon would be visited by an agent of the Xenos organization, the Cabal, in an attempt to steer humanity's future to salvation. Met by the human perpetual, John Grammaticus, during the compliance of Nerf, the Cabal would impart the Hydra with portents of the future. Their visions would show humanity's path split into two possible futures. Should the Alpha Legion remain loyal, the traitors to the throne would be defeated, yet the Emperor would be interred upon a golden throne as a living dead avatar of humanity's slow decline into extinction. Destined to wage a grueling war of survival against the malevolent forces of the galaxy, the Imperium would slowly rot from within until its inevitable defeat and extinction by the forces of chaos. However, should the 20th side with the traitors, Horus would usurp the Emperor. Realizing his folly, the War Master would cast off the shackles of chaos and begin his utter devastation of the forces of the ruinous powers. The Imperium would sacrifice itself to persecute the destruction of chaos, and after a hundred years of slaughter, humanity would in its death knell extinguish the malevolent Dark Gods. Forewarned with the future portents of humanity, Alpharius would decide the means of the Imperium's fated extinction. Humanity shall sacrifice itself to allow for the survival of sentient life across the galaxy, or wage a grueling war of attrition for 10,000 years before its painful annihilation. Resolving to join the Traitor Rebellion to ensure the destruction of chaos from within, Alpharius's decision to enact the future proclaimed by the Cabal would nonetheless be made in vain. The futures outlined by the Cabal would with time be proven false, yet the Alpha Legion would march for war. Persecuting campaigns simultaneously, Alpharius Omegon would begin their first act of betrayal during the massacre of Istvan V. Aiding the traitor legions in culling the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Ravenguard during their assault of the War Master's forces, the Alpha Legion would battle their once allies. The Primarchs of the Tenth and 18th Legion would fall, yet the Raven Lord of the 19th, Corvus Corax, would flee from the battle. Attempting to ensure a swift victory for the War Master, Alpharius would dispatch Operative Astartes within his legion to infiltrate the fleeing Raven Guard. Carving the faces from the dead Raven Guard slain upon Istvan V, the Alpha Legionaries would graft the skin of their faces to their own and consume the brains of the fallen to glean memories of their service. Boarding the fleeing vessels of the massacre, the Alpha Legion would bide their time during the Raven Guard's transit to Holy Terror. The 19th with the guidance of the Emperor would discover the genetic materials of the Primarchs within the long dormant gene labs of Terror and would attempt to hasten the replenishment of their numbers. Omegon would command the infiltrators to steal a sample of the materials and inject a virus into the remaining genome available to the Raven Guard. Horrifically mutating the Raven Guard's subsequent implanted subjects, the tainted stock of the Primarch genomes would prevent the 19th's resurgence. Omegon would retrieve the Raven Guard's experiment data from their laboratories and spark a rebellion between the guilds of Kiovar in order to cover his exfiltration. Handing over the data, as well as a viable and tainted sample of the Primarch's genome to his twin, the treachery of the Alpha Legion would continue. Delivering the sabotaged data to the War Master, the 20th would keep a copy of the successful research for themselves to further bolster their legion. 
for the 20th would look to their own survival above both their allies and opponents. Cutting ties with the Cabal, the Alpha Legion would continue to sow misinformation and confusion for the remainder of the Horus Heresy. Forming a blockade within the Chondak system, the 20th would be tasked to confront the White Scars Legion and hinder their involvement in the Civil War. Sabotaging astropathic communication upon the facility of Tenebrae 950, the Alpha Legion under the command of Omegon would stall the 5th Legion's assessment of the conflict. Yet strangely, with the facility's destruction, communication between the Primarch Jagatai Khan and Rogal Dawn would be established, leading to many questioning the efficacy of the Alpha Legion's orders. As the 5th Legion attempted to breach the Alpha Legion's blockade, the Hydra would not deign to respond to their hails. Attempting to prevent their passage without the use of firepower, the Alpha Legion would, despite their best efforts, be forced to engage the White Scars. The 5th Legion would form an arrowhead formation and destroy a large proportion of the 20th Legion's escort vessels before passing through the blockade and traversing the warp. Their orders to contain and recruit the White Scars had utterly failed, with some questioning the loyalties of the Hydra for their uncharacteristically flawed strategies. Alpharius Omegon was no fool and had somehow managed to bolster the Loyalist war effort. Mortarion, Primarch of the Death Guard, would raise his suspicion of the Alpha Legion's allegiance to the Loyalists, yet be unsuccessful in convincing the War Master of their deceit. As a means to test their loyalty, the War Master would command the Hydra to travel to the Alaxis Nebula to destroy the Sixth Legion, the Space Wolves. Already battle-wearied by the burning of Prospero, the Rout had been deceived in their manipulation to destroy the Thousand Suns Legion and suffered many casualties for their transgression. Alpharius Omegon had long been opposed to the Sixth Legion's Primarch, Lehman Russ, for his overt disdain for the Hydra's reliance on underhanded tactics. Relishing the opportunity to humble the Vilka Fenrica, Alpharius Omegon would ambush the Space Wolves fleet. As the Ghost Legion brought the Rout to heel, Lehman Russ would send a distress signal petitioning aid from the White Scars. Still unsatisfied with his assessment of the conflict and unsure of the Rout's loyalties, Jagatai Khan would abstain from lending his might to the Sixth Legion. The Space Wolves would desperately fight tooth and nail to survive against the Serpent, and despite the resolve of the Wolf King waning, the Rout would endure. With the arrival of the Dark Angels Legion, the Hydra would flee the battle and seek a new war zone to influence the tide of the heresy. As the traitors assembled upon the world of Ulanor, the agents of the Hydra would facilitate the will of the Lord of Serpents. Holy Terror braced itself for the final siege of the Imperial Palace as fleets stationed throughout the Sol system prepared for the first wave of the assault. Rogal Dawn, Primarch of the Imperial Fists, would fortify the Sol system into a deadly kill zone. Alpharius would see a challenge befitting his ego and orchestrate his great scheme to not only defeat the Seventh Legion, but humiliate them. Alpha Legion operatives would enact their micromanaged tasks and objectives in order to breed disarray within the ranks of the Praetorians of Terra. Long dormant sleeper cells would activate across the Sol system, and with time, gaps within Dawn's carefully crafted bastion would form. Capturing several moons in orbit of Pluto, Alpharius would challenge the Primarch of the Imperial Fists to conclude their game of wits. Personally leading his men against Dawn, Alpharius would charge into battle armed with the Pale Spear and duel his erstwhile brother. Alpharius would best Dawn in combat and deliver a final strike to end the life of the Primarch of the Seventh Legion. However, Dawn would anticipate the blow and after pivoting to allow the spear to impale his shoulder, Rogaldorn would pin Alpharius in place and sever his brother's arms with his chainsword, Storm's Teeth. Taking the pale spear from Alpharius, Dawn would plunge the weapon into his chest and with a final chop of Storm's Teeth, crush Alpharius' skull. With the death of their Primarch, the Alpha Legion would retreat from the battle. Omegon would feel the bond with his brother die and realize that his twin had been slain. 
dispatched to delay the White Scars and Space Wolves from aiding Terra's defense, the Hydra for the remainder of the Horus Heresy would conduct stalling tactics and lesser engagements. Assuming his brother's name once more, Omegon would alone meet with the War Master prior to the final assault of the Siege of Terra. Handing the War Master layouts of the now weakened defenses of the Soul System, the Lord of Serpents would relinquish his fealty to the traitors. Holding a dagger within his palm, Omegon would shatter it within his fist and cast the shattered fragments of its edge at the War Master's feet. Departing from Horus's sight, despite the protestation of the first captain of the Sons of Horus, Ezekiel Abaddon, the Lupercal would permit his brother to leave unscathed. The Alpha Legion would depart from the traitor fleet, and Omegon would grieve for his fallen twin. With the demise of the War Master at the hands of the Emperor, the Alpha Legion would retreat to the far eastern region of the galaxy. Insular in their dealings and seeking no cooperation from their former allies, the Alpha Legion under the command of their sole Primarch would engage covert wars of survival. During the scouring of the traitors, the Ultramarine's Primarch, Rebute Gilliman, would confront the Alpha Legion on the remote world of Escrador, and within their headquarters, face an Astartes, regarding himself as Alpharius. Seeking a chance to prove his superiority against the Lord of Ultramar, the so-called Alpharius would duel the Primarch of the 13th Legion. Yet for his hubris, Alpharius would be slain, though whether his identity would in truth be Omegon or simply another imposter of the 20th Legion remains unknown. A solar week following, Gilliman's forces would be ambushed by the Alpha Legion in a manner seemingly impossible for a Legion bereft of their Primarch's guidance. The Ultramarines would be forced to retreat from the planet after suffering catastrophic losses and in the wake of their defeat, question the fate of the Lord of Serpents. For the Alpha Legion still roam the galaxy as fractured warbands of varying loyalties. Autonomous bands inhabiting asteroid fields, barren planets and space hulks, the Hydra remains an unknowable force poised to interfere with the best laid plans of loyalists and traitors alike. The Imperium claim that the Lord of Serpents is dead, but this is a lie. The head of the Hydra remains unsevered despite the loss of its twin. And so long as the bisected Primarch remains, his schemes and plots shall endure to wreak havoc across the stars. We are all an aspect of the Old Father, or have a manner in which we serve. He has his Castellan, his Herald, his Siege Master, his Governor, his... Here Russ paused and cast a glance over his shoulder at where Magnus stood, some distance away. Sorcerer. The Wolf King finished, in tones of distinct displeasure. I said nothing. Russ had not listed himself in his speech. There was little doubt what his role was, at least to anyone who had seen the wolves fight. Russ has a fury in battle that is near a match for Angron's, but he possesses a tighter focus. The Wolf King is our father's executioner. I expect at least one of my departed brothers could have attested to that, although I have absolutely no evidence to suggest that is the case. Call it a feeling, if you will. So I'll ask you one more time, Russ said fixing me with a stare that would have reduced a mortal to a quivering wreck. What are you supposed to be? I smiled at him again. I'm the one that keeps secrets. For a moment, I was not sure how he was going to react. Then his face split into a wide smile that showed his long canines. The only genuine smile I believe I have ever been the cause of for Lehman Russ, and he barked a laugh. Ha! Well, in that case, I'm surprised there's only one of you. This has been a tale of the Great Imperium of Man, read by the Remembrancer. The Primarchs of the Imperium would be given the chance to lead humanity into a new golden age, yet despite their glories, fail to usher in an everlasting peace for the galaxy. War unearths the most valiant and despicable traits inherent within each soul, and the Primarchs would be no different. So look to their example for tales of heroism, decay, sacrifice, 
and treachery, for their like shall never be seen again, with exception to their resurgence, to reclaim the ashes of a fallen empire. <laughs>